President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Morning. I understand there are no documents to be tabled by the clerk, so I'll ask are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Resuming committees have lodged proposals as shown at item 4 of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Select Committee on Administration of Sports Grants for a private meeting today from 1.30 p.m. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call on the clerk to call on business. Government Business Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of the Minister for Family and Social Services, Senator Rustin, for the exemption of bills from the cut-off. Senator Rustin. Move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. So I shall call it on. Um, I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020 for concurrence. Senator Rustin. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. To amend the Privacy Act 1988 and for related purposes. Senator Rustin. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into Hansard. It's leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Watt. Sorry, I'm a bit over eager this morning, Mr. President. <laughs> How unlike me. <laughs> Since the beginning of this public health crisis, Labor has sought to work constructively and in good faith with the government to ensure that Australians are kept safe during this health emergency. As the Leader of the Opposition has said on many occasions, Labor is looking for outcomes, not arguments. That is the spirit in which we have approached this bill and the government's trace, contact tracing app more generally, because Labor believes that a contact tracing app can be a valuable tool for protecting Australians from COVID-19. But it will only be a valuable tool if a sufficient number of Australians download it. The Prime Minister has said that 40 per cent of the Australian population need to download the app for it to be an effective public health tool. That means about 10 million Australians. The government is well short of that figure at the moment. About 5.6 million Australians have reportedly downloaded the COVID Safe app. Now the Prime Minister appears to be walking away from his target of 10 million COVID Safe downloads. He now claims that we only need 40 per cent of all smartphone users in Australia to download the app. But that target is not based on science. It's based on politics. The truth is that many experts believe that the Prime Minister's original 40 per cent target falls well short of what is needed. Researchers at the University of Oxford, for example, have estimated that 56 per cent of the UK population would have to install a contact tracing app for it to be effective, representing 80 per cent of all smartphone users in that country. Our own Chief Medical Officer said that in his view, a good uptake of the app in Australia would be well over half of the Australian population. Targets should be based on science, not politics. So if the Prime Minister is serious about listening to the public health experts, he should be increasing his original target of 40 per cent of the population and doing everything to reach it. He should not be decreasing his target for political reasons. I say this not because I want the Prime Minister to fail. I say this because I want the COVID safe tracing app to succeed as a public health measure. To encourage as many Australians as possible to download the COVID safe contact tracing app, 
the public must have absolute faith that their privacy will be protected and that the data collected by the app will never be misused. That is why Labor has worked constructively with the government to improve this bill prior to its introduction to the parliament, and we are pleased that many of our suggestions have been adopted by the government. As a result of our engagement with the government, this is a stronger piece of legislation which takes privacy concerns seriously. As a result of the government adopting Labor's suggestions, a number of changes have been made. There is now greater clarity about what data is, predict is protected by the strict privacy safeguards contained in the bill. The bill now provides for greater oversight of the COVID Safe app and the handling of COVID Safe data by the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. The bill now makes it clear that no intelligence agency or law enforcement body can be given a role in administering the COVID Safe data store. Where it is unlikely to prejudice a law enforcement investigation, the bill now allows the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner to continue an investigation even where the investigation overlaps with an investigation by law enforcement. And the bill now includes a number of public reporting requirements so that the Australian people can be kept informed about how the operation and effectiveness of the app and the level of compliance with the privacy safeguards contained in the bill. Necessarily, this bill was drafted quickly and it has not gone through the usual parliamentary committee processes of review. As such, it has not received the same degree of scrutiny that a bill would typically be subjected to. For that reason, my colleagues and I on the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 have indicated that we intend to oversee the COVID Safe app by reviewing its rollout and investigating privacy and other concerns that have been raised in relation to the app. More generally, Labor will keep an eye on how the measures in the bill are being implemented to ensure that they are effective and working as intended. We expect the government to do the same. This bill does not address every concern about privacy, and it does not address any of the concerns that have been raised about the technology. For example, while this bill will give the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner additional responsibilities, it will not provide her with any additional resources. Last Wednesday, the Attorney-General's Department told the COVID-19 Select Committee that there's no intention to provide additional resources. The Privacy Commissioner is able to undertake this work within their existing resources. That was the quote. With respect, that assertion is just not credible. The Privacy Commissioner, who is also the Information and Freedom of Information Commissioner, requires additional resources. We know this because she, she needed additional resources before anyone had even heard of COVID-19. You don't have to take my word for it. Have a look back at the transcript uh, of Senate Estimates last October, when the Privacy Commissioner told Senate Estimates that her office is already severely under-resourced before these additional responsibilities were given to her. The Attorney-General has told Labor that, despite its evidence to the Select Committee last Wednesday, his department is now engaging with the Commissioner to ensure that she has the necessary resources to perform the important oversight functions provided for in this bill. Labor looks forward to receiving an update from the Attorney-General over the coming days. Following the passage of this bill, Labor believes that the most important things that the government can do to encourage people to download the COVID Safe app is to be open and transparent with Australians. To gain the trust of Australians, the Morrison government must trust Australians. Publishing the source code for the app was a good start, but it's not enough. The government must be as transparent as possible about everything to do with the COVID Safe app, whether it be providing additional technical information in relation to the app or being upfront about how the app is working in practice. And I might just say that in evidence to the Senate Select Committee, there were considerable concerns about how well this technology actually worked. And I know those concerns remain in place in many parts of the community. So this is also a matter that the government must be transparent about and must do everything possible to fix. The government should be transparent about other matters too, such as the reason why it made the extraordinary decision to award the COVID safe data storage to Amazon Web Services instead of an Australian certified cloud service provider. 
that, in it, that single inexplicable decision by the Morrison government has done more to undermine public confidence in the COVID-safe contact tracing app than any of the app's fiercest critics. I know that a number of my colleagues will be speaking on this matter, and there is considerable concern in the Australian community about the government's decision to award this, ten this tender to an overseas-based organisation. So that is something that we'll be pursuing in the debate today. The government must also provide the Australian people, including older and culturally and linguistically diverse Australians and Australians with disabilities, with clear, easy to understand and accurate information about the app. I was very concerned uh, about the evidence of the Digital Transformation Agency to the Senate Select Committee last week, where it was revealed that uh, the app will only be provided in English. Obviously, for many Australians uh, from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, some form of translation uh, should be considered for this app, and I'd urge the government to think about that. Finally, and most obviously, Australians will have no reason to download or keep using the app if the technology does not work or if the technology is not secure. For that reason, the government must urgently address the technical and security concerns that have been raised about the app by technology experts and members of the public. Um, all you've got to do is look at Twitter uh, to see the comments that many technical experts and security experts have raised. Uh, and again, I'd urge the government to take those concerns seriously. Uh, but uh, with, with those caveats, I commend the bill to the House. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy President. The Australian Greens will be supporting this legislation because it is not enabling legislation for the app, because, of course, the app is already out there and on people's devices in significant numbers. This is, in fact, enabling legislation uh, in the main around um, privacy protections associated with the data collected by the app. And that's a very important distinction. This bill is an improvement on the determination that it effectively replaces. It introduces additional privacy protections that were not present in uh, Minister Hunt's determination. It introduces uh, other remedies that were not present in the determination, and it introduces oversight under the Privacy Act that was uh, not present in the determination. It also provides coverage over state and territory health officials, and I'll speak a little bit about, more about that later. I want to um, commend the government for releasing uh, a draft of this legislation publicly. Uh, obviously, uh, this has been uh, a far quicker process than we would normally go through, both in terms of uh, how the government has dealt with it and in terms of how the Senate has dealt with it. But of course, uh, we understand the urgency here, um, driven by the pandemic that we are all living through. I also want to commend the government for introducing protections in this legislation that the Australian Greens and others argued were lacking in the determination. The privacy protections um, contained in this bill are in fact far more robust than uh, privacy protections um, contained uh, in regards to uh, many other data that the government holds. And it does beg the question as to uh, why the government believes that this data should be um, uh, protected by more robust privacy protections than, for example, the metadata that the government requires corporations to keep. Uh, these privacy protections should be standard, not the exception. As I said, we understand the urgency and respect the need for this legislation, particularly as the COVID Safe app has been live since the 26th of April and has been downloaded by approximately five and a half million people. However, uh, we retain concerns around uh, the uh, security provisions associated with the data that this app will collect, and we uh, also retain concerns around transparency. To set a bit of context, I just want to touch off on this government's uh, record of privacy breaches uh, and data security mismanagement over the last 
few years. I mean, to say this government has a cavalier attitude towards data security would be a gross understatement. This is the government that is responsible for our metadata laws in Australia. They were sold to the Australian people, the metadata laws, on the basis of protecting us from terrorism and are now being used by local councils to investigate littering and to investigate people for having unregistered pets. Now, to describe that as scope creep would again be a gross understatement. This is the government that deliberately leaked to a media outlet the private information of a Centrelink client who was critical of Centrelink's illegal robodebt scheme. This is the government that repeatedly leaked private medical information of people seeking asylum to the media in an attempt to undermine the Medivac legislation. This is the government responsible for the census fail. This is the government that failed to properly de-identify Medicare data, which ended up for sale on the dark web. This app is being championed, among others, by Minister Robert, who falsely claimed the Centrelink website fell apart because of a denial of service attack. If there's scepticism in the community about this government's capacity to protect people's personal information, that is entirely down to the government's own actions and failure to protect people's data in the past and its cavalier attitude towards data protection. Nearly two weeks after releasing the app and three weeks after Minister Robert said he would, the government did finally release the source code for COVID safe. And this is an important step for transparency, and I thank the government and congratulate them for doing that. But the government has also said that it's considering publicly releasing the data management protocols that either have been or will be signed between the Commonwealth Government and state and territory governments. Those protocols will govern how state and territory governments handle the data that, in the event uh, of, uh, of uh, a, um, uh, a positive test for coronavirus, is then provided to state and territory health authorities to allow them to go through the, con the contact tracing process. And, and I would ask the minister, if she's able, um, to update the Senate about whether or not those um, protocols have been signed uh, and uh, whether the government still intends to make those data management protocols or agreements public. Another concern the Greens have, and uh, Senator Watt referred to this in his contribution, and this is a concern that's also shared widely through the tech sector and the privacy sector, is around uh, the US Cloud Act, that is, uh, the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data Act in the US. The Cloud Act was enacted in 2018 to uh, provide that uh, US-based cloud and technology companies could be compelled to hand over data held offshore under warrant to US security agencies. Now we don't have a bilateral cloud agreement in place, cloud act agreement in place with the US. The government has assured everyone there's nothing to see here and that we should all just move along. However, Home Affairs in its submission to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security inquiry into the Telecommunications Legislation Amendment International Production Orders Bill 2020, along with numerous international law firms around the world, have advised otherwise. The issue here is that because Amazon Web Services is an American company with its head office in the US, it is entirely possible that a US court could exercise personal jurisdiction over its Australian operations and require that data to be handed over to US security agencies. And when I asked the Attorney General's Department about this last week in uh, the Senate Select Committee, they were unable to give a 100 per cent guarantee that this data would not be handed over under US warrant to a US intelligent, intelligence agency. 
The great tragedy of all this, though, is that uh, the, this situation could have been avoided if the government had awarded or even opened tendering for the hosting contract to one of the three Australian cloud service providers with Australian Signals Directorate certification. Those are Australian companies with Australian infrastructure employing Australian technicians, and they would not fall under the jurisdiction of the US Cloud Act. But the government didn't do that. It made the inexplicable and so far unexplained decision to award this contract to AWS, a company with its head office in Seattle. Despite saying we should stay together, we'll get through this together, despite continually saying we need to secure Australian jobs and livelihoods, this contract was awarded to a company with a head office overseas. I also want to refer briefly to some of the messaging that the government's been using around this app, which the Australian Greens uh, regard as reckless or dangerous. The Prime Minister saying that using the app was, and I quote, like putting on sunscreen to go out in the sun, misleading at best, dangerous at worst. Because, of course, the app does not offer users any direct protection from contracting coronavirus. Likewise, slip, slop, slap the app, again, misleading at best, dangerous at worst. Now, the government shouldn't be cavalier around this issue. It's a pandemic, for goodness sake. People's lives are at stake here. I also want to uh, touch on the way that um, the data uh, will be collected by this app and misrepresentations about that. The government has said that when a user tests positive, the app will allow the user to consent to the upload of only contacts that came within 1.5 metres of the, person, the user for 15 minutes or more. But according to the government's own privacy impact assessment by law firm Maddox, the app in fact collects and uploads data about all users who come within Bluetooth signal range for even a minute within the past 21 days. And mobile, and mobile device Bluetooth has a range of around 10 metres, meaning it will collect data on anyone who spends time within a 10 metre range of the user. And although the Department of Health has said in response to the PIA that it would put in place restrictions to Bluetooth digital handshakes, this bill, uh, not unreasonably, includes no such protections. But I do ask the minister whether she's able to respond to that concern in, um, in her second reading contribution a little bit later on. So we've got about 5.5 million people having now downloaded the app, about 21 per cent uh, of the total population. So uh, it's getting close to the government's goal, although it's worth pointing out that a mathematical model from Oxford University suggests that around 60 per cent of the population needs to use a tracing act to, and I quote, stop the epidemic, uh, and this government's goal appears to be uh, only 40 per cent. As I said, uh, we will support this legislation, but we, we do have um, uh, concerns around uh, the lack of some privacy protections, and we believe this bill could be improved. And we will be moving uh, amendments in the committee stages to give the government the opportunity to beef up protections around the data collected by this app. Those concerns specifically uh, regard limited prohibitions on COVID safe app data, which we'd like to see broadened, the fact that there is no fixed trigger for the sunsetting of this bill. Uh, we also hold concerns regarding coverage of rules against coercion, transparency of COVID safe operations, assurances of data being deleted under this bill, which have been met part way by the government in uh, the latest iteration of this legislation. However, more needs to be done, which we will address in our amendments. I also want to touch on the fact that this app is only in English. There's a lot of people in this country who, for whom English is a second language, and there are many people 
in Australia who uh, do not have uh, a high level of English comprehension. So this app needs to be made available in ways that people can easily understand, and that includes um, being available in different languages so that people for whom English is not their first language also have an opportunity to make an informed decision about whether or not to download this app. I won't be downloading um, this app because I simply don't trust the government with um, data around who I am proximate to. I wish the government had gone down a different route, one that many other governments in the world have gone down, where there is no centralised store of data, where the data simply remains on people's mobile devices and a message is sent should someone um, test positive for coronavirus, the message is sent um, to people that that person was proximate to, uh, urging, letting them know that they've been proximate to someone who's tested positive and therefore giving them the opportunity to make a decision to go and get tested themselves. So the Australian Greens will support this legislation because, as I said at the outset, it's not enabling legislation for the app. It is enabling legislation for privacy protections associated with the data collected by the app, and that is a very important distinction. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator O'Sullivan. Let's give time for the microphone. There you go. Uh, I too rise to speak on the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020. And I should start by saying that I've downloaded the app. I, in fact, downloaded it uh, as soon as it became available in the App Store, but it was uh, a couple of hours before the registrations were available. And I think, like many Australians, were sitting there <coughs> pressing refresh every time, waiting for the ability to actually register it. But that's not where I started right, with that sort of enthusiasm. While, while I, I, uh, while I had. Uh, while at that stage I was very enthusiastic to download it, uh, when the idea of the app first came up, uh, I did have some reservations about it. While I fully accepted the intentions and what we were trying to do with it, I was very careful to make sure that it wasn't in any way in breach of the standards of privacy that Australians expect. So, uh, with the time that I've got available today, I'm going to talk you through uh, what I've done to. Uh, make sure that uh, this app that we have and the system that it's using uh, is, is protecting our privacy and ensuring that Australians can download it with confidence and uh, that they will be protected. As the Prime Minister said yesterday, Australia is winning the coronavirus battle, but we have not yet won. Industrialised contact tracing through the COVID-safe app will be a primary measure of success as we move down the long road to recovery. It's a critical tool which will enable Australians to get back to life as it was before, to go back to work, TAFE, university and all those great things that we like to do in our spare time and weekends together, importantly with family and friends. And again, Australians are leading the way. Downloads are continuing to trend upwards. Uh, we're well over the five million mark now. And this demonstrates that Australians want to get back as best as possible to business as usual. The app is the tool to ensure that this happens as quickly as possible. For that number to continue to climb, we know people need to have the confidence to be able to download it. And it's good to see that with the unprecedented challenge we face, most of us here in this place have done so ourselves. There is more to this than political squabbles and point scoring. But not only should we be just downloading it, we should be doing everything we can, everything we possibly can, as individual members in this place, if we support this, to give Australians that confidence also. So just last week I held a online forum conference uh, live on my Facebook page. And it's certainly recommended watching if uh, anyone here hasn't seen it. Uh, on that forum, on that online forum, I had Jeff 
Quattromani, a tech commentator who, like many others in the tech community, has spent much of his time dissecting and examining every function of the app. We have many people watch that forum online, and it's still available, and many people still are. Uh, Jeff is on board with this app. Uh, he's encouraging people to download it. Also on the online forum on Facebook, I was joined by Chris Rodwell, the CEO of Western Australia's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and also Dr Andrew Miller, the president of the West Australian branch of the Australian Medical Association. They made the case of how important it was that we start this road to recovery and the next phases of our three-step plan as soon as possible. In every community represented in this place, businesses are being hit hard, particularly those in service and consumer-facing industries. And this this flows on to their supply chains, the manufacturing and, in particular, the agricultural industries. Our health system which is geared toward dealing with the coronavirus challenge, will also need to tackle the backlog of elective surgery and other health-related concerns. They both, all of them on this, uh, on this forum, supported the app as an effective tool to get Australians back to these sectors. It was a good discussion which covered a number of community concerns, particularly around what the app does and, importantly, what it doesn't do. Some people were extraordinarily supportive. We had lots of people online and they were commenting and asking questions of the, those that were the, the presenters on the forum. And some viewed it as doing something for the greater good. Uh, indeed, some needed some convincing, and some were downright against. And that's fair enough. That's to be expected. We are in an unprecedented point in our history. So both myself and our panel in my office, we work to resolve those concerns. See, effectively, what this app does is take the process which is already in place by our various state health authorities and move it from being a manual process which takes some time and relies on your memory for the most part to happen on your smartphone. And for some people, when they have been told that they've got a positive uh, result, they could actually be quite ill. And so they're sitting there being treated for their health condition and at the same time having to recall who they have been in touch with at a very critical time and, and no doubt an emotional time for them. So this takes that manual process and digitises it and makes it a more efficient process. It will not geolocate you. It will not share names or phone numbers. It will just share a unique reference code via the Bluetooth handshake. This data will only be shared between the two devices. So in the event that you do test positive, and then, you, and then the second step, after you've downloaded it and you've been using it uh, for, you know, as you're going about your business, there is a second step. And that is that if you do test positive, you then have to also opt in to sharing that data with the relevant health authority. So there is a two-step process. If you never contract coronavirus, the data is simply stored on your phone until you delete the app or until it was deleted 21 days on a, after a 21-day rolling cycle. So the data is in your hands. It is in the hands of the phone holder. You decide what you do with it. And in the event that you do share it, the appropriate protections are put in place. It will be stored in Australia and for it to be transmitted or communicated overseas, it will be an offence. There has been no more vocal advocate to ensure the appropriate protections are in place than me. See, I'm a bit of a technical person. I'm normally an early adopter when it comes to tech things, but I like to pull these things apart and see how they work. I don't just accept that it works. I want to know why and how. So in the initial phases, I admit I did have some concerns. I spoke about them at great length with the government and worked them through. And I, I also took plenty of feedback from my constituents about this, those people in Western Australia. And from all this, along with many of my colleagues that no doubt uh, had a similar position, uh, I've become confident that the product that we are delivering has these protections in place. As a government, We've heard, we've listened to and acted upon the concerns of the community. That's why this bill has been introduced, to enshrine 
privacy protections in legislation. We could have just done it by giving an assurance, but we wanted to make sure, however, that we put in place the legislation so that Australians can be confident that it is law. It is law. A breach of a provision of the bill will be a criminal offence or a breach of the Privacy Act. In addition to codifying the protections of the determination, the bill will introduce the following additional measures. The National Privacy Regulator, the Office of the Australian Information Commission, will have oversight of the app data and can manage complaints about mishandling of COVID-safe app data and conduct assessments relating to the maintenance and handling of the data. The Privacy Act's notifiable data breaches scheme will be extended to apply to the COVID-safe app data. The interaction between the powers and obligations of the OAC uh, in relation to COVID-safe app data with the powers of the state and territory privacy regulators and the Australian Federal Police will be clarified. The administrator of the National COVID Safe Data Store will delete users' registration upon request. An individual will be required to delete COVID Safe app data if the data is received in error, and no data can be collected from users who have chosen to delete the app. And a process will be put in place for the app to be deleted at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, and users will be notified accordingly. These are strong protections which should give people every confidence to download the app, and I encourage them to do so, as have I. Acting Deputy President, we are in a unique period of our history, and we must never forget that. As much as it is now appears just part and parcel of our everyday lives, we must do all that we can to help Australians emerge out of this crisis. But Australians are rising to the challenge. In fact, it's true that they've been doing this for several months already. It's amazing, and I think all Australians can be proud of what their fellow Australians have been doing. In many cases, sadly though, this has re resulted in a loss of income, not being able to attend work, TAFE, university, uh, funerals, which would be the most devastating impact, I think, of this situation. And of course, sadly, there have been some lives lost. So Australians have put their lives on hold, and we are doing our part to get back to business as usual in the best possible way that we can. So it is time for the parliament to do its part, to uphold the confidence that Australians have placed in us. And this is why I commend this bill to the Senate, and along with it, the rigorous oversight that will no doubt come in later part of this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Senator Smith. I also rise to speak on the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill. Now, as we've heard from previous speakers, this bill seeks to amend the Privacy Act by introducing a range of privacy protections for information that Australians provide through the COVID Safe app, the contact tracing app released on the 26th of April 2020. In the best interests of public welfare, in order to assist in Australia's ongoing COVID-19 response, Labor has agreed to support this bill. But notwithstanding this support, Labor is aware of concerns with the functionality of the app, as well as concerns that have been raised by software experts regarding the security of the app. And it's important that in this chamber we speak to these issues today and acknowledge them. Now, downloads of the app number around 5 million, or 20 per cent of the population in Australia only halfway to where we need to be if we're to meet the Prime Minister's own stated target of having 40 per cent of the population connected to the app. And ultimately, we won't have the public come on board unless they have confidence that their privacy will be protected. And given this government's track record on technology, you can hardly blame them for that reluctance. The app offers an automated version of contract tracing through Bluetooth. It enables users' phone to identify who's near them and prepares a record of who its user has been near. We are told that these records are ready to go in case a user contracts COVID-19, allowing immediate contact to be made with people who have come into contact with the user. The government has stated that the app will only take a very limited amount of personal data from app users, such as your name and mobile number, your postcode and your age range. We have been assured that it won't actually keep track of where a user is or who a user is with. 
and appropriately it makes it an offence to collect, use or disclose that data except in a number of prescribed circumstances, including where the collection, use or disclosure of the data is by a person employed by a state or territory health authority for the purpose of contact tracing. Furthermore, the bill makes it an offence to retain COVID Act data on a database outside Australia or disclose COVID Act data to a person outside Australia except where the person is a health official undertaking contact tracing. It also imposes a range of obligations on the government, including to ensure that the COVID Act data is not retained on a mobile telecommunications device for more than 21 days, to delete all of an app user's data from the National COVID Safe Data Store as soon as practical upon request, and delete all COVID app data from the National COVID Safe Data Store when the Health Minister is satisfied that COVID Safe is no longer required to prevent or control the spread of COVID-19 in Australia. And the bill also gives the Privacy Commissioner specific oversight to ensure appropriate enforcement. Now, Labor's Shadow Attorney General has sought assurances from the government about whether the Privacy Commissioner has sufficient resources to enable her to fulfil the additional oversight responsibilities under the bill, as well as other protective amendments for the bill, which are appropriate to seek and appropriate to, to implement. Ultimately, Labor wants to see this app work. I've downloaded it, as have many of my colleagues. A contact tracing app can be a valuable tool in our fight against coronavirus. But the government needs to be very clear about whether the app works and what protections are in place to protect Australian citizens. We have consistently raised and sought reassurances concerning functionality, privacy and consent. Broadly speaking, we have raised issues at the Senate Select Committee hearing into the COVID response, including why the app doesn't work unless it's open in the background on iPhones or why it's not compatible with things like the diabetes monitoring app. And I am particularly concerned about what protections there are in place for Australians' data and for Australians' privacy. We need to acknowledge that legislation alone cannot build confidence in the COVID Safe app. It won't give the public the confidence they need to download this on the levels we need to see them downloading at for it to work. And that's why Labor has called on the government to address the technical concerns that have been raised about the app by ensuring the thing works as it should, as it was intended to do. The government needs to provide additional resources to the Privacy Commissioner so Australians can be confident that in addition to having the powers she needs to protect the privacy of app users, she has the resources she also requires to exercise those powers in an appropriate circumstance. And the government needs to be transparent and provide Australians with as much information as possible so they can have confidence in this app and what it means for their data, their privacy and their security. I also want to briefly comment on the awarding of this important contract to Amazon Web Services. Of course, America is one of our enduring allies, a nation state with which we share many of the same values. And I'm not in a position to pass judgment on why this contract could not be given to a local firm, whether it's an issue of capability, of cost, or a combination of these factors or any other. What I am in a position to say is that data management in the modern world we live in is becoming an ever-growing national security responsibility, which our government needs to manage and they need to manage better. The same sensitivities that we engage in when it comes to intelligence and national security issues should equally apply here. Just as we engage in issues of sovereignty when discussing the sustainment and rebuild of a nation's submarine fleet, so must we consider the necessity of data sovereignty. Indeed, if there is one sentiment that many Australians have been relaying recently during this COVID-19 crisis, it is that Australia needs to get back to producing things and to reclaim a certain amount of sovereignty so we're able to take charge of our own futures and to be less reliant on others. If there is one thing that Australians are producing plenty of in our digitalised economy, it is data. Some say that data in the 21st century is what oil was in the 18th century, an immensely untapped valuable asset. Not only would increasing our sovereign capability in this area be good for local jobs and good for our economy, it would also improve our national security credentials. In times of crisis, as we can see here, this matters. I think it's also important that when discussing this app, we take an opportunity to reflect on what is an ever-growing digital divide in Australia. We know that technology is not available to all Australians equally and that if you have access to technology, you have access to a greater range of opportunities in Australia than if you do not. This divide is growing larger and larger. It's evident, particularly on issues of age, where we know plenty of older Australians have difficulty accessing and using technology. And we've seen for many years this produce negative outcomes for their participation in our economy. 
If you take the issue of financial payments, for instance, the inability to have access to a smartphone and therefore um, the certain payment platforms which you have through your phone, which other Australians have, this is very difficult. And during this COVID crisis, when more and more businesses have moved uh, to not accepting cash or trying not to accept cash in exchange for digital payments, that leaves those without access to these sorts of technologies even further behind, even more anxious about how they participate in the economy and how they participate in our world. Now, we are seeing fewer and fewer bank branches. We are seeing fewer and fewer ATMs. We are seeing banks and businesses rely more and more on contactless payments. This app just represents another example like contactless payments, where the divide between those who can afford and access and use technology is far greater. And there are plenty of people, I'm sure, in Australia who would like to download this app, who would like to participate in what the government is doing here, who would like to be part of protecting their fellow citizens from COVID-19. But because of their lack of access to the right technology, they're not able to do so. And that's a conversation we need to have in this place as our reliance on technology grows ever stronger. Indeed, the government's reliance on personal handheld technology in their res policy responses grows even stronger. How we ensure that we don't have a whole section of our community left behind by this digital divide. Acting Deputy President, notwithstanding these issues that I've raised, I support the development of this app. And as I said, I did download the app and I was happy to do so and happy to participate in supporting my community and protecting my community to the best I could. If it's used appropriately, if it's implemented properly, it will be an important tool in our fight against this devastating virus. But just because I've said it's important, just because I've downloaded it, does not mean I do not acknowledge the privacy risks and the issues around data sovereignty and digital access that I've raised today. I think it's important that we have that conversation. It's not a single conversation, and it'll be an important part of our role in monitoring the rollout of this app and the use of this app to ensure that those issues are carefully looked at and carefully managed. It's over to the government now on implementation to protect Australians' privacy, sovereignty, and ultimately our health. We'll be watching them closely, but in the interim, I'm happy to support this app. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, um, Acting, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, uh, I rise to, to, to support uh, this bill and uh, commend the government on their, their timely uh, uh, rolling out of uh, uh, these protective measures um, that are supporting the good outcomes that we have seen so far in our fight against the coronavirus. Uh, I think we can take pride in, in this country that, that uh, we have uh, we are establishing a record of, of firsts uh, here when it comes to taking action uh, against uh, the virus. Uh, uh, we were one of the first countries uh, to restrict travel uh, from Wuhan and, and China, where the disease first originated. There was some controversy when we did that, uh, some, some belief that that was, a, was an overreaction, uh, uh, but it has proven to be uh, incredibly wise. And, and uh, uh, prescient uh, for us to have taken that action. Uh, uh, likewise, was followed up with further restrictions on travel as the disease spread to other countries in the world. Uh, we've obviously taken extremely serious action to, uh, to, to shut down businesses and reduce risk to Australians. Uh, some, of the, one of the, some of the first actions in the world, particularly given the, the scope and scale of the virus at the time when we took those actions. Uh, and, uh, and here we are today discussing uh, the use of, of, of an app uh, here in Australia, which is already out there, already rolled out, uh, been out for a few weeks, and we're one of the first Western countries in the world to, to have this technology up and running. I do recognise that some other countries like Singapore have, have had this app ready to go. It's something, uh, technology they had in place given their experience with SARS uh, in previous pandemics. Uh, but uh, the Australian government has been very quick uh, to, to see what works, see what worked around the world uh, and adopt those technologies for the benefits and health of Australians as soon uh, as, as possible. This app uh, uh, is designed uh, as one of the measures we are taking uh, to reduce the risk of, of coronavirus and it's going to become even more important as we take the essential steps uh, to, to open up our economy. Uh, to help people get back on their feet, uh, get back into their job, uh, 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 reopen their business, uh, uh, 
uh, to the extent they can. Uh, uh, what will become extremely important in that environment is our ability to, to test, uh, trace uh, and suppress uh, outbreaks that, that almost inevitably will occur from time to time uh, of, of the virus. I want to pay tribute here to the, uh, to the performance and to the work of our health authorities that are already doing this, that are already doing uh, tracing or were doing tracing pre the COVID safe app. Uh, it's a laborious process, an intensive process, uh, uh, and uh, I do commend the health authorities for, for what they've done. And, and, and even without this technology, they've done a remarkable job at, at uh, quickly uh, getting on top of, of outbreaks, uh, uh, be they in aged care homes, uh, be they more recently uh, in, in the abattoir in, in, in Melbourne. Uh, those frontline workers deserve our enormous gratitude. Uh, and uh, their systems are working well, but, but they, they are not fail-safe, of course. Uh, they, they do rely uh, incredibly on the goodwill and, and cooperation and memory of people who are infected. Uh, uh, as we know, one of the risks here with this virus is its long incubation period uh, compared to, to some other coronaviruses or flus, uh, uh, and that means uh, those that are infected have to try and go back for a long period of time, for up to 14 days, go back and remember who had close contact with and follow up all those, those potential cases. Uh, that's obviously not a foolproof process um, and uh, technology here can help and assist and that's what this app uh, is all about. I, uh, I do want to put on record that I do understand the concerns that some have expressed uh, uh, around privacy. Uh, I do understand that those concerns are elevated when, uh, when uh, uh, data is being provided uh, to, to governments, even though the Australian government will not itself access this data. It's being provided to potentially to state and territory government authorities, which I'll come to. And I completely understand uh, the concerns that data that are provided in that way uh, has to be uh, well managed, protected, and regulated. Uh, that's what we're doing here in this in this bill and. And I support that. I also support the right of, of those Australians not to download the app, uh, although I have encouraged and do encourage uh, Australians to, to do so, and I'll get to the reasons why I think it's important to do so, even for your own purposes. But I, I, I do want to say that we should respect um, those that have a, have a different view. We, uh, we, we are very fortunate of a free and, and open society where we tolerate differences of opinions. And as I said, there's, a, there's, a, there's legitimate concerns there, uh, but uh, on balance, I think they're being protected rightly and we should download this app. But if that is not the view of some Australians, I, I respect that and, and I think their decisions um, should be respected. Notwithstanding that, we have seen, of course, millions of Australians uh, uh, take the action to download the app and I welcome that and uh, encourage more to do so. I, I do so because I, I think this app is, is of incredible importance uh, to the individual, to, to, to the person itself, not just to protect the community. Uh, if I were to be infected, uh, hopefully I, uh, I won't, but uh, if, I, if, if I were to be infected, if I were to be infected, uh, I'd want to. I'd want to provide information to authorities about who I was in close contact with in the previous 14 days. I'd, I'd want to be able to do that. I'd want to be able to cooperate, and I think most Australians would. Uh, uh, this, this technology can be a, a tool to help you do that, because it is difficult to remember where you've been and what you've done uh, two weeks before. Uh, so having a, having a piece of technology that helps record that effectively for you automatically, uh, I, I, I think, is, is of enormous advantage. And just as I use apps like Google Maps, which provide data and information to a third party, uh, I use it because I don't want to go back to the world of the UBD. It's a lot, lot easier uh, to use uh, apps like Google Maps. Uh, it's a lot, it's, uh, there's great benefit in using social media and to connect with other people. Uh, you, you do give up some data there, but you get a corresponding benefit. And likewise here, uh, yes, the data and information is potentially provided if you're infected, but you get a corresponding benefit in terms of being able to help and assist our frontline health workers are doing the best they can under difficult environments. And as I said earlier, we should be supporting those Australians that are out there on the front line of our health system, and this our app helps support them. Uh, now, uh, it's not our only tool, of course, uh, um, but the fact the government's been able to roll it out so quickly uh, is imperative. I do want to get to the fact that we are strongly protecting 
uh, uh, the data in this app and doing so here with this legislation today. I think it's important to stress, as other speakers have, that, 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 that while the app is on your phone collecting data, it is only stored on your phone for that period while, uh, before you, you may be infected. Uh, the, the data is not, not recording location or where you've been. All it simply is recording uh, Bluetooth interactions with uh, uh, other phones that have the app and that are in close proximity to you at the time. It makes a record of those uh, over time, and only if, only if uh, you then choose does the data be, does it get uploaded uh, to, to, to the state and territory authorities who can access it to help with their test and trace activities. So in that event, you'd only choose to do that if you have to provide that information, which would be in the event of, of you being uh, infected and, and being asked to, to track back, trace back who you've been in contact with. So you control the data. You, you, you control it. Uh, you don't lose control of the data by just downloading the app. Uh, you only upload the data when and if you're in that situation of, of having to help our, our health authorities. And I think that's a well-designed feature that, that should be widely um, uh, advertised. Uh, uh, as we've outlined in this bill, we're making sure we put added protections in place to ensure the information can only be used, can only be used uh, for the purposes of testing and tracing for the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, that was outlined in, in a regulation made by Greg Hunt when the app was launched a few weeks ago. What we're doing today is enshrining those protections in, in legislation. And uh, I don't believe protections of this nature have been used before, um, but it shows the seriousness with which we're fighting this. Uh, this, this virus, that we are enshrining them specifically in law, that, that uh, the information collected here can only be used uh, for these purposes and no others, and penalties will apply uh, if, if people are using them for other, other reasons. Uh, uh, I'll finish on the fact that, uh, where I started, that uh, we have been able to achieve the remarkable reduction in coronavirus cases because we have been taking first steps, because we have been moving ahead of the curve, uh, so to speak. Uh, the rollout of this app is, a, is another example where we are doing that. I'd encourage all Australians to do it. I commend the government for getting it out so quickly and for the protections they're enshrining in law today. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Madam Deputy Acting President. I rise in support of the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020. I, along with the Australian Labor Party, are supporting this bill because it will protect and enshrine in law the protections the Australian public deserves and expects when it comes from the government, when it comes to any government. I want to thank the close to 6 million Australians who've downloaded the COVID Safe app. I do encourage more people to download it. This is just one small step Australians can take as part of our national effort to stop the spread of COVID-19. Now, downloading this app does not replace hand washing or hand sanitizing. It does not replace social distancing. And we must remember there are still people in our community with health problems or compromised immune systems, and we should refrain from visiting them. Importantly, if you are sick, do not go to work. The app does not solve any of those problems. It is an assistance to our effort to ensure that COVID-19 remains uh, flattened and the community remains safeguarded from the virus. Now, COVID-19 does still exist in the community. We have undertaken a monumental effort to su suppress its spread as much as possible. Children stopped going to school and started learning from home. Teachers learned how to move their classes online and parents became teachers' aides. Hundreds of th thousands of Australians have worked from home Sadly, many thousands have lost their jobs and have been forced to stay at home. Now, as our combined health efforts continue and as we begin the economic recovery, we must look at ways we can ensure the virus does not take hold in our country again. This app is one of those ways, and with an app like this, the law must protect the privacy of Australians. Prior to the release of this app, state and territory public health officers have undertaken manual contact tracing. Manual contact tracing means painstakingly trying to remember the people someone diagnosed with coronavirus has come into contact with and when. And while our public health officials have carried out excellent contact tracing in this country, even if you have a near perfect memory or an impeccable diary, there will always be gaps about who you have come into contact with. The contact tracing app, this app, relies on technology to digitize this process to supplement not replace manual or paper-based tracing to make sure we can continue to suppress the virus. 
Not only does the app provide the opportunity to improve the timeliness of contact tracing, it also offers the opportunity to improve reliability. Now, to be a valuable tool, the app has to work. Australians have to have confidence that there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that their privacy is protected. The government released the app with some safeguards in place. The Health Minister made a determination under, under Section 4, 4, 477 of the Biosecurity Act in relation to the COVID Safe app on 25 April. The determination included a number of privacy protections for information that Australians provided through the app, and now this bill replaces that determination. Through this crisis, particularly when it comes to passing important legislation, Labor has always been constructive. We've not stood in the way during this unprecedented crisis because it has required an unprecedented response. That's why we will support the passage of this legislation. While not perfect, the bill will introduce very strong privacy safeguards. In some respects, these safeguards are unprecedented in Commonwealth law. Like the determination which preceded it, the bill would make it an offence to collect, use or disclose app data except in a number of prescribed circumstances. These include where the collection, use or disclosure of the data is by a person employed by a state or territory health authority for the purpose of contact tracing. The bill would also impose a range of obligations on the Commonwealth, including to ensure that COVID app data is not retained on a mobile telecommunications device for more than 21 days, delete all of an app user's data from the National COVID Safe Data Store as soon as practical upon request, and delete all COVID app data from the National COVID Safe Data Store when the Health Minister is satisfied the COVID Safe is no longer required to prevent or control the spread of COVID-19 in Australia. Labor, in particular my Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security colleague, the Shadow Attorney General, has worked with the government to improve the legislation and strengthen protections that the Australian people deserve. I thank the government for accepting a number of those suggestions. There will now be greater oversight of the COVID Safe app by the Privacy Commissioner. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner is an independent statutory agency overseen by the Australian Information Commissioner and Privacy Commissioner. The legislation now requires the Health Minister and the Privacy Commissioner to produce regular public reports about the app every six months. There are now additional oversight and certification responses, responsibilities on the Privacy Commissioner to ensure that the Commonwealth complies with its obligation to delete all COVID safe data when the app is no longer in use. It is reasonable to see how the Privacy Commissioner's workload will increase as a result of these important responsibilities. Labor urges the government to ensure that the Privacy Commissioner has sufficient resources to fulfill the additional oversight responsibilities. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner should not be stretched or have to reduce its other capabilities to undertake these important COVID safe app oversight duties. Importantly, there is, a new responsibility, there is a new provision clarifying that law enforcement and intelligence services may not be given any role in administering or accessing the COVID safe data store. These protections are unprecedented and mean Australian law enforcement officials and security agencies will not be able to access the app data. There are legitimate concerns about the government's decision to award the data storage contract relating to the app to Amazon Web Services in the United States. This means that COVID app data may be obtainable by the United States law enforcement authorities. This concern could have been avoided if the government chose to award the data storage contract to an Australian-based owned and operated cloud service provider. In fact, at a time when the Australian economy needs as much stimulus as possible due to this unprecedented economic crisis, it perplexes me as to why the government did not award the contract to an Australian company. Regrettably, the concerns about Australian web services cannot be addressed in legislation. Australian law does not override American law in the same way that American law does not trump ours. However, the government, and in particular the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Home Affairs, could address these concerns through non-legislative means. The Foreign Minister could seek diplomatic assurances from the United States. And the Minister for Home Affairs could ensure that access to COVID app data is excluded from any security or intelligence sharing arrangement with the United States. He could do this as part of the Cloud Act Executive Agreement, which is being currently negotiated with the United States. I urge the Minister for Home Affairs to pursue this option as it will provide further assurances to the Australian public and hopefully will result in more downloads of the app. 
If the government wants this app to be embraced by millions more Australians, something that could continue to keep COVID-19 at bay, they would be making this happen. They would be taking these steps. Just like there's no set and forget when it comes to social distancing or washing hands, there is, uh, the same applies to this app. Labor remains committed to seeing how the measures in the bill are being implemented to ensure that they are working as intended. We will do that through the Senate COVID Committee, of which I am a member, along with Senators Gallagher and Watt from Labor. We've already had the opportunity to scrutinize the app and will continue to do so because parliamentary scrutiny is one of the pillars of our democracy. It was through the COVID committee that we learned the health department was never provided the government any advice about targets. In an interview on Perth Radio 6PR on 15 April, the interviewer asked the Prime Minister, and I quote, reports are that as many as 40% of the population might need to download it for it to work. Is that right or not? The Prime Minister replied, yes, it is. You'd need at least that. 40% was the target the Prime Minister set back on the 15th of April for the app to be effective. He had no advice from the Health Department that that was the target needed. However, in question time in the other place yesterday, the Prime Minister stated, we have no real target. He then continued to say that any target related to a percentage of the number of smartphones in Australia rather than to the Australian population. It's easy to get close to achieving a target if you keep moving the goalposts. It's small things like this that can make the public question their trust in government. The federal government, along with the state and territory governments, have asked the community to trust them. I acknowledge and understand the reservations and the concerns people have had about the idea of this app, because I myself have also had them. There's a saying go that goes, you can't constantly lie and expect the people to trust you. Now, I'm not calling this government liars when it comes to this app or legislation, but for far too long the Morrison government have treated the parliament, the press gallery, and the Australian people with contempt. They have shirked scrutiny and they've refused to be held accountable. They've dismissed as legitimate questions gossip or said they're matters for the Canberra bubble. They've said one thing and then turned around and done another. And far too often the government chooses marketing spin over substance, ads over outcomes, and marketing over what matters. So you can understand why some Australians have been skeptical about an app such as this and the ability of this government to ensure their privacy. Let's remember, the Australian people first found out about this app not because the Australian parliament was advised, but because the New Zealand parliament was told about it. The people of New Zealand were told about the Australian government plan for this app before the people of Australia were. We will never know if the government's lacking communication or rush to announce this app has impacted its download numbers. But one thing I make clear, the COVID Safe app does not track your location. It only relies on Bluetooth and when you come in close contact with someone else, approximately one and a half meters for 15 minutes or more. This data is then stored on your phone and will remain there for 21 days. It will only be released to health authorities if you choose to release it to them whether it's because you've been diagnosed with COVID-19 or someone you have come into contact with has. Finally, if you do release your data to state and territory health authorities, it can only be accessed by them. Regrettably, some of these facts weren't communicated clearly or effectively by the government when this app was first announced in the New Zealand Parliament. This was a misstep by the government and they've been having to clean up this mess ever since. This is what happens when you roll out a minister who wasn't aware he was charging taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars for excess internet downloads to be your spokesperson on this app. I commend the health minister for cleaning up after the social services minister and clarifying any confusion about this app that the government has created. I have downloaded this app because I understand the importance to the broader community of being able to effectively contact trace outbreaks of COVID-19. This app can be a critical tool in the COVID-19 exit strategy if it works well and if our privacy is safeguarded. We definitely won't be standing in the way of the app and now definitely is not the time for further amendments or political stunts in this parliament. We will not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. We want this app to be a useful tool and that depends on getting it right. And it's why Labor's worked with the government on amendments to strengthen the privacy protections in the app. 
The government must be as transparent as possible about everything to do with the COVID Safe app, including providing additional technical information in relation to the app or being upfront about how the app is working in practice. This legislation will give Australians more confidence that their privacy will be safeguarded if they choose to download the app. And it will and can play a role alongside social distancing, paper-based contact tracing, hand washing, staying at home when we are sick, and all of the other public health measures Australians have taken up in order to safeguard themselves, their family, their community, and their country against the threat of coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy Chair. And I thank the Whips for uh, assisting me as I juggle uh, committee and uh, chamber uh, duties. Um, Senator Alliance will be supporting uh, the, uh, uh, the bill before the Senate this morning. Uh, and I will uh, acknowledge that, uh, uh, as uh, Senator Keneally uh, pointed out, uh, the government has been quite willing to negotiate amendments and work with uh, uh, other parties to improve the bill. And in fact, uh, Senator Alliance has uh, uh, been talking uh, with the attorney's office and have made a number of amendments uh, or, or, or uh, worked with the government on a number of amendments. There are still some amendments uh, that we will, we will raise uh, during the committee stage. Um, that we will put to the, to, to the Senate. But in principle, the process has been good, and I thank the government uh, for that. Um, I'm on record as uh, saying that I haven't downloaded the, the application, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, but, but, I'm, but I'm neutral as to whether people should or shouldn't. It's a matter for their own circumstances. Uh, I'm a, uh, ha I am concerned or have been concerned that, of course, uh, the protections that are being put in place have been done by way of ministerial determination. That means with a stroke of a pen that can be changed at any time. And I think uh, what's happening today makes it a much more robust uh, arrangement, which would certainly put me much more at ease in respect of the, the privacy issues. Uh, and uh, uh, so I think that's a tick in the box, uh, assuming this uh, passes the parliament today. There are some concerns about the application, however, that I think uh, we need to, to uh, uh, you know, air, and the government needs to be upfront about. Uh, and as I said, I'm neutral. I think everyone should download the application based on their own circumstances. I think there's likely to be fewer and fewer privacy reasons now for not downloading it. Uh, however, I think we need to be upfront about uh, the performance of the application because you are asking people to, we are asking people to download an application that uh, does sit on their phone. And uh, we, we know that, uh, uh, anecdotally, from a number of people I've talked to that have the app, we know that, it, for, for example, it drains, drains the battery uh, pretty quickly. That's a small penalty, penalty to pay uh, uh, in, in relation to uh, dealing with the pandemic. But that's only if, the, if indeed, the application uh, ends up being, uh, having, having uh, a useful effect. Um, the, uh, uh, and this leads to a couple of issues which I think d uh, d needs to be addressed. Um, the first being that uh, uh, this application had origin in Singapore, and when it was first talked about, uh, there was discussions about its, uh, its, its origin and the fact that the Singaporean population had 20% uh, of the Singaporean po population had downloaded the app. Yet uh, at, at the COVID committee. Uh, I have asked and have not received a response yet as to whether or not the Australian government sought any advice as to its effectiveness, the you know, with only having 20 per cent uh, uh, t take up. What effectiveness does that give you in terms of health outcomes? We heard the Prime Minister talk about 40 per cent here, but uh, again the Department of Health conf conf confirmed we did no modelling, so we don't know whether 40 per cent gives you 2x in terms of outcome or 3x or 4x. It's not been modelled. In fact, we don't know, uh, because the department hasn't modelled, what the right take-up is. And I think that is a problem, uh, and it's a problem that should be addressed because we want to make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, legitimate targets for the population 
Uh, a, there is a report out of Oxford University that suggests the take-up rate uh, needs to be above 50 per cent. I think we just need to be straight up with the Australian public, and we also need to know these numbers ourselves so we can uh, make sure we pitch and, and contribute to achieving those numbers. Uh, is it linear in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the take-up versus the outcome, or is, does it have some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of other curve uh, shape that says, look, it's pretty much use useless unless at least 30 per cent uh, download it? I'd like to see that data. Uh, uh, I'd like to see the modelling done. The government hasn't committed to doing that, and I think that's a, that's a mistake. The second uh, area of concern is, in fact, uh, uh, how effective the application is in itself. Uh, once again, at uh, the COVID committee, we did ask officials about the uh, 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 about whether or not the application is actually effective. Now, uh, the answer to that was uh, talk about how many people had downloaded it. That's, a, that's the answer to a different question. There are concerns, and the, and the DTA gave evidence to the Senate, that uh, there is degradation in the performance of the application in circumstances where the application is in background or, indeed, in circumstances when the, application, uh, when, when the uh, phone is locked. And I think it's proper that that deterioration should be quantified and uh, that information should be provided to uh, the Australian public. Uh, I have put questions on notice asking for the test data to be, uh, uh, to be provided to the Senate and obviously to the Australian public, and hopefully the DTA will be uh, 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 compliant uh, in providing a significant amount of test data, not just the best cases, but also the, the, the situations where it doesn't work at all. The, the point being, just be open and, uh, and upfront. I suspect, uh, with all the evidence that I heard, that the application is not doing very much at this point in time. Now, that's not a criticism of government. Uh, back when this uh, application was uh, proposed, we were in a different situation to, uh, 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 than we are now. We were looking on the, on the upside of a, of, of a curve. Uh, we're now looking at a, at, a, at a flattened curve. So when this uh, application was conceived, I, I applaud the government for throwing everything at it, for saying, well, this could be a tool that will contribute. Uh, but if there are problems with it, just be honest with the Australian public. Just let them be well informed so that uh, they can make a good decision about uh, downloading it. And you know what? If, it, uh, if it's the case that it's not working well now, but in uh, two weeks' time when we get an upgrade from Apple and Google, as has been foreshadowed in respect of Bluetooth, um, uh, we then uh, let the, the public know that. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't take a marketing approach. We take a well-informed uh, 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 approach where we, inform the, where, where we inform the Australian public. So, um, uh, with that in mind, I, I thought it was worth uh, sharing, uh, sharing that with the Senate. I do support the bill. I do support the application. It is a matter of, of choice, as the bill actually uh, lays out. It is a matter of choice for people to download it. Um, uh, Let's be very open and honest about its utility, about how well it is working at this point in time, what the required uptakes are, uh, such that we can uh, protect the Australian public. So uh, uh, I, I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy Madam President. Uh, it's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill 2020, a bill that I commend to the Senate. I'm pleased to see the bipartisan support for the bill. Uh, this is the first time that I have spoken since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in the Senate, and I want to place on record, first and foremost, my thanks to the Australian people. The response to the pandemic has been extraordinary. The ability of the Australian people to stand up, uh, to listen to the government, to listen to the professional uh, medical advice, to our frontline health workers 
and to respond as they have has been incredible. And we have seen a dramatic flattening of the curve and I have to say that I think most Australians would be very, very proud as to how our nation has performed, particularly when you consider what is happening overseas in some countries. I also want to thank the nearly six million Australians who have downloaded the COVID Safe app. We know that this is not a be all and end all, but this is an important tool to slow the spread of the virus. And uh, of course, uh, this bill is all about making sure that there are the appropriate uh, health protections. I also want to pay tribute to the Prime Minister, uh, to his leadership team, particularly Senator Cormann, the Treasurer. Mr Frydenberg, the Health Minister, Mr Hunt. Uh, the measures I, that our government has put in place in response to the pandemic have been overwhelmingly received uh, positively by the Australian people. And in saying that, I also acknowledge the role of the National Cabinet, which I think has also been very important as well. Our government is all about making sure that we save lives and livelihoods, and whether it's job seeker, JobKeeper, the stimulus payments we're providing, the early release of super, the cash flow boost, the government back loans, the childcare fair relief, the health response, telehealth, our domestic violence response, our response uh, with 100 new respiratory clinics. Uh, right across the health sector, I think all Australians can be very, very proud of the work of the National Cabinet, uh, including, of course, uh, the work of our government. I also want to acknowledge and say thank you to our frontline health workers, our doctors, our nurses, our cleaners, our paramedics, uh, those also who work on the front line in uh, our economy at the moment, those who work in our supermarkets, in our pharmacies, in our cafes and restaurants. The restrictions have been very, very difficult and we are seeing an, an easing of those restrictions. Uh, but Australians, as I say, have responded absolutely magnificently to the challenge and I do very much acknowledge the incredible effort of all Australians. This bill is all about protecting the privacy of Australians and we have reiterated and made clear how important it is to download the COVID Safe app. As the Prime Minister has said, it's a bit like uh, putting on sunscreen when you go out in the sun. It, it gives us protection as a nation. It is the ticket to, to ensuring that we can actually ease our restrictions. The COVID Safe app is, a, is an important public health initiative that will keep you, your family and our community safe from further spread of coronavirus. And it, of course, is all about speeding up contact tracing. And public health officials, of course, are doing a magnificent job when there is a positive diagnosis in identifying those who have come into contact with someone who has been diagnosed positively. But this, of course, the COVID Safe app does speed up that process. And that's why it is so important for as many Australians as possible to download the app. Uh, the app uses Bluetooth to look for other phones, like a, we call it a Bluetooth handshake. Uh, and of course, there is no way that someone's location can be uh, recorded. So it's very, very limited in its use. It only keeps contact information for 21 days. And this covers the maximum incubation period for the virus. And it's the time that it takes for someone also to be tested for COVID-19. To be effective, users should have the app running in the background when they are coming into contact with others. Uh, so the phone does not need to be unlocked for the app to work, but of course the Bluetooth does need to be activated. Uh, it then securely makes uh, a digital handshake which notes the date and time, the distance and the duration of the contact. All information collected by the app is securely encrypted and stored in the app on the user's phone. Uh, no one, not even the user, can actually access this information. Unless and until a person is diagnosed with COVID-19, no contact information collected in the app 
is disclosed or able to be accessed. So uh, there are very, very strong privacy measures already in place with uh, the app, and of course there are, have been a number of amendments that have also been accepted, and they are to ensure that there is a strong ongoing and further privacy protections to support the download, use and eventual decommission, decommissioning of the Australian government's COVID safe um, app, mobile application. So just very briefly, the key additional protections which have been included are that the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner will have oversight of the COVID safe app data. The Information Commissioner can, make, can manage complaints about mishandling of the COVID safe data and conduct assessments relating to the maintenance and the handling of that data. The Privacy Act's notifiable data breaches scheme will be extended to apply to COVID safe data. Uh, there will be clarification of the interaction between the powers and obligations of the Information Commissioner in relation to COVID safe data with the powers of state and territory privacy regulators and the Australian Federal Police. The, the administrator of the National COVID Safe Data Store will delete users' registration data upon request. Uh, an individual will be required to delete COVID Safe data if they receive it in error, and uh, no data can be collected from users who have chosen to delete COVID Safe, the COVID Safe app. A process will also be put in place for COVID Safe data to be deleted at the end of the COVID-19 pandemic and users will be notified uh, accordingly. The amendments also make changes to some of the language used in the Biosecurity Act determination in order to better match the language and the structure of the Privacy Act. A couple of other technical changes uh, which ensure the workability of the amendments have also um, will be included and it's now clear that penalties do not inadvertently apply to individuals, businesses or agencies who only collect COVID safe app data incidentally to the collection of non-COVID safe app data such as backing up mobile, mobile devices. Uh, but in essence, uh, Madam Acting Deputy um, President, we have been very receptive to some of the concerns that have been raised in relation to the privacy of the COVID safe app. And I would like to finish my contribution by again calling on all Australians to please download the app. It is incredibly important. Of course, it doesn't replace uh, all of the other health advice, which is so important, the social distancing, maintaining a space of at least 1.5 metres from anyone else, essentially acting as if uh, people that we come into contact with do actually have the virus to minimise the spread of the virus, the hand washing and all of the other critical health advice which has been provided. But if we can speed up that contact tracing through the app, this will of course ensure that we can mitigate the risk and minimise the spread of the virus. Again, I want to say thank you to the Australian people for everything that this nation has done to slow the spread of the virus and to respond so magnificently to this pandemic, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this is Australia's ticket to normality in the form of an app. Uh, now, before I touch on the app, I do want to uh, again reiterate the, the remarks made by other senators about Australia's performance in the face of this pandemic. I mean, there is no other jurisdiction there is no other country you'd want to be living in uh, than Australia at this, at this juncture based on our, all the health factors, uh, whether that be uh, transmission, whether that be uh, fatalities. Uh, and we've been able to do that while keeping large parts of the, the economy open, which I think is very encouraging and uh, obviously a better result than some other jurisdictions. Now, in terms of contact tracing, which is something that I've experienced as someone who uh, unfortunately contracted the coronavirus, uh, it is a very manual process. Uh, it does require you to sit down with uh, state uh, health officials and try and piece together uh, where you've been, uh, who you've been in touch with, uh, so that other people can be uh, made aware that they need to self-isolate. 
Now, in my case, I had basically 10 days between transmission and actually uh, being diagnosed with coronavirus. And in that time, I travelled uh, throughout the metro metropolitan and the country areas of New South Wales, and I came in touch with many, many people. Now, the, the level of anxiety that one has uh, when you think that you may have um, infected someone with the coronavirus uh, is quite high, I must say. Now, um, if contact tracing can be improved through an app, which improves the speed and the accuracy, then that is going to relieve uh, the anxiety and really improve uh, health outcomes. So uh, in the case of my interaction with Senator Patrick, uh, if the app uh, had been uh, already up and running and we both had it on our phones, uh, I think it's a fair case that I probably wouldn't have uh, been able to pass on the coronavirus. So uh, that is a, a real world example of the app in practice. Now, uh, it doesn't uh, track your geolocation. It does not use location services. It uses the Bluetooth technology uh, to do a digital handshake uh, when you have come in touch with someone for 15 minutes, uh, really um, close personal contact. So we're talking about a metre and a half uh, apart. And then it, it makes a digital record and then it's able to be stored away in the case that someone is diagnosed as a positive uh, case. Now, the privacy safeguards I know are very important to people and it's been the subject of some debate. Now, this uh, bill establishes that the uh, OAIC will run the, the arrangements. Uh, it establishes rules for the uh, collection and use and deletion of data. And very importantly, it ensures that the data is only available to the health workers in each state and territory. Uh, that means that uh, it is only people that are needed to undertake contact tracing that will be able to access the data. We have established it as a criminal offence uh, for anyone to uh, use that data in any other way. Now, there's been some discussion this morning in the chamber about the uh, the question of whether or not this data could be transferred to another jurisdiction. Uh, now, um, there is no case for that to be made in any way. The, the laws uh, that would be uh, passed by this parliament, if endorsed by these chambers, uh, would make it a criminal offence uh, for the data to be transferred to another country. Now, just because uh, the, the, uh, you know, a company, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, which is doing business in Australia, uh, happens to have a US parent. It doesn't mean that uh, Australia's laws don't apply. Australia's laws always apply. Uh, and uh, frankly, this sort of uh, nativism, uh, anti-international anti, anti uh, agenda, whether you're looking at, um, at migration or foreign investment, really has no place uh, in a modern uh, society like Australia. Now, I just wanted to thank the, the state health workers because uh, having been through the coronavirus, the contact tracing that the state health workers are doing is quite a stressful and challenging task. Uh, I have to say that in New South Wales, uh, which is the biggest jurisdiction and frankly has had the most cases, probably because Sydney is Australia's global city, uh, have really done an amazing job. Now, um, you know, yesterday was International Nurses Day. Uh, you know, a lot of the people that are doing the contact tracing are nurses by profession. I have a number of nurses in my own family that I'm very proud of. And the people that uh, looked after me and my, my family uh, in the, the state health system uh, owe a great debt to. So uh, I know often people want to think about the esoterics of legislation. Uh, this app will really improve the, the burden or relieve the burden on the state health workers that are having to perform really manual contact tracing. So the more people that download the app, uh, the lighter the load will be on the, uh, the nurses and the health workers. But of course, we'll also have the, the dividend of having more accurate information, more up-to-date information about uh, people that have come in touch with a positive case of coronavirus. So, uh, you know, technology improves lives. I see that every day in the fintech inquiry that I, that I chair. Uh, this is another great example of technology giving us a much faster ticket to freedom and really consolidating our efforts as a jurisdiction. I mean, th this is a jurisdiction, this is a country you want to be living in. Uh, as the world faces this shocking pandemic. Thank you. Senator Roberts. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I have pleasure in saying that One Nation will be supporting this bill. That doesn't mean that I will be downloading the app, as I'll explain. But firstly, I would like to compliment the Attorney General for the work that went into this bill. When Minister Hunt's regulations came out to accompany the app launch, my office had a number of reservations about the level of security provided on the data. This bill is needed to clear up those issues, and it has done so. I will mention these in passing for the benefit of our constituents. Then I will move on to the security risk that the app itself still represents. I did have a concern that the government was giving bad players an opportunity to access data on the server without detection. So there are two aspects to this, Madam Acting Deputy President. There's the app itself, and then there's the uploading of data to the server and the storing of that data and the use of that data. So I did have a concern that the government was giving bad players an opportunity to access data on the server without detection. The decision to ask the Office of the National Data Commissioner, the Commissioner, to overview data storage and access is a wise choice that addresses this concern. We, we, we uh, are pleased with that. I was also worried about Amazon having access to both the client file, which is needed to identify app users, and the data file for COVID positive users. This in effect gave Amazon access to significant personal information of app users. So let me explain a bit more. The separation now of the key file and the data access, the data file itself, under the supervision of the Commissioner, is the best way of making sure Amazon and the government keep each other honest. Well done. So in other words, we've got the government storing the data, we've got Amazon storing the data and the government having the keys. Both are needed. It can't be separate. There is one issue that not one party can have control. There is one issue here to do with the cryptography on the unique user IDs. The open source app that the COVID Safe app took as a starting point only requires 32-bit encryption. I would have hoped the app developers have taken that up to 128-bit and would ask the Commissioner to consider that. Now let me turn to a number of security issues in the app itself that need to be addressed. My office has put out a detailed sheet on this, so let me quickly mention them here and move on. The user ID can stick in the phone cache, causing a phone to broadcast multiple different user IDs over extended periods of time, which increases the chances of a phone being tracked. The COVID, secondly, the COVID Safe app overrides phone security settings to, the same, to use the same handshake address for a phone over the life of the app instead of changing every few minutes. This is a major security issue in the app. Thirdly, the COVID Safe app stores the make and model of the other phones it has matched within plain text where it can be easily read. This approach is not necessary since this data could easily be trapped when the app is registered instead of storing it in the phone. Fourthly, if someone has named their phone, such as in my case, Malcolm's iPhone, under some circumstances, this real name is what the other phone, sto phone stores. App users who have named their phone with their real name may be exposing themselves to danger. This results from the app using different ways of broadcasting data to maximise the chance of a match. This tells us that the developers have taken a deliberate decision to compromise safety to achieve the most number of matches. Fifth, data stored to the cloud is not deleted. If a cloud service is used to back up a, or sync a phone, the COVID Safe app contact log gets backed up to the cloud. This can be viewed by anyone with a sign in without the phone user's knowledge. So I acknowledge that this bill makes the behaviour illegal but not storing some of the data in plain English would have been a far better choice. Sixth, an app running in the background will not match with another app running in the background on an iPhone. The app does not meet the government's, number seven, the app does not meet the government's own standard for app accessibility, WCAG 2.0A. It fails accessibility tests on font size and field width. 
aren't people with a disability the first people that need to get this app? So that was sloppy. Eighth, errors that were detected early in the release of the app have still not been fixed. Registration fails over Wi-Fi, which is used in poor reception areas. Bluetooth conflicts with external devices. Power management on an iPhone interferes with the app. 3% of older phones cannot use the app. An alert message advising users that they have tested positive for COVID was ac being accidentally triggered. This was fixed by deleting the message, so currently the app can't be used to, to alert users when they actually do test positive. I must, however, compliment the government for this sudden concern about security. Where was the concern about people's privacy in this government's capture and use of the metadata of every Australian? This government is storing texts, telephone call details, social media posts, websites visited and website comments for every Australian. At Senate Estimates, we discovered that in 2019, there were 297,000 accesses of the metadata records of everyday Australians by 22 different government agencies. How many of these accesses were accompanied by a warrant, Madam Acting Deputy President? None. Not one warrant. Now, I understand this government feels the need to get this app in wide use and is prepared to write good data protection rules to achieve that. So I would ask the government to show it really cares about the privacy of everyday Australians by revisiting the wider issue of government use of private, private data. Because the government's track record on security is poor. So as I've explained, Madam Acting Deputy President, the shortfalls initially in our assessment of the app were to do with the data storage and access of that. That has now been resolved, or will be resolved, once this bill, privacy bill passes. However, the reverse is the case for the app. We were originally happy with the app. We now see a number of flaws in it. So that leaves, uh, leaves security issues in regard to people being able to track a, the, the phone owner, the phone, phone user. And that is not accept, acceptable. I also want to make a comment about the blackmail that's being used by the government to, um, to push this app. Minister Hunt said, you want to go to the footy? Download the app. We've just heard here Senator Bragg saying, this is our ticket to freedom. No, it's not. There are far more effective tickets to freedom. The Australian people have already shown a highly responsible approach to managing this COVID virus, and we need to extend that this, we, we need to stop the blackmail, stop the control that uh, is pushed over us. We need to get back to the freedoms that are inherent in being everyday Australians. That is part of our birthright, part of our citizenry, uh, that we have, are entitled to rights and freedoms. When we have permission from something to do something from a government, that is not a freedom. That is the reverse, because it is being withheld until the permission is granted. So we need to rely upon the trustworthiness and the competence and sense of responsibility of everyday Australians right around the country. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, let me summarise by saying that this bill is necessary and that is why One Nation will be supporting it. It is welcome. Secondly, the app is not up to scratch and that's why I won't be downloading it. And thirdly, we need to get back to freedom properly. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Privacy Amendment Bill 2020. Uh, let me start by sending my profound thanks to the many unsung heroes of this pandemic. The doctors, the nurses, uh, the healthcare workers, the patient care attendants, uh, the health officials, uh, all of whom have put themselves on the line. But beyond health, we've seen the childcare workers, the teachers, the scientists, the supermarket employees, the cleaners, those people who have allowed us to continue to function as a society. They have, uh, at great risk, um, sacrificed so much uh, to help save the life of others and support us during this critical time. I've spoken to many of my medical colleagues about the real-world implications of this virus, and they've told me some harrowing stories. When the data was emerging from Europe and we heard those stories about what life was like in ICU in Italy and other parts of Europe, 
I spoke to some of my colleagues who themselves were anaesthetists and intensivists. They were discussing how they would live apart from their families during this epidemic so that their children, their wives, their elderly parents weren't put at risk. I want to say thank you to them. At a personal level, of course, it's been difficult for many people. Um, I resigned to self-isolate. I didn't think it would be forced on the entire Australian community. Um, I've just stayed at home. I followed the advice of health experts. Lucy, the boys and I are finding new ways of doing everyday things. I know it's been hard on my elderly parents. They miss their grandkids. They miss the social connection. It's been tough on everyone. But it must also be said that it could have been a hell of a lot tougher. Australia's response so far to COVID-19 has been, by most measures, a success. There's a hell of a long way to go, but to date we've made some good decisions and had some good luck. Good luck because we're an island continent. We're a long way from the rest of the world. There's a the tyranny of distance, but when it comes to a pandemic, there's also the tyranny of proximity. We're lucky that this pandemic reached us in summer. We think there might be some seasonal variation with regards to the way this virus behaves. So yes, we've had some good luck, but we've also made some very good decisions. And when it comes to a government that has made some terrible decisions over so many other issues, you have to ask yourself why. The simple answer is that this response has been led by the medical and public health experts on the basis of the best possible evidence and modelling. The Australian Health Protection Principle Committee has brought together the vast expertise of our public health community. We are absolutely blessed to have some of the best public health professionals anywhere in the world helping to drive the response to this epidemic. They made some tough decisions early that proved to be the right decisions, the restrictions on travel, particularly from China, then from Europe and other countries across the world. We've seen a proportionate response in terms of the restriction of activities. It must be said, driven by significant pressure from some state jurisdictions. And overall, it has led to us flattening the curve, which was our objective at the start. And I have to say, I've asked myself a number of times, why is it that when confronting a major threat to our health, the government has decided to listen to the experts, yet when faced with a threat not just to human health but to all life on earth, they ignore the experts, they ignore the science. Look at our response to climate change today. And we know what the answer is, a response driven by vested, powerful interest groups, driven by money, driven by massive corporate donations, driven by the lobbying that goes on behind closed doors, driven by the threat of campaigns from some of those vested interest groups. Just imagine if this government had put science and expertise in terms of responding to the threat of catastrophic climate change front and centre. More jobs, more investment, clean air, energy independence, freed from the shackles of big energy companies, yet they have failed comprehensively to deliver. As I said, their response to date has been a success. I've tried to cut the government some slack along the way. We are confronted with significant, uh, significant uncertainty uh, when it comes to how we respond to this virus. But it must be said that early on many of the messages were confused and contradictory. It must be said that when it comes to outbreaks like the Ruby Princess, there were some very, very poor decisions made. And it should cause a rethink to the way we structure border security in this country. There are many other lessons learned. We learned that when it comes to personal protective equipment in our medical stockpile, it simply did not have enough to keep our health workers safe. There was a lot of talk about providing ventilators during the initial 
uh, stages of this pandemic. But ventilators are no good if you don't have the personal protective equipment to operate them, if you don't have the gowns, the masks, the face shields. And again, talking to my colleagues in intensive care units, they weren't concerned about access to ventilators. They were concerned about access to personal protective equipment. And through the course of this pandemic, we've learned that the medical stockpile was dangerously unprepared. And we must learn those lessons and learn them for any future pandemic. The government's got to make sure that they conduct a detailed review of the medical stockpile, not just when it comes to personal protective equipment, but when it comes to all facets of the drugs and other equipment necessary when confronted with a pandemic like this. And that means ensuring that we've got local manufacturing capacity to, to produce those goods when and where they are needed. We've also called for the government to make the influenza vaccine free for all Australians. We know how critical it is that with the flu season upon us that vulnerable Australians, indeed all Australians, should protect themselves against the risk of influenza. And we do know that if someone were to contract the flu, they would be at significantly higher risk of complications from COVID-19. We've supported the rollout of the um, uh, broad-scale telehealth um, uh, item numbers. It's been a hell of a long time coming, and, uh, and we know now that it has served Australians very well during this pandemic. It's of concern that many Australians aren't seeing medical professionals during this crisis, and uh, I would encourage everybody uh, to continue to maintain a relationship uh, with their local doctor, uh, their community health centre, uh, with practice nurses, because those chronic medical conditions—diabetes, heart disease, hypertension—are uh, all, all need to be managed and need to be managed with regular engagement with a health worker. See a doctor. Make sure that you're getting the appropriate treatment that you need. The government has to keep these telehealth items in place after this crisis. They are an essential part uh, of modern medicine. Uh, they give people more choices about how they engage with health practitioners, and they've got the potential to go some way to bridge the divide between urban and rural and remote communities with respect to healthcare. Of course, it's not just in healthcare. We know that in so many other industries, the move to use online technologies has the capacity to reduce pressures on commuting, uh, to support women uh, in the workplace, more family-friendly work environments, and we need to speed up support for everybody to be able to access those technologies. Now to the uh, COVID Safe app. I have to start with um, the government's track record when it comes to establishing legal protection for the use of, of data that they collect. And um, their track record is abysmal. From mandatory data retention to the My Health Records site, the government has a history of surveilling its own citizens and failing to protect private information. The data retention laws allowed warrantless access to personal data. We fought against it and we lost. So it's absolutely crystal clear that the My Health Record legislation, for example, required amendment. And we achieved that in the Senate as a result of long and um, sustained advocacy so that personal data could be protected and that that important reform could be implemented. We saw people's Medicare numbers being sold on the dark web, a key piece of identity information that caught people by surprise. So the government's track record on uh, managing people's data is not good. However, I am pleased that the government has listened to the criticism directed against it when it comes to this app and are looking at tightening up the uh, protections in this legislation for the data collected by the COVID Safe app. Of course, it doesn't guarantee that the data is safe. It doesn't mean that there might not be some scope creep into the future. And that's why it is so critical uh, that the Senate support uh, amendments that will be moved by my colleague Senator McKim 
to further ensure protections. And I'd, I'd, I'd uh, uh, urge all senators to support those amendments. Now, I say to uh, all Australians, this is clearly a voluntary decision. People need to weigh up the decision for themselves. And I've had to do that personally, to weigh up this government's track record on data protection against my role as someone who's been a public health specialist and a GP. I'm aware that from a public health perspective, this app does have the potential to help contact tracing officials to identify and contact people who may have come into co contact with COVID-19 faster and more effectively. Now, it's new technology. We aren't sure just how effective it will be. It's not going to render uh, traditional contact tracing redundant. Uh, it won't be a panacea, but it may help. And if it can stop an outbreak faster, it has the potential to save lives. So it's on the basis of weighing up those options and considering that if we were to download this app, we could potentially save lives, that I have decided that I will download this app. Whether we download it or not, it's so critical that we invest, continue to invest in our public health workforce, that we continue traditional contact tracing, because that is at the heart of a sustained response to this pandemic. That's why I support this legislation and that is why I will be downloading this app. The bill uh, right now, uh, the concern is that we are facing potentially, with the easing of restrictions, a second wave. We've seen that in many other jurisdictions, in South Korea, uh, in China, and uh, that is obviously of concern to many of us here. Uh, we don't know right now what the pathway out looks like. We know that the hunt is on for a vaccine. I'm watching that closely. There's a very promising candidate here at the University of Queensland. But the truth is there have been many candidates for vaccines and many failed candidates for vaccines. A vaccine to treat this pandemic is a possibility, not a certainty. Remember when the HIV uh, virus first emerged. We were promised that a vaccine would be developed within a few years. Many decades down the track, we still do not have one. What I do know, and, and look, I mean, many people will tell you, I many armchair experts will tell you what they believe the pathway out of this is. Um, the truth is that none of us know uh, exactly what the blueprint to move forward through this pandemic looks like. What I do know is that restricting people's activities has bought us some time, that some of the decisions uh, informed by our public health experts have bought us time. I know that the virus is likely to be with us for years. I know that easing restrictions re uh, risks another peak in the pandemic. But I also know that the longer these restrictions are in place, the harder life will be for many people. This isn't a trade-off between health and the economy, because poverty and unemployment and lack of access to education also have a profound impact on people's health. That's why we need to continue to invest in the response. It's, need, it's why we need to continue to trust expertise, and it's why I will be downloading this app. Senator Brockman. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I too rise to speak on this bill and thank all colleagues who have come previously for their contribution. It's good to see um, what I think is unanimity uh, around uh, this chamber on the benefits of having a contact tracing app such as this one in place to assist us in dealing with what has been an absolutely shocking pandemic. None of us could have predicted just a few short months ago uh, where we would be today and what we would be discussing today. We, uh, we probably all thought a few months ago that we would be talking significantly about economics. We would have just seen a budget handed down and obviously that is not the case. Instead, we are dealing with one of the most serious crises to hit, uh, well, the, the, the globe uh, in a very long time. And as we look at the way we so far, and, uh, and long way to go, but we have so far dealt 
with this global pandemic in Australia. I just say the Australian people have been absolutely magnificent and uh, working with the government, both this government, our government and the state governments in dealing with this pandemic. Uh, I think the Australian people have done themselves very proud indeed. Uh, and we see them taking the steps required to make sure we deal with this pandemic in a responsible way, uh, in a way that protects the most vulnerable in our community. Uh, and as many senators have already said, uh, this app is not a panacea unto itself. This app doesn't mean we can stop washing our hands or coughing into our elbows or maintaining safe social distance or not gathering in large crowds for, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but what this app does do is it adds a very important tool to the toolkit of the public health officials who are attempting to do the contact tracing, which is so important. We've all heard it, the test, trace, suppress. This app will assist greatly those state uh, public health officers who are trying to track down uh, when someone has become exposed and, and contracted this uh, a, a very dangerous virus, that they can track down the contacts of that person as quickly, efficiently and effectively as possible. It's designed to help keep you safe. It's designed to help keep your family safe, your community safe, by slowing down, by as I said, by tracing and suppressing this virus. Early notification of, of possible exposure is extraordinarily important in dealing with those local outbreaks which we know will happen and we've seen already. Uh, the meatworks in Victoria, uh, um, uh, uh, other cases uh, a little, and at the outbreak in Tasmania um, a little while back. We've seen these outbreaks and we know that this app uh, will help quickly track and trace the people involved in those outbreaks. Um, there are significant protections involved and, and, like my colleagues, I congratulate the ministers responsible uh, in this area. In particular, I'll, cons uh, I'll, I'll thank the, uh, my colleague from Western Australia, Christian Porter, um, uh, for his responsiveness in dealing with some of the concerns about the, the treatment of data when the idea of this app was initially being discussed and as the initial phase of development was underway. And I think all the ministers involved in this process have been extraordinarily responsive in making sure we get the balance right. There are uh, understandable concerns uh, and there is a balance to be struck, but I think in seeing uh, the, the fact that this place uh, uh, seemingly will support um, this bill, uh, in a unanimous fashion, will recognise that, that those ministers have been responsive and that the correct balance has been struck. Um, there are a number of layers of volunteerism about this app. First of all, you choose to download it. Uh, so if, if, uh, and, and I absolutely encourage you to do so. And when you're thinking about for those millions of Australians who already have, I thank you. And when you're thinking about the rest of, of, of Australians who are thinking about uh, when and whether to download the app, I would just absolutely urge you to think about why we adopt something like this. We adopt it to protect, to help protect our families, our parents, our grandparents. Uh, we adopt it to help protect our essential service workers who many in this place have thanked, and I certainly add, add my voice to the thanks to our many essential service workers from the health system to those who have, have been uh, continuing to work in, in our grocery stores, making sure we've got food to eat, um, uh, and right across the economy, those essential parts of the economy that have kept going at risk to themselves will help to be protected if you download this app. Um, we are helping to protect the vulnerable, those uh, with uh, a suppression of their immune system uh, due to an underlying health condition. We are, we are helping pr to protect the old. Um, you know, when, when my family's out walking in the park, we want to be able to say good day to the, the, um, the, 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 um, the older Australian who who's, uh, lives up the road from us. 
uh, we, we want to do that in confidence that we have as many systems and structures in place as we can to uh, protect as many uh, of our vulnerable Australians as we can. And of course, there's a second vol voluntary point in the app, and that is that unless and until a person is diagnosed with COVID-19, no contact information collected in the app is disclosed or able to be accessed. And I think that that is a very important um, second part of the way this app functions. It's very important to providing that uh, balance, providing that level of certainty to the Australian public that they they can. And, and I really do urge all Australians to think seriously, if you haven't already, about downloading this app, about uh, doing everything we can to make sure that our path out of uh, this pandemic uh, is as smooth and as efficient and as quick as it possibly can be. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Rice. Deputy President, Look, before I speak specifically on the bill that is before us today, I want to use this opportunity to talk about the massive impact that COVID-19 has had on our society and our economy. It's the first time that I have had a chance to speak about um, COVID-19 and the pandemic in this chamber since it all arose, having not been here for the last two um, sitting days. And it is such a massive thing that our globe is going through, certainly within my lifetime, and, and the, the unexpected nature of it, of how our lives have been turned upside down, of how our economy has been turned upside down, our society has been turned upside down, and then the responses to it, and how things that were seen to be impossible we've realised we have to do. The huge support for the communities sort of in terms of maintaining jobs. Clearly, you know, that from the Greens' position, there's more that we feel the government needs to be doing. But in general, how, as a society, we are all in it together and we have all worked together to get us through this time of crisis in the best shape as possible. And I really want to pay tribute to the people who have been there on the front line getting us through, the healthcare workers, obviously, but those other front line workers. And I was thinking today here in Parliament House at the high risk, having had brought people in from all over the country, and there are the cleaners going about their business. They are the people that are on the front line. They are the people that are having to go from office to office and who are most at risk. The people working in public transport, the people stocking the shelves um, at the supermarkets. And whereas so many of us have had the ability obviously with its um, problems as well, to, to work from home. They are the people whose jobs can't be done from home. So I really want to sort of send my thanks to them. And I also want to acknowledge the huge impacts on people, obviously the people who have lost loved ones, and it's devastating. But at least we could look, you know, with, with because of the, the work that we've done in Australia, how the loss of life has been much more limited than in other parts of the world, and I really do give, give thanks for that. And the impacts on people who haven't lost their lives but have, are going to have ongoing health concerns, and you know, suddenly their lives have been changed. Where they thought that life was going forward, they are now having to deal with the after effects of stroke or other neurological problems or other lung problems. Um, and the people, of course, who have lost, who have lost employment, who aren't, have haven't been able to continue on with their studies, the people who are, who are finding themselves you know, not knowing what life is, has, has got ahead for them, and the people who are really struggling with the social isolation, the people struggling with mental health problems, whether it's young people, older people, people who are you know, really having, doing it tough um, because, of, because of the social isolation, the physical distancing that's going on. I also want to acknowledge then how this pandemic has made it very clear the role of government and the importance of having government action and the importance of us all working together and being able to trust that our government is taking action in our interest and that those actions are being transparent and accountable. It's been a real test for, for our democracy and I have been pleased to see that as a result you know, during this pandemic that trust in our democracy has gone up. And that can only be a good thing. Obviously, that trust has to be earned, um, and that transparency and that accountability is, is crucial. 
So, moving on to this legislation, and I'm very well aware. I mean, well, first of all, I mean, much so much has already been said about the privacy issues surrounding this app. And I support the remarks that have been ma made by my colleagues, including the Mel member for Melbourne and the other place, my colleague Senator McKim here, and the, co and the comments that Senator Di Natale just made just before. And I'm aware that this legislation concerns privacy issues, obviously, rather than the app itself. But clearly, the two are related. You don't have one without the other. I mean, journalist Bernard Keane has critiqued the app, arguing that it provides a false sense of security. What it will deliver primarily is a false sense of security for people and a sense that something is being done, which, by the way, is standard for technological solutionism. There is a belief that a social or economic problem can be solved with a stroke or maybe a keystroke with some great new piece of tech without anyone having to make hard decisions or undergo sacrifices. It is the inflation of micro-level solutions. A particular tool will help me with a problem or address a need of mine to complex, macro, global-level problems. I mean, the truth is, as we know, that this app is only a tiny part of what needs to be done. And it's going to be a long, hard struggle to save lives in the face of this pandemic. I mean, COVID-19 has changed so much of our lives, and we are not about to snap back, either economically or socially. We don't have any silver bullets yet. And, and this app and all the discussion that's been had about it, I mean, Irregardless of the privacy issues and people's concerns with weighing up those privacy issues with the value of having the app, it, this app has still got its faults. I mean, for me, I'm still, I am going to wait and see whether the amendments that the Greens are putting up today get adopted to improve the privacy concern, to overcome some of those privacy concerns before I make a final decision to download the app. But my decision on whether to download the app has also been seriously influenced by the fact that it actually doesn't work very well on my iPhone. That, you know, what's the point of me having an app on my phone that actually isn't working if I am waiting in a queue doing my emails or talking to somebody on the phone? Just when you would want, you know, if you're waiting in a queue at the supermarket or somewhere for 15 minutes, and it's, of course there's the issue of the 15 minutes as well as the, the usefulness of it, but just when you're in those circumstances when you might actually be doing something else in your phone, if the app's not working, what's the point of it? So we will hopefully, you know, the technology may overcome these problems, but we d it's not a silver bullet. And even if a vaccine is even and in terms of tackling this pandemic, there is no you know, one thing that's going to solve it. I mean, even if we get to having a vaccine, its, its impact will depend crucially on surmounting a range of other, other challenges, clear science communication, effect, effective public health systems and effective international aid that supports our neighbours to make sure that um, people all around the world can access this vaccine as they deal with the same challenges. So much depends on other harder challenges, how we as a society care for each other, on public health, on mental health support, on income support. These are the crucial issues that we have to be facing on, and these are the challenges that this app isn't going to fix. And getting the privacy, um, the, the privacy concerns fixed is right aren't going to fix these challenges either. And so, in particular, I want to talk today about a community that faces a set of unique challenges in the midst of this pandemic. And over the past weeks, as we've experienced this pandemic, I've met with several organisations and individuals from lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender diverse, intersex and queer communities to check in on their work and to get their insight into what COVID-19 has meant for them and the people they work with. And their concerns echo the points covered in the paper put together by Equality Australia, published after they assembled a roundtable of, of LGBTIQ plus and allied organisations to discuss COVID-19 impacts on LGBTIQ plus communities. Some of the issues that Equality Australia raised include the health disparities, which put some LGBTIQ plus people at greater risk of severe health consequences from contracting COVID-19, the mental health disparities, particularly in rates of depression and suicide, 
which place LGBTIQ people at significant risk when faced with physical distancing measures and greater isolation, a sudden loss of community support and cultural spaces, barriers to finding comfort and connection with our chosen families, and the possibility for some of living in unsafe and or unsupportive environments. And their third um, broad area of impacts was the historical and continuing experience of experiences of discrimination which make accessing inclusive health care, support, services and information and interacting with law enforcement more challenging, while LGBTIQ plus organisations are themselves insufficiently supported to meet the increased demand for their services. They, Equality Australia continues that this potentially devastating combination of impacts and consequences may be further compounded and magnified for those with additional needs based on other attributes such as disability or age. And with regard to other LGBT, LGBTIQ plus organisations, I met recently with Joe Ball, who's the CEO of Switchboard Victoria, and it was incredible to hear of the work that they are doing. Um, that their, that organisation is doing during this crisis. They've been continuing to support, uh, to provide a support line even as we face a pandemic. They made the hard decision that they wouldn't have volunteers staffing their line, so they've had to have a massively increased um, financial out, uh, um, contribution, or a, a financial impost by employing paid staff. But they also made the decision that these paid staff staffing their helpline needed to still be able to come into their headquarters because it was just not safe for people mentally to be having to cope with, the, with what they were hearing on that helpline. They needed to be there to support each other. And tragically, I hear that many of the calls they've been receiving are now from people who are in fear for their safety because they've had to shift locations or change how they live because of health risks during this pandemic. And their work is crucial and must be supported. Another organisation I've spoken to with is Miners 18, who work with young queer people. And they are found facing compounding challenges because young people, the unemployment that has hit young people, massive massive unemployment because they are overwhelmingly people working in casualised employment, they are working in the hospitality industries and the tourism industries and are you know, losing their jobs and have been struggling to be supported um, even after that. And the Equality Australia report spoke about the resilience, resourcefulness and creativity of LGBTIQ plus people in the face of this crisis. And I want to acknowledge and pay tribute to all those characteristics and more. This is an incredibly difficult time for everyone, and people in LGBTIQ communities and their families face unique and acute impacts. I mean, this app tackles a tiny part of the challenges that we as a society face. It's got a tiny contribution of what needs to occur to keep everyone in our society safe and healthy in the face of this pandemic. I know that much more is being done but much more still remains to be done. We need to be considering more and urgent government action to be providing more support. LGBTIQ plus people and their families in particular must be able to access services without fear of discrimination and must have access to safe housing and other services in this crisis. And governments at all levels need to fund these services. They need to be focusing on this as well as this as, um, applications like this app, that they need to be funding the services that people need, from health to housing, and not to cut corners on this. And I know from speaking to these frontline services that we get amazing bang for buck from them, even without any funding. They stretch their resources to the limits, so they should be adequately funded and properly, properly resourced as part of the national response to this pandemic. So as we're considering this, this app today, and look, you know, I think we, we have still got more work to be done to make sure that this app is fit for purpose and that this map, app doesn't compromise people's privacies. But as I said, it is only a tiny part of what we still need to do to keep our society safe and healthy in the face of this pandemic. Oh, are you seeking to speak on this, Senator McAllister? I am, Madam Deputy President. Thank you, and I assume you're rising as the oh, minister to close the debate. Yeah. 
Thank you, Senator McAllister. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to make a contribution. Like many people in this place, I uh, have made the decision quite quickly that I would download the app. I did it with some reservations. The government's record practically in securing private information is not a strong record. But more concerningly, the government's interest in protecting privacy, particularly digital privacy, appears to be extremely limited. And my experience with the government is that both their practical capabilities in terms of affecting any protections they may wish to put in place and their willingness to do so has combined to produce a series of problems uh, in relation to government digital projects that made me very hesitant. And I should, of course, indicate that that hesitation is not particularly about my own privacy, but about the overall framework for privacy that uh, has been put in place by the government. That said, the government appears to have made quite serious attempts, both in the original determination by the minister and in the bill that is before the chamber at this time, to make serious, to put in place serious safeguards to support privacy. And it's on that basis that we're supportive of this legislation. My hope is that this experience will encourage the government to give consideration to these same matters when it develops other interventions that also go to privacy. Because part of the problem, of course, is that when we ask the community to uh, engage with um, the government and with the government's app, they've seen all of the other instances where government has appeared indifferent to their privacy, and we reap what we sow. But on this occasion, uh, Labor has sought to support the government's public health response and has seen that this app represents a sincere attempt to support uh, a broader public health response to convey, contain the impact of the pandemic. I want to turn to, that, uh, to the broad nature of that response, because at its heart, the government has asked the community, has asked all Australians to trust the health advice being provided by government and to trust in one another that together the actions that we all choose to take voluntarily, without compulsion, will support the health of our citizens. Not everybody is equally vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19. It's clear that people with pre-existing health conditions are more vulnerable, both to contracting the virus and to the impacts of the virus. It's clear that there are some parts of our community for whom the social determinants of health uh, render them vulnerable over their lifetime to poorer health outcomes are then themselves more vulnerable to the impact of the virus. In my own conversations in my own family, I've made it clear to younger family members that, yeah, they may not be impacted as severely by this virus, but Older people in our community, people that they know, people that they love, are likely to be impacted. And it's on that basis that we all have engaged in the social distancing measures that have been requested of us. It is fundamentally an approach built on trust. Trust in the scientific advice, trust in the medical advice, trust that government is acting in our best interests. Trust that governments are collabor collaborating within the Federation to protect the Australian community. Trust that all of the people around us, all the people in our neighbourhoods and in our workplaces, are doing our best with the advice we have to prevent the spread of the virus. Makes us realise what an important asset trust actually is in a democratic system. 
it should provide cause for reflection in this place about what is required amongst parliamentarians, amongst political representatives, to build and sustain trust, not just in this policy area, but in all policy areas, because it is fundamental to our ability to respond to the circumstances we find ourselves in now, and it will be fundamental to our ability to respond to challenges that will arise in the future. I do want to sound a note of caution about over-reliance on the app as a public health solution. The government's laid out a range of measures that are necessary to protect the community, and we shouldn't think that the app itself provides a kind of magical protection. Indeed, the government's own criteria for take-up of the app seems to have changed dramatically. At first, it was indicated that what was required was 40 per cent of the population. It now appears that the goalposts have moved and what is required for the app to be effective is 40 per cent of the adult population that uses a mobile phone. That shift alone should, should provide some indication that this isn't an exact science. And in fact, what is required is the implementation of a whole suite of measures, most of which do not rely on technology. Most of the measures rely, as I said earlier, on individual citizens taking a decision to voluntarily make choices that will protect fellow citizens by limiting our interaction with one another. I do think that now that we have moved out of the acute phase of this crisis and into what will be a long period of transition back to some kind of normality, we should think carefully about the opportunities to engage civil society in support of that objective. We are blessed with leaders right across our community who stand up in their local communities and voluntarily play a role. They choose to play a role as a leader of a sporting association. They choose to play a role as a leader in a school PNC. They choose to play a role as a leader in a local environment group. These are leaders who are fundamental to establishing the kind of trust at a local and personal level within a community that allows our society to function. And they are leaders who are not often recognised, but they are leaders who would be immensely valuable in the fight we are presently engaged in to contain this pandemic. They are probably infinitely more powerful than an app. And I think as we develop our response and roll it out across the community, we ought to be thinking about the kinds of community engagement that might be possible if we really leverage the power of civil society to respond to the challenge before us. This app is important. It will give our remarkable public health officials new tools to engage in contact tracing. It will supplement the data that they already have before them when they engage in that contact tracing process. And I want to place on record my thanks particularly to the health workers in my home state in New South Wales who have been working so hard, such long hours, in a sensitive environment with people who are unwell to engage in contact tracing. This app will do a great deal to support their work, and it is on that basis that we provide support. But we do need to remember that the public health response is much broader than simply a piece of technology. And I urge government to continue thinking about that, to be respectful about the community, to understand that a genuine response over a long period of time is going to need to be involving many, many people, and that the best way to do that is through transparency and an overall posture of respect to those many leaders in our community who already do so much to keep all of our organisations working. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, very grateful for the opportunity to make uh, a few remarks uh, on the uh, legislation that's before the Senate in relation to the COVID app. 
uh, the Privacy Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill. Um, Labor's proposition in relation to this legislation uh, and to the discussions around this legislation is the same as Labor's approach uh, to all of the government's responses uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in relation to all of the responses in terms of the public health aspect to the government's approach uh, and in relation to the government's economic approach, we have taken a cautiously constructive um, proposition. We have pointed out uh, where there are problems. Uh, we have supported uh, through this parliament uh, wave after wave of uh, economics propositions. Uh, the first tranche of the government's economic response, uh, which um, was clearly insufficient. We pointed it out at the time. Uh, the second and third tranches of the government's economic response. Uh, we pointed out the deficiencies of uh, all of those propositions, uh, but supported them through this place. And that's the approach uh, that we've taken in relation to the COVID Safe app. I do think that our approach in relation to the COVID Safe app has been more successful at developing change in the government's approach both in terms of the legislation and in terms of the practical implementation. And there are quite some uh, constructive changes and constructive discussions that have happened over the last couple of weeks that have improved the application of the COVID Safe uh, app. Those safeguards um, are, I think, useful in both improving the operation of the app uh, improving the privacy uh, aspects of the app, but critically, our job as members of parliament is to make sure that we're encouraging Australians, as many Australians as possible, uh, to sign up and to use the app properly to maximise its effectiveness. There are new provisions that impose six monthly reporting requirements on the Minister for Health and the Privacy Commissioner in respect of the COVID Safe app. There is a new provision that confers additional oversight and certification responsibilities on the Privacy Commissioner to ensure that the Commonwealth complies with its obligations to delete all of the COVID safe data when the app is no longer in use. And there is a new provision there because of Labor advocacy clarifying that law enforcement and intelligence services may not be given any role in administering the COVID safe data store. Uh, those are very significant improvements. Those are changes that are only there because Labor has engaged in constructive negotiations and discussions with the government. It doesn't mean that the bill is perfect. It doesn't mean that all of the issues are resolved. But we do believe that the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. We do believe that there should be a unanimous view coming out from leaders in the community encouraging Australians to sign up to the app. Well, that hasn't been the approach that everybody in the parliament has taken, of course. Some uh, members of this parliament, uh, all of them on the government side, have taken the opportunity to Yahoo and carry on in their communities. Uh, and a number of them have quite deliberately set out their personal objections and encouraged other Australians to take a cynical uh, approach uh, to the app. And that's been, I think, quite destructive. I was being interviewed on radio in, uh, in the New England. Uh, shortly after the local member, Mr Joyce, had been interviewed, who had been telling anybody who would listen that there was no way that Barnaby Joyce, the member for New England, would be signing up to the COVID Safe app. And I don't criticise Australians who make the decision not to sign up to the app for making that decision. That is entirely a matter for them. I do say that people in positions of leadership people who have had 
positions of significant leadership in this country and, it appears, aspire in the future to have significant positions of leadership. Um, aspire in a quite uniquely destructive kind of National Party kind of way to future positions of leadership, and we've seen that. I don't think the word spectacle does what happened in Eden Monero over the course of the last week justice. We've seen the spectacle of that toxic self-interest uh, unfurl and unravel for the Australian people. I do think that people in a position of leadership have a responsibility to use cautious language, to use language that's appropriate, and to actually have read a few things before they open their mouth. There are significant issues that are, um, that are given rise to when there is an app like this that collects the kind of data that it collects, that it's quite appropriate for people concerned about civil liberties uh, and concerned about privacy to ventilate those issues and to make sure those issues are satisfied. That is not what the member for New England was doing. He has never before in his political life shown the slightest regard for issues of privacy or issues of civil liberties. What he was doing was a sort of performance art, uh, yahooing for the crowd uh, in an effort to garner the support of people who are cynical um, about the government's activities in this area. I haven't seen Mr Joyce talking about the data that people hand over to Google or the data that people hand over to Facebook. He's no, been nowhere to be seen on some of the difficult questions that government uh, and our intelligence community have had to grapple with in terms of the appropriate levels of privacy protections and data protections that are proper uh, when dealing with the kinds of issues uh, that they deal with. He's been nowhere to be seen on any of those issues. But on this issue, there he is, popping up on regional radio as a sort of uh, toxic dwarf uh, trying, to, trying to garner support for himself. That's not a model of leadership for members of parliament or senators. That's not what's happened uh, for the majority of the parliament. There are criticisms, I think valid criticisms, of the approach that the government has taken. I, saw, um, uh, I watched carefully uh, the comments that Ed Husick has made about the government's decision to award the data storage contracts to Amazon Web Services. Uh, and I think those are, I appreciate now in hindsight, uh, a useful commentary. There were alternative Australian providers uh, of data services who could have been considered. Uh, the government has chosen uh, an overseas provider, and that comes uh, with some risks. Uh, there are the, the prohibition on requiring individuals to download COVID safe is too narrow, some people say. Uh, the bill doesn't ensure that the COVID app data is retained in the data store for the minimum period necessary to complete contact tracing. The bill doesn't prescribe uh, some of the appropriate core design principles. Well, those are, I think, legitimate criticisms, but we are where we are. The legislation is in front of us. Improvements have been made. Uh, and I think it's time for the chamber, this, the Senate chamber, to support the legislation and move forward. Five million people, five million Australians, have downloaded the COVID Safe app. Uh, it is not clear, and has never been clear, what the threshold is for the COVID Safe to be effective in doing its work. At one point, the government said 40 per cent of Australians signing up was an effective level. Uh, the government's backtracked very quickly away from that proposition. Uh, it is now unclear, and I hope that this is dealt with in the course uh, of the committee inquiry 
uh, into the government's coronavirus response. What is an effective level of Australians signing up and properly utilising the COVID Safe app? Well, as I say, it's very important that the legislation is passed. It's very important that Australians download the app. It's very important that Australians use the app properly, uh, make sure their Bluetooth's turned on when they leave home, uh, make sure they do all the right things. But as Senator McAllister said uh, prior to me um, stepping up to make a few remarks, it cannot be, uh, it is not a magic response that is going to take place of all of the other things that must occur to keep Australians safe in the context of this virus. We cannot have an over-reliance on the COVID Safe app. We need to encourage Australians to participate in it, but we can't allow that to become uh, a, a reason for Australians not to follow the directions of public health authorities uh, and not to do the things that we have so successfully done as a community. We still need to do the social distancing, probably for many months to come. Now, it's true that each of the states have had different responses uh, and different approaches to the restrictions that have been applied to Australians and to Australian businesses uh, over the period. It is very important that Australians in each of our communities follow the directions and work constructively with the state governments. The National Cabinet uh, has been an interesting process to observe. Uh, in, in some respects, the National Cabinet has helped, I think, this Prime Minister not make some pretty bad decisions. Uh, the National Cabinet has been pretty useful at restraining some of the Prime Minister's worst instincts when it comes to dealing with the crisis. And when you look overseas, you can see where that sort of robotically conservative politics that we've seen in the American political system, you know, we must guard against that kind of behaviour, that kind of politics uh, emerging on the Australian scene. And there are plenty of people uh, on the other side of politics who are interested in promoting those sorts of propositions. We've seen demonstrations, armed demonstrations, inside parliaments uh, in the United States, inside state parliaments. People with weapons charging into the parliaments. Uh, that's not the uh, American democracy or politics uh, that, that uh, I remember as being such an inspiration to democracies around the world. We've seen sort of weird, strange copy demonstrations around the country. And the Prime Minister says it's OK for people to go and do that, and I suppose it is if they follow the social distancing requirements. But we have seen emerging expressions from some members uh, of uh, the other side of politics, some members of the Liberal Party, particularly in Victoria, uh, really starting to harden their opposition to the work of the Andrews government, um, to the approach that the Andrews government has taken there. And it's a narrow, shallow, venal approach uh, that has been, I think, a real problem in terms of the way that we're our real job here to inspire confidence and trust from Australian people in the government's approach. I noticed Mr Smith, Mr Tim Smith, a local MP that nobody had ever heard of before, on his feet getting stuck into the Andrews government's approach. Well, that's inconsistent with where the Prime Minister's been, where the National Cabinet's been. It's inconsistent with the kind of unity that we need to inspire uh, around our struggle against this dangerous pandemic virus, and it's inconsistent with the approach that we should be taking uh, to the legislation that's in front of the Senate uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President, and uh, thank all senators for their contribution to the debate on this bill today. The privacy 
Amendment Public Health Contact Information Bill will implement the strongest possible ongoing privacy protections for data collected and generated by the Australian Government's COVID Safe app. Passage of this bill today will give the Australian public the greatest confidence that their personal information is secure when they choose to download and use COVID Safe, thereby helping Australia to combat the spread of COVID-19. The bill was designed to replace and enhance the interim privacy protections for COVID Safe app data that were provided by the Minister for Health's biosecurity determination. This bill, very importantly, enshrines these privacy protections in primary legislation by inserting a new part into the Privacy Act 1988. Key provisions from the determination formalised by the bill include the criminal offence for unauthorised collection, disclosure and use of COVID safe app data and the criminal offence for requiring another person to download and use COVID safe or upload their data to the national COVID safe data store. The bill also goes further than the determination. It does this by introducing new additional privacy protections the most significant of which extends the Australian Privacy Principles, the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme and the oversight of the Australian Information Commissioner to COVID Safe App Data. This means that a breach of the bill will also be a breach of the Privacy Act, including cases of breach by state and territory health officials. This is not the only privacy protection that this bill strengthens. The law now includes provisions that guarantee that no further data can be collected from former COVID safe users and establish a clear legislative defined, legislatively defined process for how all data in the National COVID Safe Data Store will be deleted when the COVID Safe app is no longer required. A number of points have been raised in the debate today, and let me refer to those briefly. Firstly, in relation to the contract with AWS. It is a combination of hosting, development and operational services, which is more extensive than services provided by pure hosting providers. Uh, while there are several Australian cloud providers that could have provided elements of the service that AWS has provided, AWS's ability to scale very quickly in this pandemic context and to provide a broader range of services is beneficial for the purposes to which uh, the COVID Safe app uh, is to be put. In relation to the Cloud Act, uh, any transfer of data to any country outside Australia will constitute a criminal offence under the provisions of the bill and attract a penalty of five years' imprisonment. I understand there are also issues raised in relation to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, and I would uh, affirm for the record that since this government was uh, elected, funding to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner has increased by over 75 per cent. And as we do with all agencies, we'll continue to work with the OIAC to understand their resourcing requirements moving forward. All of the agreements uh, with the states and territories are signed. All of the states and territories have received appropriate training and are ready to access the data. Those agreements will, of course, need to be revised to take account of the final form of the amendments made to the Privacy Act 1988 by the parliament. We will also seek the approval of the states and territories to uh, release those revised agreements. Madam Deputy President, uh, this bill goes to unprecedented lengths to protect data collected and generated by the COVID Safe app. It is important that we do that. As reiterated by the Prime Minister, the Attorney General and the Minister for Health in recent days, we have made COVID Safe app data the most private and secure personal information in the country, whether that information is collected by a government agency or a private organisation. By passing this bill through the Senate and into law, I sincerely echo the Attorney-General's own sincere hope that it gives all Australians the confidence they need to download and to use the COVID Safe app, as I have, as 5.83 million Australians have. Achieving a high uptake of COVID safe is important to help state and territory contact, contact traces to get on top of outbreaks. It's very important work that they do, and it will build upon the work of over 5 million Australians, as I have said, that have already downloaded the app and helping us to stop the spread of COVID-19. Thank you, um, Minister. 
Um, so are you moving the second? Oh, the question is that the um, the bill be read a second time. Uh, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Privacy Act 1988 and for related purposes. Thank you. Um, I believe that we are proceeding to a committee stage. I've seen some nods around the chamber. So is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy President. Can I, um, through you, obviously thank uh, Minister Payne for uh, her responses to um, issues that were raised during um, the second reading uh, contributions uh, of uh, many members, including Australian Greens um, members. And I'm very pleased um, to hear the commitment that the minister's given uh, that um, state and states and territories have been uh, asked um, whether they would uh, be happy with the data management protocols being released publicly. Understand there may need to be some revisions um, to those agreements or protocols as a result of this legislation being passed, but I genuinely hope that we are able uh, and the Australian people are able to, uh, to understand what uh, particular safeguards uh, are in uh, those agreements or protocols, because of course when the data goes to uh, the relevant data goes to um, state and territory health authorities. That does um, constitute one of one of the major vulnerabilities of the data uh, that will be collected by the app. Um, uh, Minister Payne also um, um, responded to um, questions that have been raised by a number of senators in regards to the operation of the U.S. Cloud Act by. Um, reminding us uh, something that we already knew, which was that this legislation um, does criminalise the, um, uh, the provision of the data overseas. But um, given the way the US Cloud Act operates, Minister, I, I just need to place on the record there is no way that you or anyone else can give this Senate and therefore the Australian people a 100 per cent guarantee that the data collected by this app, uh, this app will not end up in the hands of US law enforcement and security agencies. And that is because the US Cloud Act, which specifically um, relates to data stored overseas from the US, and obviously that would include um, data stored in Australia, uh, is available uh, and may be uh, accessed under warrants issued by a US court. So um, I asked the Attorney General's Department about this in uh, the Senate Select Committee last week, and it did become clear that there, that 100 per cent guarantee could not be given, uh, even though I acknowledge the government has done its best by legislating uh, here in Australia. The simple fact remains that uh, the head of AWS in the US uh, is likely to be far more concerned about the operation of US law than he or she is to be concerned about the operation of Australian law. So, Minister, if you're able to give that 100 per cent guarantee, please feel free to do that. I don't think you'll be able to, and that constitutes another um, uh, potential vulnerability for the data under this Act. Um, the one matter, uh, Minister, and I acknowledge that you weren't in the chamber um, during my contribution. That's obviously no criticism of you. The, uh, minister Cash, from memory, was the relevant minister. Um, but I did raise an issue um, which I'd be appreciative if you'd be able to seek some advice from and respond to me in the committee stage. And that is around the data collected by this app not being limited to a 15-minute duration. Um, and, uh, and in terms of um, uh, the data being collected uh, within a certain Bluetooth range. So could you confirm, please, um, uh, Minister, that this app actually collects data um, of a close contact no matter what the duration 
of that contact. In other words, a contact does not have to be for 15 minutes or more for this app to collect the data, and the filtering of that data, if you like, will actually um, be done uh, by either uh, or, uh, by uh, state uh, and territory health agencies as they, after they receive the data, they will then filter it and only um, take action in regards to um, contacts of more than 15 minutes duration. So if you're able to, uh, to address that, Minister, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, um, Deputy President. Thank you, uh, Senator McKim, for that question. And let me, uh, to the extent I am able, provide uh, some information. I think the last point that you made about the filtering process and only using the material, the data which is relevant, is is definitely correct. I am advised that it isn't technically technologically feasible to ignore the Bluetooth signals of other users beyond 1.5 metres because of the nature of Bluetooth technology, which means that signals can be detected within about 10 metres. And the COVID Safe app detects the strength of Bluetooth signals, not the distance. The app uses the detected strength of Bluetooth signals to estimate the distance between measures, uh, between users. I'm sorry. So the government has put in place access restrictions two digital handshakes uploaded to the National COVID Safe data store, and personnel in state and territory health authorities can only access digital handshakes which meet the risk parameters set on the basis of the medical advice about the risks of exposure to COVID-19. That ensures that the minimum amount of information required for contract, contact tracing is what is collected from users. Uh, Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thanks, thanks very much, Minister. So that addresses the issue of the, the range, if you like. Um, I, I wonder if you'd be able to give a, a response to the issue of duration in the same context, uh, and that is that uh, it is my understanding that the app will record um, contacts between two people who've downloaded the app of any duration, and then the same filtering process um, will occur at state and territory health agencies, and I'd be appreciative if you could respond to that issue specifically. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. And I understand that that is correct, uh, and then that is filtered in the same way and restricted in the same way in terms of access. Is that right? Senator Watt. Thanks, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, just on the point about Amazon Web Services, I think you said that. Uh, the reason or one of the reasons that the contract was awarded to Amazon was that Australian providers were not able to pro provide the full range of services that were required or words to that effect. Could you please let us know which services are required and are not able to be provided by local providers? Minister. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, I think well, what I said was that uh, there were se there are several Australian cloud providers that could provide elements of the services. What AWS brings together uh, is a combination of hosting, development, and operational services, plus the ability to scale that uh, very quickly uh, and provide a broader range of services. If there's any further information I can provide on that, I'll come back to you. Senator Watt. Sorry. That would be appreciated. There's obviously a lot of interest in this aspect. So some further detail about um, exactly uh, what was required that was not able to be sourced locally, I think, would be of great interest to people. Senator Patrick. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just following up from that uh, uh, conversation, um, are you able to tell us, Minister, noting that this has raised an issue? Uh, albeit uh, uh, perhaps incidental uh, uh, in respect of overseas uh, or the, uh, the operation of the Cloud Act. Um, how long is the contract for AWS uh, currently for? Is the intention uh, when that contract expires to look at perhaps an alternate um, uh, supplier, an Australian supplier, to remove all of that risk? Minister. Notice and come back to you. Senator Patrick. 
uh, uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, in your capacity as the Foreign Minister, have you engaged at all? And, and by the way, I was very impressed with your, uh, your technical versatility there as, a, uh, as a, someone with an engineering background. Uh, that, was, that was quite impressive. Um, but in your, minister, in your um, role as a Foreign Minister, have you engaged at all uh, with any, anyone in the US in respect of concerns uh, that, this, that, that have been raised about the Cloud Act and its intersection with the COVID app here in Australia? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Patrick. No, these matters have been handled by the responsible portfolio ministers, including obviously the Attorney General. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you. Senator Patrick asked uh, a very similar question to the one um, I was going to ask. And, Minister, because uh, you are the Foreign Minister, uh, gives uh, and a captive audience at the moment, I might add, uh, it gives me the opportunity to urge you um, to engage with uh, your counterparts in the US and seek a diplomatic assurance from the US government that, uh, that the US Cloud Act, there will be no attempts um, to access the COVID safe data under the US Cloud Act. So I'll simply obviously leave that with you. I'm not able to do that. You are. Uh, and I think that would be helpful if that, those diplomatic assurances um, um, could be sought. Um, just uh, bear um, with me briefly, Minister, because you did give a number of um, answers which were appreciated uh, in, your pre uh, in your previous um, uh, contributions. Yeah, just to follow up on uh, the data management protocols that we were we were discussing earlier. Um, can I ask why it was decided that um, that this legislation not um, create uh, an offence in regards to state and territory health authorities um, accessing data outside um, the parameters that you discussed earlier? Because um, there is no doubt, uh, and I acknowledge this in my second reading speech, that the privacy um, uh, parameters uh, around this data enshrined in this Act are significantly more robust than, um, than uh, those associated with other information on citizens that the government uh, and corporations collect. Um, but it does seem to me that you're relying on um, agreements between uh, the Commonwealth and state and territory authorities rather than legislating to make sure that um, state and Commonwealth authorities treat this data with respect. Minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator McKim, uh, first uh, I would say that uh, the state and territory authorities are subject to the provisions of the Act. So if they breach the Act in their use or application of the data, then they would be subject to the penalties uh, contained therein. Uh, and they are, of course, also subject to the operation of the Privacy Act 1988 uh, in, uh, in all of their uh, work as well. So uh, I'm not sure whether there is a specific issue that you are seeking uh, to clarify, but in the general, uh, I expect and uh, the government expects that by the passing of this bill, state and territory authorities who are dealing with the data are subject to its provisions and would be caught within that. Senator Watt. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Academy President. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, sorry, quite a mouthful at times. I've had too much water. It's this bottled water. Um, I didn't quite catch the full exchange regarding um, diplomatic assurances. Were you advising that you have made those? Uh, okay. Is there a reason that you haven't made those diplomatic assurances at this stage? So, or sought those? Um, as I would expect, uh, the uh, bill before the chamber has been dealt with by the responsible portfolio areas, which is Attorney General, Department of Home Affairs, and uh, so engagements have been undertaken by them. Senator Watt. Uh, but obviously, it's not their role to seek diplomatic assurances from another government. That would surely be your role as foreign minister. So I'm asking why, within government, there hasn't been a decision for you to seek those assurances. Minister. Those agencies work with international counterparts all the time uh, in, uh, in their work, and uh, if we thought uh, that it was necessary to do so, then we would make those appropriate uh, requests. 
Senator Watt. So you can't shed any light for us on why the agencies that you say are responsible for seeking those assurances have not chosen to do so? Done so. That is a matter which I would, of course, take on notice as a representing minister. Senator Watt. I appreciate it. If you could take on notice whether those assurances have been sought, uh, and if not, why not? Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, minister, firstly, uh, can I ask um, whether any Australian intelligence agencies have made any requests to the developers of the COVID Safe app? to create a backdoor into the app under powers granted by the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Assistance and Access Act 2018. Minister. No. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, and I'm very happy <laughs> to hear that. Um, can I ask, Minister, whether uh, any contra contracts are in place with either Apple or Google relating to the COVID Safe Act? And if so, do they have any access to any of the COVID safe data as part of these contracts? Minister. Uh, Senator, I can assure that there is no access to the data of that nature. Senator McKim. Are there any contracts between the government and Apple or Google relating to the COVID safe app? I am aware of and none that I have been advised of. Senator McKim. All right, thank you, Minister. I appreciate um, your. Um, your response. Uh, I think, Minister, I'll now move to some of the amendments um, that have been circulated uh, in the chamber. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Well, voice. you can do it afterwards, Murray, but I'm happy for you to do it now. So. Mind either way, but um, point of order. I was just going to make the point. I've, I've got a few. Uh, more general questions that don't relate to specific amendments. So, if it was more convenient to do those now, is that okay? Either way, Senator Watt. Okay, that sounds you. suitable. Um, Minister, there's been a lot of discussion about the targets that the uh, Prime Minister and other ministers set for the uptake of this app, and I think there's there's still a great degree of confusion out there about this. Um, and I think the reason that it matters so much is that, again, the Prime Minister and other ministers have repeatedly made clear that the easing of restrictions is linked to the uptake of the app. And I say this as someone who downloaded the app on the first night. I'm supportive of the downloading. You did, you did as well. I think many of us did. So I'm very supportive of the downloading. I've been trying to get others to do so as well. And, and I did that. I certainly did that on the basis that the Prime Minister and others had made clear that the easing of restrictions was linked to people uploading it um, or downloading it. So, just to start with, uh, is the is the government or, or are the easing so are the easing of restrictions linked to the percentage of the population that downloads the app? Minister. Madam Acting Deputy President, Senator Watt, uh, as I think has been canvassed uh, in the uh, debate earlier, and I was not here for all of it, uh, I acknowledge, uh, the, uh, the, the desire in relation to the app is to have as many people be like you, like me, uh, which is to download the app to assist in the, uh, in the process, particularly around uh, con contact tracing. And the ambition is for as many Australians as possible. But the approach to easing of restrictions, as you will have seen through the National Cabinet process, uh, is, uh, is based on the health advice that's received through the AHPPC, what it's possible for Australia and Australians to do in states and territories. Um, your state, my state, quite different in, uh, in their approaches, uh, are, uh, are using that as the premise, not uh, based on the number of people who have downloaded the app. Senator Watt. So, so the decisions around the easing of restrictions are not linked to any, the achievement of any particular rate of uh, downloading the app? That's okay. Senator Watt. That leaves me a little confused because there were many, many statements by the Prime Minister and other ministers in the lead up to that National Cabinet meeting that said that the reason we had to download the app was because we wouldn't have the restrictions eased. But is that is that not correct? 
Minister. Acting Deputy President. Um, Senator Watt, I think uh, self-evidently uh, the endeavour to put in place an app of this nature and to encourage Australians to take up uh, using uh, the app to download it uh, is, is an important part of the pathway uh, out of uh, the most uh, onerous aspects of the COVID-19 restrictions that have been put in place. Uh, and we do encourage as many Australians as possible to download the app because that will help. Absolutely that will help with all of these processes, uh, including contact tracing. And we know uh, and, uh, and you would be aware that uh, the contact tracing process is extraordinarily intensive uh, for health authorities and any mechanism which assists with that process is invaluable to, uh, to delivering the outcomes that we need to make sure that if there is an issue, if there is an outbreak, all of the contingencies that we need to be planning for across states and territories and through the National Cabinet and the Commonwealth Government, but if there is uh, a need to do that major contact tracing, that we have a better facilitated process for that, the Act will provide that. Uh, but uh, the number of uh, downloads uh, does, is not conditional in terms of the lifting of restrictions. The lifting of restrictions is a complex process. Uh, it's being addressed step by step in a very deliberative, deliberate way through the National Cabinet. And as I said, states and territories will make their own decisions in relation to that. But the advice and the process the National Cabinet has followed has been made very clear publicly. Senator Watt. I, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, the more people that download the app, the more effective it will be, and I, and I appreciate the purpose of the app. I'm left wondering then why it was that the Prime Minister and other ministers, in the lead-up to that National Cabinet meeting, repeatedly told people uh, that downloading the app was the key to having restrictions eased, if what I understand you're saying is that that's, there is no link. Minister. Thank you, Madam Deputy. Well, Senator Watt, a greater ability to determine where there are infections and the contacts that have been um, uh, that have been experienced around those infections is obviously going to assist in this entire process. Uh, I think that that's uh, quite compellingly logical, actually, and that's why the app. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the app uh, is so important, and obviously it contributes to an ability to. Uh, change the way we have had to do business in recent months, change the way we've had to live and what we've asked Australians to do in recent months, and which they have done overwhelmingly with great willingness and great support for this significant national undertaking to address the spread of coronavirus in this country. Uh, and the downloading of the app facilitates, makes easier, whatever words that, uh, that you would want to use, makes easier a lot of those processes in terms of contact tracing, in terms of being able to understand people's engagement if there are uh, outbreaks or issues that need to be considered. And I think uh, what the Prime Minister and other ministers have been very clear about is how important that is to the, the progress and the process of moving out of the most extreme of the restrictions that we have had to deal with. Oh, Senator Patrick. Uh, just uh, supplementary to that. Um, obviously, downloading the app itself doesn't uh, do anything. You have to then turn it on. And it has to work to achieve to, to achieve something. And so my my question goes into that kind of area because the COVID committee has heard evidence from the uh, uh, from the DTA uh, and Department of Health that there are um, currently degradations in the applications performance, uh, particularly in relation to when the, uh, when the data, uh, when the application is running in background or indeed if the phone is locked. Um, that creates a situation where you could have 100 per cent of the people downloading the application and if it doesn't work it doesn't help at all. Uh, I'm not suggesting that's the case. Are you in a position to give some better guidance as to uh, overall how you feel the application is working through the iterative process. And Minister, this is not a criticism. I understand you took on this uh, as something you could throw at the problem. And uh, from an engineering background, I know there, uh, you know, there, there are always is issues with, a, with an application as it comes online. Um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand what the status of it is right now and then uh, how you will inform the public as iterations of the software and the fi some of the fixes are made, uh, just so you're being, you're being open and, and, and honest with the, uh, 
with, with the people who have downloaded or, or in fact that may encourage others to download it. Minister. Thank you very much, um, Madam Deputy President. Senator Patrick, um, now we might be going to challenge my technical capacity, but I appreciate your uh, engineering uh, experience uh, being uh, gentle with me, if you don't mind. Uh, but, Senator, let me say the update process uh, would operate, it will operate in, and does in the way that you would expect any app update to work, through um, uh, messages on phones uh, and also through the government's messaging, the state and territory government's messaging uh, about that. But let me go through some of the points that I have here and uh, we'll see if they address uh, the concerns that, that, uh, that you have. Um, most definitely, let me be very clear in saying that the COVID Safe app works. Uh, from its launch, the app has been collecting data about users' close contacts after they download and register in the app. So if a user is diagnosed with COVID-19, they may upload close contact data to assist those state and territory contact tracing efforts. Now there's been, as you have observed, uh, some public discussion about whether COVID Safe works on iOS devices, uh, and the government's assured that the app operates on these, these devices as intended. We are aware of the variability in the quality of Bluetooth Minister, signals. Sorry, it being 12.45, um, the committee reports progress. Pursuant to order, I now call upon Senator Statements. Senator Van, you have the call. Deputy President, on the 15th of April of this year, two young women from the University of Melbourne were walking along Elizabeth Street in Melbourne, my home state of Victoria, when they were assaulted because of their race and ethnicity. To these two students, I would like to say, we stand with you. A week later, a family in Knoxfield, in the electorate of Aston, woke twice in one week to find the words, leave and die, and COVID-19 China die graffitied on their garage. Someone also threw a large rock through their front windows. To Jackson and your family, I would like to say, we stand with you. Earlier this month, in May, in Carnegie, a manager of a bubble tea shop was verb verbally abused while at her place of work. When she politely stood up for herself, she became the target of anonymous threatening phone calls and text messages. To Jennifer, I would like to say, we stand with you. To all families and individuals, business owners, international students who have faced racist attacks in Victoria and across Australia because of the coronavirus, I would like to say, we stand with you. It troubles me that these unprovoked attacks are just a small sample of increased racism experienced by some Victorians. Unfortunately, more recently, these attacks are not so unique. It troubles me that I could spend this entire time listing instances of racism in my home state that have occurred over the past month or so. My heart breaks when I put myself in the shoes of those facing these attacks. To imagine that they would be what they would be feeling and what they are going through, to me it's just unfathomable. Yet it has become a reality all too real. It troubles me that as we grapple with the challenges of coronavirus, coming together as a nation, many Asian Australians face on a daily basis the fear of being a target of racist attacks. They should not have to. Everyone has the right to feel safe in their homes and in their communities. When we say the words, and we've all said this, we're all in this together, the reality is some need to face underlying challenges that they simply shouldn't need to. Madam Acting Deputy President, in this short time that I do have, I would like to touch on an issue that has been brought to my attention by a constituent that is of Australian Chinese heritage. It is an issue that ma many may not un understand at first glance, but highlights that our choice of words in how we discuss coronavirus is something we should be mindful of. 
calling COVID-19 the China virus is trying to blame a people for a virus that could have appeared anywhere. Pandemics have and do appear in many different countries. Australia is right to call for an independent inquiry. All nations affected by this disease should back international calls for an inquiry. And an inquiry should be called into any event that affects the world to the extent that COVID-19 has. But that should happen regardless of where it arises. When we seek answers about the root of these racist attacks, where the, where the root of these racist attacks in Australia stem from, it seems to be that a small number of people hold prejudices and cannot separate, uh, separate Australians of Asian heritage with the origins of where we believe the coronavirus began. As my colleague in the other place, the member for Chisholm, Gladys Liu, aptly said, the coronavirus is not for Chinese Australians to answer for. I couldn't agree with the member for Chisholm more, and nor is it the responsibility for any private citizen living their daily lives. In what is one of the most successful multicultural nations in the world, Australia. In time, when we're not dealing with the pandemic, what is needed is an independent review of the coronavirus outbreak, an unprecedented global crisis that has caused an unprecedented, in our lifetimes at least, health, economic and social impacts. In time, we believe an honest assessment of events will be critical to learn the important lessons and to improve our response to future events such as another pandemic. The desire for an inquiry is not political manoeuvre whatsoever. It is about what knowing what went wrong, what can we better know and how we can strengthen our public health policy for the better. What this inquiry is not it is an attempt to push away nations or divide people. The global recovery will require all countries, including China, to come together. Recently, I hosted one of my regular roundtable engagements with the foreign diplomats in the, the Victorian consulate call. We were discussing the coronavirus crisis and the challenges that they and many of their diaspora are facing. In amongst the issues around international students, tourists trying to get home, working holiday backpackers, repatriation of a number of their um, citizens. Some of the Consul Generals raised concerns about these rise in racist attacks against members of their communities. And in particular, I must acknowledge Mrs Mazita Marzuki, Consul General of Malaysia, and Mr Long Zhou, Consul General of China, for their personal and ongoing engagement with me on this issue. And I recently had uh, a conversation with the Ambassador for Singapore, knowing that some of his citizens have been attacked as well. And I uh, recently posted letters to editors in newspapers in Singapore and Malaysia, and I thank them for looking at how we are facing this issue. It saddens me that those who represent our neighbours and partners in the region are seeing this ugliness. This is not the values that Australia promotes. It does not represent who we are as a people. It is completely against modern, accepting and open society that Australia is known for. Our acting Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs, Minister Tudge, who is also the member for Aston, has said on a number of occasions uh, that, the, uh, that we have one of the greatest multicultural countries in the world, where we welcome people from across the planet to our shores. And in doing so, we have been enriched and we encourage tolerance. As a government, Madam Acting Deputy President, we have worked quickly to address these racist attacks. In order for us to get back on track as a nation, we must come together and we must tackle this virus together. All people in Australia, whether you arrived here recently or your family have walked these lands since time memorial, should never have to accept aggressive acts towards them, let alone based on their heritage. I utterly condemn all racist attacks and behaviours against people in Australia. 
All Australians are in this challenge together, and only together we will get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, can I uh, begin by uh, endorsing the remarks of Senator Van? Uh, the, uh, the pandemic has sparked calls for a rapid and radical decoupling of Australia's trade and political engagement with China. And this is despite the fact that our resources and agricultural sectors have been the main beneficiaries of the massive growth in trade with China. And these calls have now been extended, unfortunately, beyond trade to science and research. And those making such calls ought to be very, very careful of what they wish for. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic will ultimately be overcome only by science, by the development of a vaccine. And that will depend on the collaborative efforts of scientists from all over the world, including Australia. But there are some conservative politicians, and this is where I might differ from Senator Van, some conservative politicians have been only too willing accomplices in a scurrilous media attacks on science. In response to media reports suggesting that eminent scientists have been dupes of the Chinese government, if not actively disloyal, they have called for an end to international collaboration in research until it can be uh, regulated and uh, it's alleged to uh, protect our national security. They demand, uh, of course, and, uh, this is a demand that ignores the fact that the activities of our scientists in universities and public research agencies already are subject to strict security calls, controls and to state ethics legislation, and that these controls are in fact much, much stronger than those that exist within the United States. They have no, of course, uh, they've seen no reports of any breaches of relevant legislation, such as the Defence Trade Controls Act or the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act. In fact, if there had been breaches, those would have to be reported by law. And so demands by these maverick politicians also ignore the fact that our intelligence agencies in Australia and elsewhere have expressed profound doubt about the claims that have been made by these media campaigns. Media stories such as those by Vishari Markson and published in the Daily Telegraph and other News Limited bastards were first purported to derive their information, what they called, from a dossier. The dossier compiled, they said, by Western intelligence sources. That was a shaky claim at best, but it does not even appear to be supported by our own intelligence agencies. It's most likely to be a collection of media reports. It's been suggested that, in fact, Ms. Markson's uh, obtained those materials from US diplomats acting in support of President Trump's re-election campaign. Now, we don't know the truth of that, but anyone who remembers how an earlier US administration used stories planted in the global media to spread the fiction of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq would certainly recognise the tactic. President Trump, of course, and, and Senator Vance quite right about this, has been intent on blaming the China for the pandemic. He calls the COVID-19 the Chinese disease and claims to have seen very strong evidence, quote unquote, that the virus originated in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Now, such language can only serve to inflame racism and xenophobia. Evidence has not been produced, and a claim, of course, is contrary to the conclusions of scientists around the world that study the genetic makeup of the contravirus. They, of course, have indicated the virus was not created in a laboratory, it was transmitted from animals to humans. It has been suggested the virus has been arose in the Wuhan wildlife markets. However, other 
experts, such as Professor Maureen Miller, recently interviewed on the ABC, uh, suggested that the virus, uh, who is in fact a virus expert from Columbia University, said, and, and her uh, reports were supported by researchers at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, suggest that the virus may well have commenced, uh, saw life first in Guangdong as early as September and have been mutated several times since then, spreading to Wuhan and then to France and to Germany. Now, the Prime Minister has not adhered to President Trump's declarations on the origin of the virus, nor have Ministers Birmingham, Andrews, Little Proud, supported the calls that have been made to bust open our relationship with China on science, research or on trade. But that hasn't deterred the actions of the mavericks within the coalition. Their ill-considered, reckless and irresponsible calls work directly against our national interest. And equally disturbing is their assault on the reputation of our leading scientists and researchers. Now, this is a new low, even in the long history of shameful attacks on science by members of this government. It recalls the campaigns directed against science by the far-right politicians in Europe in the 1930s. Campaigns that also shrugged off any need for evidence. Campaigns run by people who assured us that if you keep repeating a slur, however ill-founded, sooner or later people will believe it. Most recently, Ms Markson has announced uh, that she, well, what she called were explosive revelations that research leading to the unveiling of genetic sequencing of novel convirus was undertaken by the University of Sydney and Chinese Army Academy Military Medical Sciences. She names, among other scientists, those involved in research, Professor Wu Grandchild of the Wuhan Institute of Virology and Professor Edward Holmes of the University of Sydney. Ms Markson implies that the collaboration was somehow or other inappropriate, but doesn't tell us why. Earlier, Ms. Markson tried to find the somehow sinister uh, proposition that Dr. Trevor Drew, director of CSIRO's Australian Centre for Disease Preparation in Geelong, you know, the formerly known as the Animal Health Laboratories, had worked with Dr. Chu uh, Chang Hung, director of Chinese Academy of Military Medical Science. In other words, two scientists working in shared research interests are co-working in a collaborative manner. And that's it. The working relationship between Dr Drew and Dr Tu was seen as a fact in itself and the only fact, and out of this arose a dark web of hints that Australian security had been endangered. Ms Markson also reported to Dr Xu Zhengli and Dr Pen Zhao of the Wuhan Institute of Virology had previously worked at CSIRO facility in Geelong. Well, again, that's the only fact that's reported. It's hardly surprising that Chinese and other scientists interested in the transmission of viruses from animals to humans sought to conduct research at Australia's Centre for disease, disease Preparation. Anyone who recalls how CSIRO traced the transmission of the Hendra virus from bats to horses to humans should understand that. We should recall that four Australians died when that outbreak occurred and that it was CSIRO was in the lead agency in combating that outbreak. Yet to these mavericks, the collaboration should be suspended and that in fact all international collaboration should be stopped. Ignoring just how extensive the regulations are, it effectively claims that we should establish a new blacklist. These mavericks ought to know just how strict the protections of our national security are already built into legislation in this country, and any breaches of the Defence Control Act, the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act, are in fact required to be reported to Parliament. None have been. None. And we should, of course, understand that the foundations of anything Mrs. Markson chose to report about this collaboration. Researchers from CSIRO and her universities collaborate with colleagues all over the world. Not just China, but the United States, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, the Netherlands, Singapore and others. International collaboration will be the essential element in our defeat of the COVID-19 
pandemic. And that's the message that our chief scientist, Dr Finkel, delivered to the UNESCO meeting last month on behalf of the government. Smearing the reputation of scientists with baseless allegations puts at risk the international effort to develop a vaccine. The Prime Minister should reprimand those Senator in these Clark, ranks who are not supporting that effort. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about the impact that COVID-19 has had on hundreds of thousands of artists and entertainers right across Australia. And we know that this has been a tough time for all Australians. Whether you've had to stay away from your loved ones and find new ways to celebrate birthdays and have coffee catch-ups, to those who have lost their livelihoods, jobs and have no idea of what awaits them in the future, or if tragically you have lost a family member or a friend due to the health crisis of COVID-19. We have all felt these impacts in one way or another. There have been few things that have brought us together during these isolated times, but there, is one, there has been one thing that we have all been able to turn to and take comfort from, and that's our arts and our entertainment industry. A good book, our favourite TV and film, musicians doing gigs via so social media, and virtual exhibitions have all offered us an outlet to both escape and come together. This is not the first time, of course. We saw only just recently, over summer, that it was artists and creatives that were there in the midst of the bushfire crisis. They were the first to step up and to help out and to raise money at a much needed time. But there is no denying that this time round, the people who work in these industries have been left behind by the government. There has been no targeted package for this sector, like there has for others. And no matter how many times the government insists that JobKeeper is there to help them, the truth is a large amount of workers in these industries have fallen and are continuing to fall through the gaps, left with nothing. ABS data has shown just how hard the arts and entertainment sector has been hit. 94 per cent of arts and recreation, and recreation businesses have been impacted. A huge 53 per cent of businesses have stopped operating entirely. 27 per cent of people in the arts and recreation sector have lost their jobs. Of the one million Australians who have lost their jobs during this time, a third of them have come from arts and recreation. I want to make this very, very clear. We are at a very real risk of losing an entire generation of Australian artists, creatives and institutions if we don't do something now to help them. This neglect is now taking a serious toll on the already underfunded sector. I could stand here for my entire 10-minute speech and just list the numbers of artists, performers, businesses who have completely been stripped of their livelihoods. Just today, the Woodford Folk Festival, Australia's biggest music and cultural festival, have shared their concerns that if the event doesn't go ahead this year, it may be gone for good. This festival alone contributes over $20 million to its local economy each and every year. That's a lot of jobs. That's a lot of economic stimulus in that area. There is an endless list of festivals and events that have been cancelled right across the country. The Byron Blues Festival, Dark Mofo in Tasmania. These cancellations affect so, affect so many, from the participating artists and the tech support, the crew, but it flows beyond that. It's the local tourism industry, the local hotels, the B&B owners, the restaurants the other tourism businesses in those areas. The entire community feels a loss when festivals like this have to cancel and close down. ABS data has shown that us that arts, recreation, accommodation and food, food services have suffered the most from COVID-19. 60 per cent 
of, this, of the jobs lost during COVID-19 thus far are in this sector. These industries exist in an ecosystem, and one cannot live without the other. Without a healthy arts and entertainment sector, tourism and hospitality just suffers and continues to suffer greatly. We now risk an entire organisations collapsing. Australian galleries, galleries have lost huge amounts of income, with regional galleries still reeling from the bushfires as well. This has been hit after hit after hit. Contemporary art space, Craig Works in Sydney, being forced into voluntary administration, made the headlines in recent weeks. The list of severely wounded organisations and businesses grows. The Sydney Symphony Orchestra is facing a $20 million hit to its revenue. That's a lot of jobs. After recently being knocked back for funding, the Restless Dance Theatre in Adelaide has now had to suffer through the stresses of COVID-19. Australia, uh, sorry, Adelaide's iconic live music venue, The Gov, is also on the brink today of calling in liquidators. The owner recently stated that they just can't survive in the coming months. These closures filter down to every artist, performer and employee. I was contacted earlier this week by an Adelaide woman whose husband works in the film industry in Adelaide and is out of work with no clear pathway. They have an 18-month-old child and the second kid on its way, but right now they have no idea how they are going to recover from this devastating blow. And they've got no help from the government programs already announced. Arts and entertainment contributes to $112 billion to our economy, yet they have been left in the cold and out to dry. We need to ensure that there is enough support for a smooth recovery and the opportunity for economic stimulus. Arts and entertainment is such a huge part of our lives. We need them. Arts and entertainment helps us to process what we're going through, to make sense of the world around us. We need our artists to be there at the end of this to help us heal. At the moment, they've been left out on the in the cold, left on their own, and there is no hope coming down from the government. We need them after this just as much as we've needed them during lockdown. This is exactly why we need a stimulus package, an economic stimulus package, for the arts and entertainment industry. Earlier this week, I announced a plan for a package to chart a pathway to recovery. The plan com comprises of three main elements. An artist in residence program, $300 million project that would see an artist in residence in every school and library across the country. This would be about investing in the value of the next generation of artists, as well as getting our artists and authors back to work. It would enable visual artists, authors, writers to engage their skills to help mentor Australia's young people and students. The project would be focused on job creation, community development, building an enhanced appreciation for our creative industries. The second element of this package is, a, is the Billion Stories Fund, a billion dollars put to an Australian content fund to kickstart Australia's screen industry. Productions are job-rich, from the creative, the script writers, IT, lighting, sound engineers, crews, costumes, tradespeople, marketing, logistics, the list goes on. Making sure we can tell our Australian stories when we get through this crisis, when we get to the end, is going to be essential. It's vital for our cultural identity, but it's important for education and local jobs. And finally, the third element that we need a stimulus package for is our live performance, Live Australia. A billion dollar grant fund would be needed to inject money into Australia's festival, music and live performance sector, which needs cash, cash flow right now to recover to restart. Investing in and creating incentives for the planning and delivery of events, live music and performance projects for both metropolitan, suburban and regional communities. These projects are job rich and provide the economic kickback that is so desperately needed for instant stimulus in the communities that they occur. This 
package would not only put artists and creatives back to work, but it would build on our cultural capital that is so at risk at the moment of falling over. We are going to need to restore our social fabric as we come out of this crisis. We need to create jobs for those who have been hardest hit, and we need to create hope for the Australian community with stories that reflect the Australian identity and show the values of really coming together. Senator McGrath. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. If we are to learn anything from COVID-19, it's that the country needs to get a lot more serious about paying down the national debt and growing the economy. Yesterday, the Treasurer outlined the significant blow the Australian economy is suffering from coronavirus. There's no doubt that important initiatives like JobKeeper are crucial to the national recovery and to ensuring our economy fares through the crisis in greater stead than the rest of the globe. However, now more than ever, the challenges we face and their effect on the bottom line should pose a necessary reminder to all of us of the importance of strong, of strong economic management and sensible fiscal expenditure. Despite the commendable efforts of consecutive Liberal national governments to return the budget back to surplus, the, the coronavirus stimulus spending through such initiatives have undoubtedly added years, if not decades, onto our debt repayments. And as the Treasurer said yesterday, there is no money tree. It is a shame that such hard work has driven economic growth to be obliterated in a few short months because of coronavirus. But it is times like these where the country benefits from a balanced budget, sound economic policy and low national debt. It equips us better to ride out the downturn and hardship during such uncertain times. A direct comparison lies with the miscalculated and reckless cash exodus of the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd governments orchestrated by then-Treasurer Wayne Swan. It's more disappointing to see Labor already spruiking their socialist playbook to increase hard-working Australians' taxes and hobble the national economy in the process. It's this exact approach that created the debt in the first place. Fortunately, the Morrison-McCormack government know that we cannot tax our way to prosperity, but rather our recovery relies on economic growth through driving business investment and job creation. Pulling out of the storm that is COVID-19 will be difficult, but it's not impossible. Now more than ever, we need to focus on practical and sensible solutions that reflect classical coalition principles to grow the economy, invest in infrastructure and upskill our workforce. Cutting taxes, in addition to cutting red tape, is the best way to grow the economy and to help pubs, clubs and restaurants recover through this process, I support calls to temporarily, at least, scrap the FBT on, on hospitality to help them get through this storm. But today I am talking about cutting the inefficient, ineffective and burdensome red tape that is holding back thousands of Australian businesses. Upon being elected, our government has been able to consistently reduce the annual net cost of complying with regulatory reform. However, to ensure we lower regulatory burdens on Australian businesses, we must focus on cutting the larger and deep-rooted regulation. To do so, we must be wary of presuming that all regulations have similar, similar regulatory burdens and recognise the evolving nature of government and that the continuing changes in markets, technologies, preferences and attitudes can undermine the effectiveness of previous reforms. In other words, we must be cautious not just to tackle the low-hanging fruit. That's why I'm calling for regulatory reform to be put back at top of the agenda and proposing accountability measures to ensure it remains a, considering, a, a continuing consideration for the whole of government. I'm going to write to every minister recommending that the coalition government establish a government and departmental-wide audit of all regulatory impacts to not only identify existing and new regulatory burdens, but to assess their effect. In doing so, I'm proposing that the whole of government should adopt a stewardship approach to cutting red tape, where all ministers and departmental secretaries are tasked with reducing the number of regulatory impacts. 
This approach would see each minister being directly responsible for the process of monitoring, reviewing and the cutting of regulation, and require the minister to update the parliament every six months. And before the scaremongering chorus starts, I'll state this plainly. Less regulation does not mean fewer protections or worse outcomes. It simply means government cannot be so rigid as to assume that regulation is always the best way to achieve these outcomes or ensure those protections. If there is a simpler, faster or easier way for business to achieve the same desired result, we must be prepared to embrace it and allow industry the flexibility to adapt to changing circumstances or take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And while we are thankfully ahead of the curve on the health front, we must now also position our economy to take full advantage of our first mover status and offer every opportunity to get Australia and Australians back to work. Madam Acting Deputy President, at a time when we are facing and considering the threats and opportunities that are impacting upon our great southern land, I want to raise in the Senate a man who saw the potential of Australia, James Cook. Cook was not just an explorer. His curiosity knew no bounds and his ability as a navigator and leader of men knew no equal. He is one of the greats. And while Match has recently been spoken and acknowledged on, on the anniversary of his arrival in Botany Bay 250 years ago, Cook's voyage along the east coast of Australia resulted in the naming of many great natural landmarks as we know them today. One of the significant areas is located not far from my Nambour office in the hinterland of the Sunshine Coast, the Glasshouse Mountains. The Glasshouse Mountains were named by Lieutenant James Cook in 1770. Cook noted in his journal on Thursday, 17th of May, 1770, almost 250 years to the day, and I quote, "'These hills lay but a little way inland and not far from each other. They are very remarkable on account of their singular form of elevation, which very much resemble glass houses, which occasioned my giving them that name. The glass houses referred to by Cook were the glass-making foundries in Yorkshire, England, which reminded him of a of a familiar landscape. Both the natural and natural significance of these incredible mountains has been recognised in various ways since. On August 3, 2006, then Prime Minister John Howard visited the mountains and announced the Glasshouse Mountains were of, nat were of national significance. Prime Minister Howard named them as the 32nd entry on the National Heritage List, joining important Australian sites such as the Sydney Opera House. And when we can start freely moving around our great country again, I, along with Andrew Powell, the LNP member for Glasshouse, and Stuart Coward, the LNP candidate for Caloundra, along with Terry Young and Andrew Wallace, the local federal MPs, encourage those who have not already done so to take the opportunity to discover the beauty and appreciate the historical significance of the Glasshouse Mountains. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak today uh, in relation to some issues around COVID-19, and I know that many of us have been inundated with um, emails, requests, phone calls, etc., from many of our constituents. But today, I want to just read into Hansard some uh, extracts of emails from some travel agents in my part of Braddon on the northwest coast of Tassie. One is a very well-respected couple who have been in the industry for uh, over 36 years. And these are their words that I want to share with the chamber today because um, I think it spells out certainly some of the um, anomalies in uh, some of the assistance that's been provided um, by the government. So they went on to say, we've weathered the storms before, some large, like the pilot strike, SARS, Gulf War, MERS, the ANSEC collapse, terrorism and the like, but nothing like COVID-19, as it's so global and the shutdown complete. As a partnership, she says, the government is doing nothing to allow us to still operate and earn what we are both entitled to as long-standing taxpayers. When the stimulus was first announced, like so many, it took days to get a Centrelink CRN. She said then we'd never had been in the system. This was to seek JobSeeker. 
Why, she said, we have no income. We work every day with more of the same, cancelling, deferring. We live off the suppliers and the airlines commission. When it's cancelled, it's given back, or it should be, which means a lot of what we've earned from last July financial year will also be given back. From around February the 8th, we are over 95 per cent down on the previous year and have had no income, and this will go on through the year until all of the 2020 and early 2021 are sorted by the travel providers. Then came job relief. A job keeper, she said, what a relief. Until we were advised as a partnership, only one of us was entitled. So back we go to Centrelink, who was very quickly, I must say, rang Murray, first comment to Murray, oh, you were too old, you have to apply for a pension, and Robin, the job keeper. So to Centrelink to apply for a pension. Over four hours online for questions that are meaningless when you have assets and really don't want a pension, and a big envelope posted off to Canberra, and to this day, no comment, no acknowledgement, nothing. Then she goes on to say, speaking with our accountant a few weeks ago, he said that there was no age limit on JobKeeper. So back to the ATO site, and instead of me, register Murray for JobKeeper, and I had to go to Centrelink to register for JobSeeker. More fun and games, with two choices of answers. Are you unemployed? No, as I work most days with the travel mess for around seven hours, about 35 hours a week, Without pay, then the next question, has your business been impacted by COVID? Yes, it's travel. Then the fun and games begin. All the financials of the business, not much sense showing our working account business account, as it's clients' monies, not ours. As quick as the supplier pays back our client's fund, we pay it out, gross, not net. Our industry is left behind. Nowhere in the paperwork is there an area to say what we have earned from last July is now being refunded. We earn commission paid by suppliers, no one to speak to, the phone drops out or call back later. We are busy day after day. Our industry needs support. A cafe has been able to sell takeaways and will soon reopen to diners. Large re retailers had a few weeks of closure and then it will be business as usual. Other industries will bounce back and earn money from when they can open their doors. We won't have business as usual until our borders across Australia and New Zealand bubble opens and the ban on international travel is lifted, which may well hinge on a COVID-19 vaccination, like the current proof of yellow fever and other considerations like rapid COVID-19 temperature checks, no quarantine periods after travel. We want people to recognise that we have no attention as all the talk is about how badly tourism or hotels or restaurants are doing. They have at least been able to keep their earnings from the beginning of this financial year. This should not be hard, but no one is listening because no one can listen. It's all about online, send forms, not much gratitude to a couple who have worked tirelessly in their local environment and have paid taxes respectively for 60 and 45 years, with no burden on the Australian tax system. But now there is no salary for either of us. Locally, we were able to receive the Tasmanian government stimulus $2,500 and we've applied for the business hardship grant of $15,000. That is great if we are accepted. It would pay business expenses to keep, and to keep us going until better times. I received another email. I've had quite a few, but I've picked out a couple. The next person who wrote to me said, my business has been taking a turn for the worse for the best part of 10 weeks. The travel industry has been, has been hit the hardest ever since travel cancellations started to happen on our China bookings back in February. Being a sole trader, I do not receive a set wage. I only earn a salary from my commission. Therefore, since the government travel ban 
and global borders closed, this in turn has ceased any forward bookings for my small business and resulting in nil commission. My workload has not decreased. I'm currently working around the clock for my clients for no salary to cancel their upcoming reservations or to amend them. Not only has my business had a 100 per cent downturn, I'm also having to pay back previous money earned, my income, on these client files which I've worked or are working on for so hard. Like so many other businesses, we've all been hit and I understand that we're all under extreme pressure. But I just wanted to reach out and say that travel agents, sole traders especially, are different in the fact that we haven't just lost our job and wages, but we're still working for no wage and having to refund the monies that we previously earned. I'm also unable to apply for another job as I'm still working for my clients who are cancelling, and I doubt many businesses are having to do this. I have had to reduce my home loan payments, suspend my private health payments, suspend my car loan payments and adjusted my PAYG tax instalments and a whole range of other things that I've had to manage so that I can actually manage through the next eight to 12 months. Because I'm being very realistic, cafes, beauty salons, restaurants, etc., will all start to open back up over the coming weeks. But there is no way that I can see myself starting to book international travel until the end of 2020 or even perhaps the start or later of 2021. I have also been successful in receiving the $2,500 small business grant from the Tasmanian government, which I'm extremely grateful for, and I have applied for the JobKeeper's payment. I have everything crossed that I will be eligible for this payment. It's the only thing keeping me going at this stage, knowing that this might be possible. I feel that I just needed to speak out on behalf of travel agents in Tasmania, as we really don't have a loud voice when it comes to things like this. So many other job titles are being mentioned in this current COVID-19 crisis, but I haven't heard anyone mention the extremely hardworking and soon to be broke travel agent. So those are the, the, some of the words out of at least two emails that I've received from, as I said, travel agents in my neck of the woods in uh, Tasmania. These people have been in business. I'm sure all over the country there are many, many more of these. And I would ask that the government have a look at these issues, at least help these people, um, because they are affected much, much greater than many other businesses. This is a difficult time for everyone, but these businesses in particular do not see a light at the end of the tunnel until, as they said in their own words, and they know their business, until the end of 2020 or likely well into the first quarter of 2021. Thank you. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Acting um, Madam Deputy President. Um, I, uh, I am getting the same as what Senator Urquhart is about the travel agents, especially the ones in Tasmania, and it is dreadful and the stories are horrific. So I too please ask the government to have a look at this. These guys deserve a lot better. They've worked their whole careers and their whole lives to build up where they are today and to have it all taken off, which has got nothing to do with them. So please, if the government could have a look at that. Now, where I'm from on the northwest coast of Tasmania, we've seen the worst of the COVID-19. As a matter of fact, we were the epicentre. But we're also starting to turn a corner, which is great. That's come at a huge cost, and that's clear. Businesses have had to shut. People have had to go without pay. We've had a huge dent in our economy, and we've still seen people becoming seriously ill and even dying. But we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and what's been a pretty dark tunnel at that. We're not home and hosed yet. So don't Tasmanians become complacent. You can't just ignore social distancing requirements because things are starting to improve. You can't go out and socialise the way we used to do. You can't travel wherever you want to or visit whoever you want, whenever you want. We can't start sliding back to where we were. That goes not just for our health, but also for our economy. 
I don't want to nitpick either. All up, we've spent a huge amount of money and it's been done to give people a safety net. And of course, some have still been missed from that safety net. But it has been a huge amount of money. And it's not just what we've spent, it's also what we've not received in tax. As businesses have shut their doors and closed their trade, you don't trade, you don't earn an income, no income, no tax, back to the economy. So it's really important we turn our minds now on how to climb out of this huge economic hole we've all been thrown into. Just as different regions and different states have had totally different experiences of COVID-19, there's going to be local paths to economy recovery. One size fits all isn't going to cut it, certainly not for this. On the northwest coast of Tasmania, we all know the wind farms at Woolnerth and now Granville Harbour on the northwest coast. The idea of generating clean energy from spinning turbines that helps light homes through electricity grids is well understood. But that's small fry stuff compared to what's possible these days. Tasmania has this huge potential to generate clean hydrogen. It takes energy to split a water particle into its hydrogen and one oxygen atom. That energy comes from either coal, gas or renewables. Clean hydrogen comes from renewable sources and it's being used to produce a renewable battery. Hydrogen has the potential to store and move energy to places without access to the grid. Hydrogen fuel cells can one day replace diesel in farm machinery. Tasmania can be a new kind of energy exporter. Earning income for Tasmania's overseas markets climb over each other for what we can produce better than just about anyone else. A study released by Hydro Tasmania last year found that Tasmania can produce hydrogen at about 15 per cent cheaper than anywhere else in the world. And the West Coast is an ideal area within the state to take up this opportunity. We can do it cheaper, we can do it cleaner, we can do it better, and I'll tell you now, we can do it right now. Hydrogen is also a huge job creator. We've already seen the positive economic impact of the Granville Harbour wind farm on towns such as Burnie, my own, and Zeehan. Hydrogen is like, well, let's put it this way, it's like it's on steroids. It's got the potential to create a new en engine of economic growth that attracts skilled jobs, investment and the chance to revitalise West Coast towns. When has there been a better time to get this off the ground? We have a world-class wind resource, abundant of water and the space to create an industry that, that poorly managed can deliver economic gains without the environmental impacts of mining. We can avoid the problems of the past by carefully selecting areas where we can build wind farms that have minimal environmental and social impact and where we can realistically reconcile the environment and, of course, the economy. The state government recognises the potential of the sector and good on them for the doing that. They've released the Tasmanian Renewable Hydrogen Action Plan and that's a damn good start for Tasmania. What I'm advocating for now is for the rubber to hit the road. Put the metal to the pedal, as I say. The COVID-19 crisis and the need to kickstart our economic activity presents an ideal opportunity for government to support projects that can deliver much and generate economic transition as well as recovery. There are thousands of jobs for Tasmanians available here, close to only 5,000 actually, if we seize the moment with both our hands. The economy we snap back, back to won't, won't be anything like the economy left in March this year, we'll be honest about that. But if we can return to something similar, we'll be doing okay. I want us to get back to having schools open tourism operating, cafes open for a sit-down lunch, cinemas running again. I want Tasmanian's racing industry, which supports over 5,000 jobs around the state, back doing what it does best. It's just got to be done in a way that's safe. It's not worth letting people die just so we can go to the movies sooner rather than later. It is not worth it. And it's got to be done in a way that's smart. We can be choosy about which bits of the economy of old we return to, and which parts we choose to leave behind. For me, reshaping the economy means backing the businesses, the industries and the technologies that have the ability to transform how we do what we do best. Hydrogen is such a big opportunity for Australia, and especially in Tasmania, it is huge. 
Like I said, we can do it cheaper. We can do it at a scale. We're set for success. The question is whether we jump at it or we let someone else jump first. Backing homegrown technologies and industries is a recipe for success. It's a way to grow the economy and keep it growing in good times and in the bad. But we're making it so hard for people to buy Australian made. We've got labels that say something is Australian made, a product of Australia, Australian grown or just Australian. They all mean different things and they're all used, and they're all used in different contexts. But you ask someone on the street what they're buying when they buy something with a slogan on it, they will tell you they're buying something that was produced in this country, in Australia. And that's not always right. It's legal for someone to claim their product is made in Australia so long as half the total cost of producing the product was spent in Australia. And that's terribly misleading. You, can get, you get to count shipping as part of the cost of producing too. So if you're buying something from overseas, you're able to claim, claim you made it here and sell it to the consumers. As long as you change the product a little and you spend enough money shipping it to you. We ask people to do the right thing and buy Australian whenever they can. But part of that is on all of us here in Parliament to make it easy for people to do that with confidence. Why aren't all the products required to label their country of origin? Why don't we require every product to say where it's from? Some say that we should leave it up to all consumers. That's if they care about the country a product is made. They'll buy products that choose to include a label about its country of origin. The ones that don't include the label won't get sold and the market will take, 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 off, take it off us. But if we don't have enough products, including that label, consumers can't compare products reliably. Consumers who find only 10 per cent of the products they're comparing have a label are going to stop checking for it. That undercuts the value of the Australian made logo. That's got to change. You want, you want, to, take, you want, to, you want to take back Australia's to make Australian products again? Make it easier for consumers to back them too. The law has to change because it's too complicated. It's too easy to gain. It's too easy to rip off customers who are trying to help the little guy and do the right thing and buy Australian made. It's time to change the law to put control back in the hands of the shopper instead of the seller. Let's make it easier. Let's do the right thing. Let's do the Australian thing. Australia is going to be a very different country as a result of COVID-19, and the world is going to be a very different place. COVID-19 has shown us that we're vulnerable, extremely vulnerable. We are critically vulnerable. We are relying on other countries to sell us medical equipment that's needed here. And if we're going to retake our economic sovereignty, retake the wheel of our economic destiny, then we need to plan how we're going to do that in the future. Back the industries that give us the edge to maintain our fuel security, our national security, our economic security, our food security. Back consumers with the tools that they need to buy local. Back Australians to back Australia. Let's get on with it. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise this afternoon to recognise several special occasions, many of them impacted by the coronavirus pandemic, and to pay tribute to the organisations that have, in difficult circumstances, continued to ensure that these events have remained meaningful to their communities and to guests like myself. I'd like to begin, of course, with the Anzac Day Dawn services and marches, which were cancelled across Western Australia, indeed across the whole country, this year. On the 25th of April, we honoured our Anzac heroes very differently as balconies, driveways and social media became the new platforms where we showed, as a grateful nation, our gratitude for the sacrifices of our many servicemen and women. 2020 represented significant anniversaries for both the Gallipoli landing and the end of World War II, so I was delighted many West Australians could participate in the Anzac Day driveway dawn service and send a strong message of support to our veterans and to the Australian Defence Force community. It was an honour to pay my respects and privately lay wreaths prior to Anzac Day with the Jewish Community Council of Western Australia President Joan Hillman at the Jewish War Memorial at, Mount, uh, at Kings Park. In addition, I was able to join with the Mount Lawley Inglewood RSL, Vice President Oliver Lavelle, JP, at the Mount Lawley Cenotaph and Wanneroo RSL Vice President Peter Tuck 
at the Wanneroo Memorial Park. I was grateful to be able to pay my respects as a senator for Western Australia, not just for myself and my family, but on behalf of the whole community. I'd also like to recognise the deserving recipients of RSLWA Life Membership and 50-year certificates in the RSL State Congress Awards that were also announced and celebrated on Anzac Day. Of the West Australians honoured for their devoted service, I'm particularly pleased to congratulate and to honour Oliver Lovell, the Highgate sub-branch past president Stephen Chamaret and Jeff Simpson OAM, also of the Highgate sub-branch, of which I'm proud to be an affiliate member. My congratulations go also to the recipient of the prestigious Anzac of the Year Award, retired Army Lance Corporal David Scott, for his exceptional contribution to RSL Australia, WA veterans and the broader community. Finally, I wish to acknowledge a number of West Australians that have been recognised in the 2020 Australian Bravery, De uh, Bravery Decorations that were honoured in March. David O'Dowd, BM of Cocos Keeling Islands, received the Bravery Medal for the courage he showed in rescuing two people from a surf rip off the islands. Simon Wern of Kalgoorlie was bestowed with a commendation for brave conduct for his valiant deeds during the rescue of a disabled man from a house fire in Albion, Queensland. Robert Brown of Ashfield, Dennis Collinson of Oakford, Edward Trindle of Bullsbrook and the late William Matston of Bassendean all received a group bravery citation for their conduct during the capture of a violent offender near Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia's far north. The WA Korean and Vietnamese communities also commem commemorated war milestones recently. The Korean War Veterans Association Western Australia marked the 69th anniversary of the Battle of Kapyong, or Kapyong Day, which honours the sacrifice of United Nations personnel, including Australians, in the defence of South Korea. I recognise the work of the Korean War Veterans Association in Western Australia under President Jinkle Ling Lee for improving knowledge of the battle and what is sometimes referred to as the Forgotten War. It was a privilege to join the Vietnamese community in Western Australia with President Ung Nguyen and many others to remember the 45th anniversary of Black April at Tudok Park, Tudok Park and the Kundula Peace Park on the 30th of April. Black April marks the capture of Saigon and ultimately South Vietnam in 1975. It's an occasion such as Black April that we also acknowledge with the great determination and resilience of the Vietnamese community in Western Australia and indeed across our whole country. Easter 2020 was also unlike any we've experienced before, but it was still a special time for WA's Christian and Orthodox communities and I was delighted to pass on my special blessings on these important spiritual occasions. A number of churches across Perth's northern suburbs streamed Easter services online, which was embraced by many parishioners, and it was heartening to see outreach services, guidance and prayers still being provided at a time when they are most needed. March and April saw some equally sacred events for Perth's Jewish, Sikh, Nepalese, Iranian and Indian communities. Yom HaShoah, or Holocaust Remembrance Day, is the commemoration of the murder of six million Jews in the Holocaust. In previous years, I would have met and joined with many others in Western Australia's Jewish community to observe this most solemn of events. But instead, I was able to participate in a digital commemoration on the 20th of April. I was reminded at the time of this moving tribute of the comments made by Nobel laureate Ali Weisel. We must always take sides Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And might I just add also uh, my uh, deepest thanks uh, for the remarks made by Robo Rabbi Solomon uh, in that very, very sombre uh, commemoration uh, and his very, very enlightening uh, insights into the importance of the event. Like Easter, the feast of the Passover Passover from the 8th to the 16th of April was affected by COVID-19. Synagogue services were suspended and our Jewish community across Western Australia was unable to mark the occasion as they traditionally would have. However, I was pleased to extend a very special message of support from our Prime Minister Scott Morrison and convey my personal good wishes to all in the Jewish Community Council of Western Australia. Despite the absence of usual parades, banquets, reunions and religious ceremonies, I was delighted to wish 
the Nepalese Association of Western Australia's President Mani Paneru, the Honorary Consul of Nepal Fred Brown and others in Perth's Nepalese community a very happy, peaceful and prosperous Nepal Sambat or Nepali New Year on 13 April. Due to the suspension of religious services at the Gurdwaras, the Sikh Gurdwara Perth Vaisakhi celebration or Sikh New Year, also on 13 April, was streamed via Facebook. This was another occasion when I could share a well-received message from the Prime Minister to Perth's Sikh community, as well as extend my own very happy Vasaki wishes to Sikh, Sikh Gurdwara Perth President Natevj Kar Upal. Sadly for the Iranian community of Western Australia, it had to cancel the Persian Festival of Fire or the Eid Narus celebration in March. Fortunately, I was still able to pass on my best wishes and the best wishes of others to the President Matiza Tabultapi. I finish with perhaps the most vibrant event of all, which fortunately did go ahead this year. That, of course, being Holi, or the Festival of Colours, was marked by the scattering of coloured powder, or gulal, at the Indian Society of Western Australia's Holi 2020 celebration at Langley Park. My thanks go to outstanding ISWA President uh, Surya Umbati for sharing the joy of Holly and the wider West Australian community. These events and the WA community's determination to observe these special days of both joy and sadness in spite of the pandemic have been nothing short of inspirational and go to demonstrate the vitality but also the versatility of Western Australia's many ethnic communities. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It is with deep sadness that I stand in the Australian Senate today to place on the record my condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of leading Senior Constable Lynette Taylor, Senior Constable Kevin King. Constable Glenn Humphreys and Constable John Presney. These four Victorian police officers lost their lives in the line of duty on Wednesday, the 22nd of April, in what can only be described as a shocking road accident on the Eastern Freeway in Melbourne. Buildings and monuments right across Australia, and in particular my home state, Victoria, have been lit up with blue, and fellow police and emergency services personnel have held their silence. A state memorial will be held when the coronavirus measures are gradually lifted. I'm grateful to have the opportunity today to recognise these four fine police officers who have been taken from us far too soon. Leading Senior Constable Taylor was a credit to the uniform she proudly wore every single day. She faithfully served the people of Victoria for 31 years and was recognised for her work with the National Medal the National Police Service Medal and the Victoria Police Service Medal. Colleagues describe Lynette as funny, always smiling, constantly looking out for others when they needed her and needed her advice. She had a sense of adventure and was looking forward to building a coastal home with her partner so they could get away for some quiet time fishing every now and then. Senior Constable Kevin King brought great compassion to his role. The kind of police officer who, having booked an elderly woman for drink driving, would then escort her home, making sure that she was safe and sound, despite the circumstances in which the two of them had met. Friends and colleagues have recalled Kevin as having the kind of good judgement 
to know that being a traffic cop is more than just issuing infringement tickets. Constable Glenn Humphreys graduated recently from the Police Academy. Glenn was honoured by his colleagues of Victoria Police and that of the New South Wales Police Force, who took to the side of the road and stood in salute as the vehicle carrying him home was transported from Melbourne all the way up north to Newcastle. This tribute was simply his fellow police officers offering a very simple but deeply profound mark of respect. Constable Josh Presney was 28 years old. A Collingwood supporter, like me, he just came out of the police training. And on his first assignment with the Nutterwadding Highway Patrol. Eager to, to fulfil his oath to keep and preserve the peace. His father described him as a hero, and that Josh certainly is. As they all are. Anyone who takes up the mantle of blue to protect our community from harm is worthy of the Parliament's admiration. As we remember these four fine police officers, I also wish to recognise the thousands of police officers who continue to serve not just the people of Victoria but every other jurisdiction in our great Commonwealth, including those of the Federal Police. Have a good question time. Our community has always been aware of the role that the police and emergency services play, and I should also add the parliamentary security that protects the very politicians in this place as well, and the sacrifices that they make in making sure that our freedoms are protected. But the events of the 22nd of April have brought that into stark focus for all of us. Still to this day, it is just shocking to look at the front pages of newspapers, to see the carnage that unfolded, and to think that could have been one of my relatives who was serving that day as a member of the Victorian Police. So I want to thank you for this work, despite the risks to help us keep a safe and peaceful place to live. To the families of the four police officers, there are a few things that I or anyone else in this place can say that will fill the void left in your lives. But know that they will never be forgotten. Know that all Victorians, now and forever, will remember the bravery each have given so that we can be safe and that our gratitude for this will have no end. Later today, the Senate will have a motion before it, which I am very pleased to move and also have the support of my Victorian senators. And I wanted to say thank you to each and every one of them. It acknowledges the loss of the four Victorian police officers who were killed in line of duty. It expresses its condolences to the family, friends and colleagues. It offers the support that all police and emergency services deserve and also to the members of the public that rendered assistance when all the carnage unfolded on the 22nd of April. And finally, extending its gratitude to all current serving officers and emergency service personnel. The Australian Parliament agrees with you 
and we are thinking of you. And I just want to thank everyone for their support later this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Sarah Ciccone. If any other senator would like to take advantage of the minute we have before question time, otherwise we will just have a lull in proceedings. I can think of a number of former senators that would not let a minute of the Senate's time go past without, adopt, without, without utilising it. Twelve seconds. It being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Senator Birmingham. In recent days, China has restricted red meat exports from four of Australia's largest abattoirs and signalled that Australian barley exports may face a tariff of up to 80 per cent. Has the minister yet been able to secure a conversation with his counterpart in China regarding these issues? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, as I've uh, said publicly, we have requested dialogue, and I have requested dialogue and discussions with my counterpart. Uh, we have not uh, secured said meeting as yet. Uh, I would hope that that would be forthcoming. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the government is pursuing all possible avenues in support uh, of assisting our barley producers and our beef producers uh, in relation to maintaining their market access uh, to China. Uh, China has uh, made clear, both publicly and privately, uh, that uh, these are uh, technical matters of trade dispute that uh, date back uh, variously some 12 to 18 months in terms of issues with those uh, particular businesses uh, or sectors. To take Senator Watt's question and, uh, and the interjections there, uh, happy to say in relation to Bali that it's an 18-month process, an anti-dumping investigation uh, that has always had a deadline of May the 19th uh, in terms of determination of that. Uh, so why now? Uh, well, if you actually followed the process, you would understand very clearly uh, that it was instigated some time ago. Uh, the deadline that is there is one that has been in place. Uh, we are working with the Australian barley industry to make sure we put uh, a response in. Uh, to the draft determination that is as compelling as possible, uh, that is based on the economic evidence that Australia's barley producers, like all of our grain growers, uh, are some of the most productive and efficient in the world. Uh, they do not receive uh, trade distorting or market distorting subsidies. They do not dump product below production cost on global markets anywhere in the world. Uh, they simply produce at great volume when the climate allows, uh, at high quality and with efficient prices and competitive prices because of their skill and expertise. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. The Dinmore Meatworks in Ipswich in Queensland is the largest beef processing plant in the Southern Hemisphere. The plant is one of the region's largest employers, with more than 2,000 local workers relying on it for their livelihoods. Can the minister assure the Senate and workers at facilities like Dinmore that the government is dedicated to this issue, the level of attention and resources it demands. Senator Birmingham. <coughs> Mr. President, uh, yes, uh, I can assure those workers. So, in relation to the four abattoirs who have had their permits to uh, export to China suspended, uh, those suspensions have been as a result, uh, according to Chinese authorities, uh, of irregularities or discrepancies in relation to labelling standards or the like uh, against customs and quarantine matters. Uh, we are now working intensively uh, with those uh, processes 
uh, to make sure that the evidence is provided back as to how they have rectified uh, any of those discrepancies and how they have put in place effective processes and procedures uh, to make sure that they are not repeated uh, again in the future. Uh, I would note that uh, in 2017 uh, there were around uh, six uh, meatworks uh, that faced a similar uh, process as a result of actions by Chinese authorities. Uh, those issues took some time to rectify, but rectified they were, and we will work as quickly and expeditiously as we can to see these are rectified Order. as well. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, what is the government doing to assist Australian exporters impacted by recent trade restrictions announced by China and protect the thousands of jobs currently at risk at places like Dinmore Meatworks in Ipswich? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Obviously, uh, just in relation to uh, our barley industry and those, uh, those four uh, meat processes have outlined the types of steps that we're taking with those sectors to be able to respond to Chinese authorities uh, in a thoughtful way uh, based on the evidence uh, that demonstrates that, as I say, Australia's barley producers uh, operate in the most competitive of ways uh, and in no way are subsidised uh, by government uh, to dump product into other markets. In the case of our meat producers, they produce high-quality, high-value product. Uh, they, of course, need to abide by the customs and quarantine requirements of any market to which they export. Uh, and where there have been any discrepancies there, we want to make sure uh, to uphold the standards and reputation of all of Australia's meat industry uh, that they have policies and procedures in place uh, to be able to meet the standards and expectations of the markets to which they export. More generally, as I've told the Senate many times, we continue to open new market access opportunities uh, for many businesses, such as the ones with Order. Indonesia Senator that will come Birmingham. into effect on July 5. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on the impact the coronavirus pandemic has had on Australians and their mental health, and why it's important to ensure support is available to protect the lives and livelihoods of Australians? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And the Senate will be aware that earlier today the Minister for Health addressed the Parliament uh, and gave an update on Australia's response to the COVID-19 situation. As at 6.30 a.m. today, Australia has 6,970 confirmed cases of COVID-19. More than 6,257 of them have fully recovered. 15 people are in intensive care and 13 people are on ventilators. Sadly, there has been a total of 98 deaths from the virus. The rate of increase in new cases has gone from 25 to 30 per cent per day at the peak of growth in cases at the end of March to less than half a per cent a day now. The rate of increase has been below 0.5 per cent for 23 consecutive days. Globally, more than 4 million cases have been confirmed, with more than 290,000 deaths. This puts the threat we face in the clearest context. As the minister has stated, we need to be clear our work is not finished and the virus is not defeated. There is still a long way to go and uh, we have a long road to travel to protect our national health. Last week we saw a very powerful piece of work from Pat McGorry and Ian Hickey in the University of Sydney, highlighting the extent to which Australians' mental health is at risk in a major economic downturn. We know that supporting Australians to get back to work is critical for both their economic security and their aspirations, but also to help with their mental health. These factors are intrinsically linked. This is a deeply human reminder of the importance of assisting people to get back to work. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. What additional measures has the Morrison government put in place to support Australians with their mental health during this difficult time? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government's $74 million mental health support package will make sure that Australians have access to the right services and the right support wherever they are around the country. The expanded telehealth program is playing a critical role in providing mental health care and support during the pandemic. About half of all mental health Medicare subsidised services are currently provided by telehealth, as well as a significant proportion of general consultations 
under the $669 million program. We have implemented a new free of charge 24-7 Beyond Blue support service, which is available via phone or online. We have also established a dedicated program for our heroic frontline health workers, led by the Black Dog Institute, to keep this essential workforce well. Supporting the mental health of Australians during this pandemic is a priority of Order. the Morrison Senator government. Cash. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How do these measures build upon the government's previous investment to protect Australians' mental and physical health? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. And uh, the Minister for Health today announced the new position of Deputy Chief Officer, Medical Officer for Mental Health. Leading psychiatrist Dr Ruth Vine has been appointed, and we extend our congratulations to her, as a Deputy Chief Medical Officer with expertise in mental health. Just as the government is modelling the spread of COVID-19 infection to continue flattening the curve, we are also closely monitoring mental health service usage so that we can respond quickly and thus lessen the mental health impacts of the pandemic and the recovery phase. As a next step, a national mental health pandemic response plan will this week be discussed with states and territories through the National Cabinet. The plan has been prepared with the support of the National Mental Health Commission in consultation with states and territories and key stakeholders. Again, the mental health and wellbeing of Australians Order. is a Senator priority. Cash. Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Darcy Moran from Victoria has been a hospitality worker for 15 years and has never been unemployed during that time. Yet, like 46 per cent of casuals in that sector, Darcy has been with his current employer for less than 12 months, making him ineligible for JobKeeper. Does the minister think it is fair to exclude Darcy and workers like him from the program? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. What we think would be fair to Darcy uh, is uh, if uh, the uh, state government in Victoria started easing restrictions uh, so that businesses in Victoria, so that businesses in Victoria could employ, uh, could employ people like Darcy, could give people like Darcy Order. a job. That is, that is what we think would be fair. That is what we, that Order. is what we think would be fair. And that is, that is point number one. That is, that is point number one. You've asked me what would be fair. We, we want to see businesses around Australia to start getting back into business so they can hire more Australians again, uh, including, including people like Darcy. Now, uh, in, relation, in relation to the JobKeeper program, which uh, provides support then to more than 5.5 million working Australians, more than 5.5 million working Australians, uh, the eligibility Order. criteria are very clear. The list. program is designed to keep uh, employees connected to the employer where that is possible, uh, to keep connected, to keep uh, employees connected. Uh, and uh, in relation to casuals, that means that means that means in relation to casuals, that relates to long-term casuals, where there is an established relationship with the employer. And in fact, it is based on the definition in the Fair Work Act. Uh, it is the Fair Work Act that, des that describes uh, a long-term casual as somebody who has been with the same employer for uh, 12 months, for at least 12 months, and that is, of course, uh, what we are using. And, and it is, of course, not uh, right to say that there is no support available uh, to Darcy. I don't, I don't know uh, the specific circumstances, but uh, you know, for those who find themselves, uh, unfortunately, out of a job in the current circumstances, the appropriate job seeker uh, support arrangements are in place, supplemented by the COVID supplement, which effectively doubles the job uh, seeker uh, job seeker payment, and, and, and that is that is of course uh, the appropriate way the appropriate way for us to provide an enhanced social safety net in the circumstances. But it is it is it is of course now time. Order, Senator uh, Cormann. Um, Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Thank you. ABS figures released last week showed that hospitality has been one of the hardest hit sectors in this crisis, with more than a third of jobs lost. With 78 per cent of hospitality workers casual, does the minister agree that the workers who are hardest hit by this crisis have the least access to JobKeeper? Senator Cormann. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I certainly agree that the hospitality sector is one of the sectors that has been hardest hit, and it's also a sector that can uh, recover very quickly once the uh, restrictions are eased. And uh, indeed, it is, there is an opportunity now for restrictions to be eased, for uh, the hospitality sector to start increasing its activity again, uh, so, that they, so that they can start employing more Australians and, and you know we think that that is that is something that we would like to see happen certainly over the phased appropriately over the next uh, few weeks and months and all of these announcements have been Order. made now now and the truth of course is that there are appropriate supports in place for workers in that circumstance who have lost their job the job seeker uh, payments have been effectively doubled uh, through the COVID uh, supplement which is in place uh, for uh, the uh, six months period Senator Walsh, final supplementary question. Thank you. Up to a million workers who contribute to industries like hospitality, health, education and caregiving will miss out on JobKeeper, lose their job and their connection to their workplace. These workers have been there for Australians, including during this crisis. Why is the government not there for them now? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, you know, every job seeker who is unable to find a job, as, you know, as long as you know, and we've, of course, eased all of the um, eligibility. We've waived waiting periods. We've, uh, um, we've uh, waived various uh, tests that are required to be met. And, and you know, we've also made adjustments to the partner income and the like. And so we've made it easier for people to access uh, job seeker if they're out of work. We've uh, doubled, effectively doubled uh, the job seeker uh, payment uh, to help Australians who've lost their job through this period. Uh, in relation to JobKeeper, as I've indicated, and I think we've gone around and around uh, this issue for some time now, but this is about keeping uh, workers with an established connection uh, to an employer, connected uh, to their employer, uh, and, uh, and indeed that is, uh, that is what this program is there for. And as far as casuals are concerned, and we have included uh, casuals, but we have uh, included long-term casuals uh, who have worked for the same employer for more than 12 months. That is an appropriate uh, test. It's a test that is uh, reflected in the Fair Work Act uh, Order, already, Senator Cormann, and that is, of course, why we The answer has expired. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Last week, the Treasurer announced a six-month delay for legislation associated with the 76 recommendations from the Hain Banking Royal Commission. These recommendations would underpin the biggest sector reform to financial services and our financial system in decades many of which will be crucial to Australians in the difficult economic times ahead. The sector has had over 15 months to prepare for this reform, but still have recently been on public record calling for legislative delays due to this pandemic. Minister, why have you succumbed to lobbying pressure from the big banks and delayed this much-needed critical reform? And what's to stop big business putting up other reasons in the future that this is not a convenient time for them for legislative reform. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Um, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't think that any reasonable Australian would uh, argue with the proposition that, given the circumstances, given the extent of the crisis, given uh, the need to ensure that our banks and our financial system uh, can focus 100% uh, on supporting our economy through this period, uh, that the decisions that were made by the Treasurer to defer. Uh, the implementation of uh, relevant measures uh, is appropriate. I don't think that anyone would disagree. Anyone, I don't think anyone reasonable uh, would disagree uh, with the uh, proposition that, in the circumstances, it is entirely appropriate for this deferral to have occurred. Uh, and, and of course, at the right time, we will revisit those reforms. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Minister, has the government simply considered legislating this reform now? with extensions to effective start dates, which is common for a lot of legislation in this place, or are you working directly with the big banks on writing this legislation? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, legislation is developed uh, in uh, the usual way, uh, subject to proper consultation with all relevant stakeholders. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, all political parties agreed to legislate the full suite of Hain recommendations on the day they were released, which makes this Royal Commission unique. And I'll stress again, that was 15 months ago. Given the legislation is non-controversial, why won't you recall Parliament and support the Greens' motion to do so in the coming weeks so we can do our job and pass this critical reform now? Senator Cormann. 
thank you very much, Mr. President. Right now, what the Australian people want us to do is uh, to ensure uh, that we uh, keep them safe from uh, a renewed, from my second wave of the coronavirus, and uh, then I want to ensure that we continue to support them through this transition, this difficult economic transition, and that we maximise. Uh, the opportunities for all Australians for a strong, to benefit from a strong economic recovery on the other side. And that is, of course, precisely what we're focusing on. Uh, and at the next election, uh, you will be able to deliver your report card on our performance as a government. We'll be putting forward our report card and our plans for the future. And the Australian people will make a decision on whether they prefer your approach or our approach. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, can the Minister update the Senate on the effects of the coronavirus pandemic on the Pacific and on how Australia is providing support to our neighbours in their health responses? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett uh, very much for his question. Uh, very swift action taken by our Pacific neighbours to restrict travel and quarantine measures uh, has uh, very effectively kept COVID-19 infection rates in the Pacific to a very low rate. Uh, but that is not to say that we can be complacent. In fact, we must absolutely continue to be vigilant. Australia has pivoted our development partnerships to help Pacific Island countries and Timor-Leste to protect communities from COVID-19. Uh, we've indeed responded to over 80 requests from the region since January. Uh, including uh, for a range of issues, PPE, medical supplies, uh, quarantine management, uh, laboratories, pandemic communications and outreach, isolation facilities and emergency response services. We're working with the WHO, the Pacific Community, New Zealand and the United States uh, to procure and distribute gene expert diagnostic equipment to improve COVID-19 testing. This enables COVID-19 test results to be available uh, and delivered in less than an hour, which is essential if countries are to respond quickly to any outbreaks. Uh, testing equipment has already arrived in the Cook Islands, in Fiji, in Kiribati, in PNG, in Nauru, in Niue, in Samoa, in the Solomons, in Tonga, in Tokelau and in Tuvalu, with deliveries expected to other countries in coming days and weeks. Uh, we are very grateful for uh, the support we've received from uh, airlines and the ADF uh, for the delivery of uh, a number of those. Our Pacific Step Up initiatives are also pivoting to respond to the needs of our neighbours. Our Pacific Women's Partnership supporting crisis centres uh, to provide remote counselling and frontline service support. In Timor-Leste, working to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in women's shelters. Our Pacific Fusion Centre is focused on producing targeted and timely information on COVID-19 to support key decision makers. Our focus is on absolutely supporting our Pacific partners to address the pandemic. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, can you advise the Senator on what Australia is doing in the Pacific region to help with the movement of people and essential supplies? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Fawcett. This is a really important question because Australia has a vital role uh, as a transport hub between the Pacific uh, and usually the world. But at the moment, it's very focused uh, with our Pacific counterparts and, I, and, and, and Australia agreeing to establish a pathway uh, for humanitarian, technical and medical supplies. This humanitarian corridor is absolutely central to, develop, to delivering life-saving supplies uh, in response also to Tropical Cyclone Harold, uh, which has of course compounded the impact of COVID-19 in the Solomon Islands, in Tonga, in Vanuatu and in Fiji. So we are standing with our Pacific partners as they also move to repair the damage caused by TC Harold. We have ensured our diplomats, the Australian Federal Police, defence personnel and humanitarian workers have been able to remain in place to support the delivery of key services. And the corridor is also facilitating the return of Pacific Island and Timorese nationals to their home countries, including Order. from places Senator as Payne, far afield as West Africa. Answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you outline to the Senate uh, what Australia is doing to partner with our neighbours to help our region recover economically from the COVID-19 crisis. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, we are looking beyond the immediate health security and safety impacts of COVID-19. We're engaging on economic support with PNG, with Fiji, with the Solomons, uh, with Samoa and Tonga, with Nauru, Kiribati, Vanuatu, Tuvalu and Timor-Leste. 
Their small island economies are heavily dependent on tourism uh, and commodity exports. They're particularly vulnerable to the economic impact of COVID-19. The Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific will promote economic recovery uh, when that point in time is reached by delivering infrastructure focused on jobs and growth and including health infrastructure. We also have new visa, me visa measures in place to enable workers in Australia under the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program who are unable to return home to stay here for up to 12 months. They'll be able to support themselves and their families at home, which is pivotal in times of economic difficulty, while also supporting key businesses and industries here in Australia. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister confirm that Donata employees performing identical work as Australians at other firms and contributing as taxpayers face unemployment because the government has deliberately excluded them from the JobKeeper wage subsidy? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, the company that uh Senator Sheldon references uh, is uh, a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary, of a foreign government-owned business, uh, and a foreign government-owned business which just recently released uh, results showing that they are into their 32nd consecutive year of profitability. 32nd year of uh, consecutive year of uh, profitability. So I can confirm that the rules that apply to JobKeeper do not provide uh, JobKeeper payments to. Uh, Australian local government-owned businesses uh, do not provide JobKeeper payments uh, to any government-owned business in Australia and not to foreign government-owned businesses in Australia. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Well, referring to the exclusion from JobKeeper of 5,500 Donata employees, Liberal MP Craig Kelly has said, and I quote, these airport workers should be included, and these workers were all previous Qantas employees. Can the minister confirm these workers would have been eligible for JobKeeper simply if they were employed by Qantas? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. Well, if a, uh, if a worker um, is employed by an Australian business that is a wholly owned Australian business in Australia, uh, which, uh, which is eligible Order. and is otherwise eligible because of other uh, requirements being met in relation to turnover variations and the like, uh, then, of course, uh, uh, workers in that business, through their business, would be able to receive JobKeeper payments. But workers uh, that are uh, working for a government effectively, for a foreign government-owned business, are not eligible under our rules. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. So why won't the Morrison government step up to help workers at firms like Donata and preserve thousands of jobs and livelihoods as if it has for millions of Australians workers to date. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I, I don't think that anyone can credibly argue that we're not stepping up to support Australian workers. I mean, we're providing massive support, Order. massive support, massive support to Australian workers. Five, more than 5.5 million uh, Australians uh, receiving, are being supported by JobKeeper payments. And of course, we have uh, effectively doubled the job seeker payments, a significant increase in the number of Australians now receiving job seeker payments. We have provided a substantially enhanced uh, social safety net, as well as, of course, providing support to businesses to stay connected to their uh, longer term employees. And that is, that, is, uh, that is what we've done. The rules are very clear. Uh, you do have to draw the line somewhere. And uh, we, it is true to say that foreign government owned uh, businesses uh, in Australia are not eligible for JobKeeper. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. As Australia responds to the coronavirus pandemic, can the minister outline to the Senate what actions the Morrison government has taken to support businesses and workers in defence industry through these challenging times? Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for her question and also for her tireless support for defence industry in a home state and across the nation. The Morrison government remained resolutely committed to delivering ADF capability and also to backing in Australian defence industry throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Our actions are focused in three main areas. Firstly, supporting our sovereign industrial capability. Secondly, supporting our nation's essential skills, trades and expertise, and also supporting our domestic and international supply chains. 
To ensure we respond quickly to emerging is issues in defence industry, Minister Price and I hold weekly teleconferences with defence, defence industry CEOs, peak industry bodies and also state and territory advocates. And because of our swift action to support defence industry, since the 23rd of March, over $4.7 billion of payments have been made early to defence industry here in Australia. Uh, with that payment, I conveyed very strongly my expectations to Primes that those early payments must be passed on to small and medium enterprises, and I'm delighted that that is exactly what they are doing. This action is supporting over 15,000 Australian companies in the defence uh, supply chain, and most importantly, it is supporting 70,000 Australian livelihoods during this time. It's supply Vital defence industry activities are also continuing during COVID-19. For example, Kemmering Australia, based near Geelong, secured a US contract to produce countermeasure flares for global F-35 Joint Strike Fighter fleet. The rollout of the first Law Wingman aircraft occurred. We commissioned the build of six new Cape-class vessels in Western Australia, and we've also shifted Land 400 Phase 3 roadshows online to ensure Australian Order. businesses Senator have the Reynolds, opportunity to pitch the their capabilities. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline what actions Defence has taken to provide economic stimulus? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Henderson. And yes, I can. This government's $200 billion investment in new defence capability is now more important than ever. We must ensure that both our ADF and our defence industry here in Australia remain strong. This government's investment in Australia's defence industry will play an increasingly important part in our nation's economic recovery. In addition to paying out early over $4.7 billion to defence industry, we have implemented a number of other measures to assist defence industry and also to help stimulate our nation's economy. These include increasing and accelerating $850 million in estate and infrastructure expenditure right across our nation and supporting defence innovation, skilling and sovereign industrial development through our grants programs. We are continuing to proactively identify new opportunities to ensure that defence industry weathers the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Henderson, final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the government is continuing to deliver defence capability so our men and women in uniform can continue to defend Australia and its national interests? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thanks, Senator Henderson, for that question. And can I be very clear to all those in this chamber? COVID-19 will not affect funding for the government's $200 billion investment in defence capability nor will it prevent defence expenditure reaching 2 per cent of GDP next financial year, which was three years earlier than we promised in 2013. I'm working with defence to ensure we adapt the current environment and continue to find innovative ways of doing business during this time. And let me remind all of you in this chamber that in our six years of government, we've commissioned the Australian build of 63 naval vessels including 12 attack-class submarines, and this is backed up with real funding. Under our plan, we have already delivered six naval vessels, with another nine under construction in both Perth and in Adelaide. This investment is ensuring our ADF personnel are provided with Order. the capability Reynolds, they need the to keep the them safe. Has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Morrison government has said it will fast-track Australia's environment law changes before the independent review currently underway into the EPBC no. Act is even complete. That's Isn't it true no. that the government is using the COVID-19 health crisis as an excuse to greenlight new projects for your mining and development mates, and that you're undermining the integrity of the independent review and the work of the independent panel? 
Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, what is true is that we're going to focus on growing the economy uh, more strongly again on the other side of this uh, COVID induced crisis, and all Australians would expect us to do precisely that. Uh, it, it has become way too difficult and way too expensive to get projects off the ground in Australia. And, uh, and as a country, we need to reflect on that. We need to ensure that there is an appropriate balance between uh, effective environmental protection uh, and uh, the pursuit of economic opportunity, and that is precisely what our government is doing. Uh, we, we want to see our economy grow more strongly. We want to see more projects getting up. We want to uh, see more projects getting up, which will then be able to uh, hire more Australians and give them and their families opportunities to get ahead. That is what we want to see, and we will do so in a way that, of course, will continue to uh, maintain uh, an appropriate focus and, and keep regard of all of the environmental protection requirements uh, that, uh, that we, of course, support. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary question to the minister. The sectors hardest hit by COVID-19 are indeed tourism, hospitality, arts, and entertainment, making up 60% of the job losses so far. Yet the government has stacked their COVID commission full of mining executives and developers who are hell bent on cutting green tape and in the interests of the economy. Your government's more interested in your mates in the mining industry than they are creating Australian jobs. Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I couldn't really see the question mark at the end of that. Uh, I take that as a comment uh, or as a, as, a, as a little speech. But let me, just, just for the avoidance of any doubt, let me just say that I completely uh, reject the premise of that non question. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've got a, a third question for the minister. The government's appointed this COVID commission. It says that the minister, that the today we found out in the committee, the COVID committee, that the interests of the members of this commission, are, it is up to them personally to disclose their interests as to whether the projects they advocate are benefiting them personally. What is the government going to do to commit to ensure their mates aren't feathering their own nests, instead doing Order, what Australia Senator needs? Senator Young, um, as much of the question as you heard, um, Senator Cormann. Well, I mean, I, my, my question back in response to that uh, question. You no, know, I was given a statement before instead of a question, so I'm going to give a question back in response to a question. <laughs> How do you declare your interests, if not by your? I mean, who, who declares your interests on your behalf? Who, who declares your interests on your behalf? Like, I mean, who else other than yourself can declare your own interests? I mean, that is a genuine question. Like, I'm, I'm, somewhat, I'm somewhat intrigued. Let me just say that the people that are serving on the National uh, COVID Coordination Commission are distinguished Australians, distinguished Australians who are providing great service to our country at a very difficult time. We're very grateful for the service that they're providing. Very, very grateful. And it is a, it is a, it is a broad cross-section. I would not. I, would, I do not agree with the characterisation that Senator Hanson Young uh, has uh, put on them in a sort of a one swipe uh, and sort of sweeping statement. Let me just say uh, that there is, uh, I mean, let me just say we support their work and we absolutely we have great Senator confidence Coleman, that they will the make the appropriate declarations. As I remind senators to phrase their questions in accordance with Standing Order 73, which is quite strict on material that shall not be contained in questions. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When the $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund was announced in January, Prime Minister Scott Morrison claimed the funds would, and I quote, be ready to hit the ground in communities where the fire front has passed to help them rebuild. Can the Minister confirm that figures released earlier this week have revealed the government has paid out less than $260 million, or less than one in eight dollars promised, from its $2 billion fund months after the fires hit. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, it is my melancholy duty to inform the Chamber that, unfortunately, the opposition uh, got it simply wrong again. Uh, we're talking here about a $2 billion bushfire recovery program, which was, of course, always designed to run over two years. That was always, that was always, uh, that was always the plan, two, over two calendar years. And by the end of this financial year, this is by the end of June 2020, uh, it, about $900 million will have, uh, will, have, will have been expensed. Oh, sorry, Senator Watt on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Point of order relevance. My question was about the spending that has occurred, not what might occur one day in the future. Um, I, I will continue to listen carefully to the minister's answer. I believe, with respect, he was directly addressing the subject matter of the question. Let, let me take Senator Watt through the detail. So, $500 million uh, will, uh, be, um, will be paid out, or is being paid out, is, is being paid out this financial year on the following: over $170 million. Order. Senator. Senator um, Corman, I've got Senator Wong on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. The, the point of order is direct relevance. The question is not about the future. The question was very specific to figures released earlier this week, which revealed expenditure to date. It is, and the minister has simply been asked to confirm that. He hasn't been asked about future expenditure. He's been asked a very clear question about what has been spent and figures which have been released this week. On the point of order, Senator. On Corman. the point of order, and. Uh, you know, it, as much as I hesitate to correct um, Senator Wong, the data that uh, Senator Watt is referring to is quite uh, outdated. It's uh, March data, and uh, and so from, that is why I'm providing that is why I'm providing in a directly relevant fashion more up-to-date information. I, I, I had Senator Watt. Do you want Senator Wong? Uh, well, Mr. President, if he wishes to do that, that would be directly relevant. But he's actually saying what will be spent. Um, I will consider whether the nature of directly relevant has a temporal element to it. Um, but with all, with all due respect, there was a quotation from Senator Watt about the program. I believe the minister is being directly relevant to the subject matter because the um, minister can be directly relevant to all or part of a question. I've allowed you to restate the point at the end of the question, but I believe the minister is being directly relevant by going into detail about the program that is referred to in the quotation contained at the beginning of the question. Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, you know, Labor, of course, as always, have got this wrong. A two billion dollar two year program, and in the first six months, in the first six months, we will have uh, spent nearly will have spent nearly half, nearly half. Now, of course, this is a uh, evolving. This is a program that is implemented on an evolving basis. Uh, we, on an evolving basis, over 170 million has been allocated to 10,000 small business uh, support grants. Over 100 million in expanded primary uh, producer grants. Over 32 million in back-to-school support payments. Over 60 million dollars in payments to impacted local government areas. Over 27 million dollars in mental health support to school communities and emergency service workers. Over 50 million dollars in emergency relief and financial counselling. Over 20. $6 million for wildlife and habitat recovery, and uh, also by the end of June, $400 million will be paid out of the fund uh, to reimburse states for cleanup costs. And of course, the timing of these payments, and that is something else that Senator Watt doesn't understand, the timing of these payments actually depends on when the invoices come in, Mr. President. I know that, I know that the Labour Party wants us to just throw the money out with, without the invoices having come in, but we are order. actually paying Senator Watt, on, on, a, on, on a point of order. Senator, I have Senator Watt on a point of order. On Senator Wong. Again, again on relevance, is the minister suggesting that people living in tents should be sending invoices? Senator Watt, that's um, not a point of order. Senator Cormann, um, have you concluded your answer? You have. Senator Watt, do you have a supplementary question? I do, Mr President. Can the minister confirm that some of the government's most hyped bushfire funding pledges, including mental health assistance for schools and rural financial counselling, are yet to receive a single dollar. They are not outdated figures. They are figures that were provided in a question on notice answered on Monday this week. Senator Cormann. Th th thank you very much, Mr President. And as Senator Watt well knows, is that answers, uh, to questions, answers to questions on notice from estimates go to the period of the time when the question is asked. So they are outdated figures. But I will, I will, I will provide, in an abundance of openness and transparency, and to make sure that I've got the most up-to-date current information, I will ensure that I provide Senator Watt with an updated uh, answer to the question on notice. Senator Watt, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Australians on the ground in bushfire-affected areas know that money is not reaching those who need it. With winter approaching, bushfire victims are still living with friends in caravans, in temporary accommodation, while the government tries to spin what it's actually doing. These people need action, not more marketing. When will the Morrison government actually deliver the money they promised so that bushfire-hit communities can actually rebuild? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Well, let me just say very clearly. I mean, these days, our communities have gone through 
a terrible crisis, and, and they are getting significant support from government, state and federal, and we are working as fast as we can in you know, what are, quite frankly, pretty complex circumstances, uh, not made easier by uh, the uh, health crisis that we've also had to deal with very hard on the back of the uh, bushfire crisis. So you know, I, I can see that uh, Senator Watt is uh, you know, intent on pursuing political points here, but let me tell you that communities actually do know, communities, communities do know, communities do know that we are doing our absolute best to provide support to them as soon as we can in what is a very difficult circumstance. Order. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Man Management, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister outline how Australia's agricultural sector and other critical rural and regional sectors such as resources are supporting economic growth during these difficult economic times resulting from the coronavirus pandemic. Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator Canavan for his question and acknowledge the extraordinary um, contribution he's made in, uh, in demonstrating the, the incredible economic support and contribution that these two sectors make to the Australian economy and noting that these two sectors that he refers to are in rural and regional Australia. Um, but now more than ever, um, is it absolutely important that our resources and our agricultural sectors um, are part of the road to recovery uh, from COVID-19 pandemic? Because despite the challenges that we have been seeing um, over the last couple of months, uh, it is very pleasing to be able to report that Australia has achieved uh, once again record trade surpluses of $10.6 billion. That means that we have now had 27 consecutive months of trade surpluses and acknowledge the extraordinary work of Senator Birmingham as the Trade Minister and his predecessors in making sure that our trade continues to support our Australian economy even through these really tough times. And we understand as a government the importance of our international markets and market access. Uh, to make sure that we support our agricultural producers and other exporters. Um, hugely important to areas uh, agriculture, fisheries and our forestry sectors, which do continue to remain strong uh, despite the crises that we have been confronting, not just the coronavirus but the drought that has been part of the Australian landscape for so long. Um, this has been largely achieved through the amazing efforts of the free trade agreements that have been put in place, because they do provide extraordinary benefits to agriculture, fisheries, forestry. They provide new market opportunities uh, by reducing tariffs and making sure that our price competitiveness and our efficiency and, and, and innovation uh, levels the playing field for Australian producers in the international marketplace. And only last week we saw the Indo uh, Indonesia complete its ratification process for our close economic partnership agreement Order. with Senator that country. Rushton. Senator Canavan, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, I do have a supplementary. Minister, how is the Liberal National Government supporting further investment in agriculture to help grow Australia's exports further? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Um, well, Senator Canavan, the government continues to support our agriculture and resource sectors uh, through increased investment. Uh, Investment in excess of $1.5 billion through programs at the National Water Infrastructure Development Fund and the National Water Infrastructure Loan Facility, which is funding 22 new water infrastructure projects across Australia. Because more water means more produce, more produce that Australia can export so that we can make sure that we continue to have the, uh, the income for Australia so to maintain our standard of living. Um, Investments in things like the Rookwood Weir, $176 million um, up in your area in the Fitzroy Basin, $242 million to the Dungowan Dam and $325 million to build Wyangala Dam in New South Wales, $100 million to further modernise the Tasmanian irrigation system. We will continue to support these irrigation projects because they are the backbone of Australia's agricultural sector. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister explain how important timely approval processes are to encouraging future investments in sectors like agriculture and resources, and what measures the government is implementing to help improve approval times? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much. Um, it is absolutely essential that Australia remains at the forefront of an efficient agricultural um, producer. Um, we obviously face unprecedented times at the moment by changing global market conditions, international competition, new technologies, climate and water risks and global disruptions such as the pandemic that we are currently facing. 
So delays in environmental approval processes uh, add millions of dollars to the cost of major projects, and that is why this government is absolutely focused on busting the congestion to break through these multi-million dollar backlogs of environmental assessments to make sure that we continue to del deliver these projects, recognising that it's very important that we continue to make sure that our environmental protections are in place, but do not delay projects to make sure that we continue to support our economy with these in, uh, very important projects. And I can advise that we have improved that process from 19 per cent in December to 87 per cent in March, and we're on target to 100 per cent approval Senator Rustin, by June Senator 2020. Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The Australian National Audit Office has revealed the Prime Minister, that Mo uh, Prime Minister Morrison's office forced uh, former Minister Mackenzie to seek his authority on the approved projects under the Community Sports Infrastructure Grant Program and to inform the Prime Minister of the rollout plan. What authority was the Prime Minister exercising? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I don't, I don't accept the characterisation that what Senator Fowler has put on it. I don't accept the characterisation that Senator Fowler has put on it. What I would say is this: I have consistently made clear that the o order, Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, the point of order is direct relevance. Senator McKenzie just interjected and said it was authority to announce. If that is the government's position, could the Prime order, Minister's representative um, indicate order, that? Sen Senator Wong, that. With respect, leaders get some latitude. The, the point is, the Minister has been speaking for 12 seconds. I'm not in a position to rule on direct relevance at this point, uh, and that wasn't technically a point of order, Senator Wong. Senator Cormann. And, and that point of order, quite inappropriately, creates the impression that I haven't previously addressed this. I would refer Senator Wong to the Hansard. I've consistently made the point that the decision maker in relation to the project was the uh, then uh, Minister for Sports, Senator, Senator McKenzie, and, but that it is, of order. course. Order. I, order. I can't hear the minister's answer. Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. As I've said on a number of occasions in the past, in relation to announcement arrangements, of course, uh, Senator McKenzie uh, liaised with the uh, Prime Minister's office as appropriate, and uh, approval was sought uh, for uh, announcement arrangements. I mean, that is something that has been made clear consistently. That is something that I've made clear in this chamber as the Prime Minister's representative before. Nothing that, uh, leaving the, the rhetorical flourish uh, to one side, nothing that uh, Senator Farrell has just said is actually in any way inconsistent uh, with, uh, with what I've previously said to the Senate and indeed what the Prime Minister has previously said publicly. In fact, I refer you to what he said on ABC television on the 28th of February 2020, where he said, and I'm quoting the Prime Minister now, what she sought from me was approval to make announcements. So, she, so I mean, she'd made the decision. She'd authorised the decisions on the 4th of April, and it's commonplace for ministers, before they make announcements about projects, that they seek approval from the Prime Minister. And that is precisely what happened. That is a consistent, that is a consistent uh, answers that we've given to these questions. And Senator Wong uh, inappropriately trying to create the impression that somehow this is a new revelation, I completely reject. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question. Yes, I do. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the ANAO uh, further confirmed, and I quote, February advice from the Prime Minister's office to the Minister's office was that the Prime Minister had not had a chance to look at the list. Why did the former uh, minister's office have to wait for the prime minister to look at the list? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. It's very simple. It goes to announcement arrangements. Uh, the decisions were made by the minister, who was responsible, and who, incidentally, I mean, this is of course a very popular, very successful program. And as a result of Senator McKenzie exercising appropriately her ministerial discretion, she increased the proportion of funding going to Labour-held electorates. I mean, that is a very important point because in this constant smear that Labour is seeking to perpetuate here uh, against the hard-working, uh, distinguished, outstanding member of our team, this persistent smear that you're trying to spread here, you always, you always hide the fact that the uh, minister's discretion actually increased the proportion of uh, funding going into uh, Labour-held electorates, uh, contrary to the decisions that were made at the public service level. So Minister McKenzie ensured that there was a fairer, more appropriate distribution of those funds in what is an outstanding and very successful project. And none amount of smear and innuendo from the Labour Party uh, will uh, get, uh, get anyone away from that fact. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do have one. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. How many times did the Prime Minister review these infamous 
colour-coded spreadsheets. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, I don't believe that uh, the Prime Minister had any involvement with uh, spreadsheets of the nature that you describe. Uh, the Prime Minister, as he has made clear, as uh, Senator McKenzie has made clear, as I've made clear on a number of occasions now, appropriately, was involved in decision making around announcement arrangements. The uh, projects uh, had been approved by the responsible minister at the time, appropriately consistent with the ministerial guidelines that had been issued at the time, uh, and uh, announcement arrangements are the same in our government as they would have been in your government. The same in our government as they would have been in your government. And this sort of confected outrage is starting to wear a bit thin, particularly given people are focused on some significantly more important issues right now. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, speaking of important issues, my Order, question is to Senator the minister Chandler. representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is boosting services to support the livelihoods of Australians who have been impacted by the coronavirus pandemic? Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Chandler, for your question and the opportunity uh, to tell the Chamber what the government has been doing um, as we face the, an unprecedented demand and significant new challenges uh, that have been presented by the coronavirus, uh, particularly to Services Australia, who are at the forefront of supporting Australians who have been impacted by this pandemic. Throughout this time, Services Australia have been required to deliver new and improved income support measures and fast-track the Australian government's coronavirus financial support to many, many thousands of Australians in need. We acknowledge that this has been a particularly difficult time for many Australians, and can I acknowledge the extraordinary patience and understanding that they have shown as we have had to ramp up the services at Services Australia to a level that we have never, ever seen before. This effort includes the redeployment of over 12,000 additional staff into uh, support centres, call centres and processing claims. Um, since the 27th of July, we've got the 550 coronavirus supplement out the door, uh, valuing uh, $1.1 billion for that fortnight to around 1.9 million Australians. Can I can also say that we've ramped up the cap capability uh, and the stability of our online service systems, particularly MyGov, and we've seen a capacity uh, increase from 6,000 concurrent users to 300,000 concurrent users just in a matter of days. Uh, in the month of April, um, we had an average of 1.7 million Australians that were on MyGov every single day, and on one day alone we had three, 3 million Australians, which is the most amount that we've ever seen on the MyGov website. We've also managed to get the $750 stimulus payment out in early April uh, to over 6.8 million Australians, uh, $5.1 billion in the hands of Australians who most need it. This is an injection into the Australian economy to support Australians through this corona pandemic. Senator Chandler, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank the Minister for her response. What improvements has the government made to ensure Australians have timely access to the support they need? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the government has made ex extraordinary and significant changes to the Services Australia delivery mechanism, including making sure that process is simplified, that we've moved to digital processing so Australians can get their payments in a timely way, but also from the safety of their own homes. From the 25th of March 2020, Australians were able to register their intent to make a claim, a claim by logging onto their MyGov account which means that they could register for financial support in a matter of just minutes. We appreciate the patience of the Australian community that, have, uh, that they have shown as we have put these, pre these systems into place. Um, Services Australia have also introduced a streamlined job seeker process um, uh, claim form to allow people to claim, make their claims in 20 questions. This has halved the amount of average time for somebody who is making a typical job seeker claim. We are absolutely committed to supporting Australians who have needed our support through Services Australia through these unprecedented Senator times. Senator Chandler, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister advise the Senate what has been the result of these enhancements? Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Since the 16th of March 2020, Services Australia have processed more than one million job seeker claims. That's more than double the number 
of claims that we would process last year. So in the space of six weeks, we've done an equivalent of two years' normal work. This is in addition to the millions of Australians who have accessed our services for health, welfare, child support payments and other services that Services Australia provide to everyday Australians. We've also been able to extend the job seeker phone line hours from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, on workdays. And can I once again extend my thanks to the Australian public for their extraordinary patience as they've had to interact with these new systems as we've got them up and running in the most extraordinary speed. Um, can I also, though, thank uh, and acknowledge the extraordinary work of the staff at Services Australia, the frontline staff who have had to deal with people who are in very, very distressing circumstances, and thank them for the passion and dedication that, that they have exhibited as they have dealt with Australians who are in extraordinary vulnerable times. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Uh, Labor acknowledges the awful situation that has confronted residents, families and staff at New March House in Sydney's west. And, uh, we do want to express our deeper sympathies to all those who have lost loved ones. Does the minister agree that the residents in that centre, their loved ones and the staff at New March House deserve a thorough and independent review of what has gone wrong? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And, uh, can I add uh, my thoughts and condolences, and I'm sure everybody in the chamber's thoughts and condolences, to the families of uh, residents in all aged care facilities. In fact, all of those who have lost loved ones uh, to, the, to coronavirus. It's uh, had a particularly devastating impact uh, at Newmarch, uh, and I've already asked my department to provide me at an appropriate time with a report uh, of uh, what has occurred there, just as I did with Dorothy Henderson Lodge, and my understanding is that that report was considered by National Cabinet a week or so ago. So it is important that people understand properly what's, what has occurred uh, within these facilities. It is and has been extremely difficult for the families and for the residents, and uh, we've seen only uh, too graphically publicly the concern that they have expressed when they haven't had appropriate levels of communication and information as to what's happening with their loved ones within the facilities. I am very pleased to say that. Uh, particularly that the interventions of the government and the resources provided by the government uh, has considerably assisted in that respect. Uh, three interventions now by the Quality and Safety Commissioner uh, in respect of assistance with senior management capacity within the facility, uh, a communications uh, instruction to uh, Anglicare via Newmarch to provide much better information out to families, which I know uh, from talking to them is, is giving them much more comfort with respect to the circumstance of their loved ones, and of course the intervention last week uh, with a, uh, an instruction to comply that was issued by the Quality and Safety Commissioner. Uh, I think we all want to understand the lessons from what's occurred at Newmarch. Uh, we continue to work very closely with all of the health authorities that are involved uh, from a state and a Commonwealth level in the interests of the residents and their families, because it is important that they get the best possible care. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Can the minister confirm whether the government will engage the Royal Commission into Aged Care to undertake a special investigation into what went wrong at Newmarch House? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, the, the Royal Commission has been established with its terms of reference uh, and appropriately uh, has, I think, indicated that they will be looking into the circumstances uh, at uh, at Newmarch, uh, but, but I've asked them, uh, not through a particular um, form of communication but, but by public statements, that I have asked them to look at the circumstances with respect to COVID-19 and its management in all aged care facilities across Australia, because I think it's appropriate. Um, it's not appropriate for me, as Minister, to provide a specific direction to the Royal Commission. They are established through their um, uh, the, the processes that governments put in place. They are free to uh, undertake inquiries as, as they see appropriate. And I understand that the opposition has written to the Royal Commission seeking uh, such a special inquiry, and in the, in the Royal Commission, on my understanding, has responded that they will be looking at it, but not in a special sense. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. Can the minister provide uh, details to the Senate about the government's engagement with the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety beyond 
the public statements that he says that he's made um, in relation to the investigation into Newmarch House uh, and COVID-19 uh, and, uh, and any other aged care COVID-19 outbreaks? Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Mr President, and thanks for the question. Uh, it's not appropriate for me to be directly engaging with the Royal Commission. Uh, that's not, a, not an appropriate thing for me to do. Uh, we can, through, uh, through the department, uh, provide uh, information to the Royal Commission on request, uh, but, but I have to respect the Royal Commission, its terms of reference, as they have been established by the governments. That is my responsibility. And so for me to reflect in any way on the Royal Commission would not be appropriate. Uh, uh, it is not an appropriate thing for me to do, uh, and I have taken advice on whether or not I should be engaged directly uh, with the Royal Commission on previous occasions, because there have been some things that I've been uh, that, that I've thought it was appropriate to do. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, I have, I think, expressed the government's view quite frankly with respect to what we should would like to see in relation to the Royal Commission. The Royal Commission has put out a public statement that it will be investigating the circumstances of COVID-19 in aged care, and I think quite appropriate. Order, Senator, Senator Cormann. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Yeah. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, I have an answer to a question I took on notice uh, yesterday from Senator Lambie in question time regarding the matter of ordinary uh, seaman yeah, Edward yeah. Teddy Sheehan. As so poignantly outlined by Senator Lambie yesterday, ordinary seaman Sheehan was killed in action on 1 December 1942, actions that displayed conspicuous gallantry. Sheehan was the subject of a contemporary nomination process which resulted in the posthumous award of mention in dispatches for his actions in 1942. This award was reviewed by the Defence and uh, Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal in its 2011 to 2013 Valor Inquiry, which recommended that no action be taken to award ordinary seaman Sheehan a Victoria Cross or other further forms of recognition for his gallantry or valour. The government accepted the recommendations of the Valor Inquiry in, 19, uh, sorry, in, 19, in 2013. The Victoria Cross for Australia is Australia's highest decoration for gallantry and is the only award the Australian Honours and Awards System that is approved by the Sovereign. Clear government policy, informed by Her Majesty the Queen's expressed views, would only allow the award of the Victoria Cross in light of compelling new evidence or in the case of manifest injustice. In, 19, sorry, in 2019, the Tribunal conducted a review of the Valor's inquiry recommendation in relation to the Sheehan Award and subsequently reported to government. Having received confirmation last night in following up from uh, Senator Lambie's question, I am able to advise the Senate today that the government's view that the 2019 review by the Tribunal did not present any compelling new evidence that might support reconsideration of the Valor uh, Inquiry's recommendation. That is also my view and that is also the view of defence. It is a very difficult decision, but I believe in the circumstances the right decision. Mr President, oh, Deputy President, Snuck in. <laughs> I must emphasise that the outcomes of the government decision in no way detracts from the service, the bravery and the sacrifice of ordinary seaman Teddy Sheehan. The Royal Australian Navy rightly continues to commemorate the service of Teddy Sheehan in a number of ways, including through the naming of a Collins-class submarine, HMAS Sheehan. This is a rare form of commemoration in recognition of Teddy Sheehan's exceptional service to our nation and for his ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Uh, Senator Billick at the lectern. Thank you. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Walsh and Sheldon. And the minister's answers show little sympathy for the workers who those opposite have failed to protect throughout this crisis. When the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, announced JobKeeper, the Treasurer, Mr Frydenberg, said, and I quote, Australians know that their government has their back. Well, many Australians now know that the government doesn't have their back. Instead, this government has abandoned millions of Australian workers with the design of the JobKeeper scheme, throwing them on the scrap heap. 
The government already rejected Labor's proposal to include casuals who have been employed for less than 12 months. And we've heard that workers like Darcy, mentioned in the question to the minister, have been in their current job for 15 years, yet Darcy is ineligible because he's been with his current employer for less than 12 months. Darcy is just um, one of 1.1 million casuals who have missed out on the JobKeeper because the government refuses to support them. And we heard the minister say that, uh, having a little petty political dig at um, Premier Andrews, that Premier Andrews should just open up hospitality and he should do it now. Well, if that's the case, uh, Minister, why can't Parliament sit now? Why are we not sitting after tomorrow? There's a good question to ask you. And do you really think the premiers should ignore the health advice they are given by their health officials? I mean, really. Labor has urged the government to improve support for charities, to help workers in the arts and to expend, extend the JobKeeper payment to people on temporary visas. And when the scheme was debated in parliament, every one of Labor's amendments was rejected. If the current exclusions aren't bad enough, on the 1st of May, with the stroke of a pen, this government cancelled the JobKeeper scheme for thousands of workers in companies like Donata. 5,500 Donata workers had been assured by their company's management that they would be covered. And now they've been told that the government changed the rules without any warning. The same exclusion that affected Donata workers has also impacted hundreds of workers in hotel chains. JobKeeper was put in place to support workers in affected businesses. It was supposed to help them retain their jobs during this uncertain time. Whatever happened to the message that we're all in this together? Because if we're all in this together, let me tell you, the Morrison government has just ignored it. They've just been abandoning millions of workers. Since the federal government shut down of just about all of the aviation uh, operations over the last few months, Donata has had no choice now but to stand down workers. But they did so under the understanding that they could collect JobKeeper payments for those workers. And those workers have been relying on JobKeeper payments. They've been relying on those payments to help with their rent and their mortgages and to buy groceries for their kids and medications for their kids. And I heard Senator Sheldon yesterday speaking about it, and he gave an example of a, a young woman um, whose child you know, they can't afford the medication for that child. And this government just, you know, all put their heads down and ignore that. Not their responsibility. Well, it is their responsibility. For the staff to be told to join Centrelink's queues, knowing that their employment and thousands of their co-workers' jobs are in jeopardy, all because of a nice little loophole the government's dreamt up. So it's been all right for these workers to pay their taxes here. Many of these workers have worked for many, many years—15, 20 years for Donata. They've paid their taxes, but all of a sudden the government says, sorry, we've found this little loophole—one would presume it's to save money for the government—we found this little loophole, so you're all going to miss out and we don't really care about you. As I said, Donata employs about 5,500 people in Australia, and they're the people you don't actually see at the airport unless you're sitting next to the window uh, of the loading side of the plane. You might see them. They're the people that um, do catering and ground and ramp work, and the staff live right throughout Australia in all different electorates. And in the last six weeks, they have faced devastating uncertainty about their jobs and their industry. They've been stripped of shifts and then stood down. They've been told they would be able to access JobKeeper, then, after this most recent change, told to go and join the Centrelink queues. Many Donata staff have not been paid for extended periods of time because of the conflicting government advice. They have families. They have people who rely on them. They can't pay their mortgages or their rent or their other bills, but, as I said, it's OK for them to have been paying their tax for many, many years. The government has to overturn this unfair decision. JobKeeper was supposed to apply to all workers Thank to you, help Senator keep Billick. them employed. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and look, I'd just like to say that these accusations by the Labor Party happen to be quite tawdry by accusing us of saying that we've turned our back on the workers. We have actually doubled, might I add, the job seeker allowance. And should I also add, there's also a number of other uh, allowances on top of that, which will reduce the difference between job seeker and job keeper. 
to a very small amount. Now, except you know, it's not perfect. You know, we had a very limited time frame in which to bring in a financial package that was going to deal with one of the biggest economic and social and health crises this country has faced in a century. And what do we get from the Labor Party? Picking at small issues, at rats and mice. Okay, we have done the, the Greg Hunt in particular has done a fantastic effort with health. We have flattened the curve, and that is in the face of hysteria from many media outlets and all that saying that we weren't ready, uh, we weren't going to have enough ICU beds, etc. etc. Well, we had more than enough ICU beds. We got the message out there, we got the quarantine measures in at the borders, and we are now in front of many other countries. Uh, and we've actually set an example for many other countries. And hopefully, going forward, we'll be able to reopen sooner, and many of these people in casual work will be able to actually get their jobs back and their lives back and their livelihoods back. And Ken, I'd like to commend the coalition government and Scott Morrison for doing a wonderful job in managing the national cabinet, particularly with all the state premiers. And let's face it, that's like herding cats in this day and age. But he has managed to do it. He hasn't played politics. And we're back here in day one, day two of uh, sitting in parliament here, and you're already, you know, playing politics. I mean, guys, we're not through this yet, okay? I'm sure that some of these issues, and you know, with Donato, I, I take that on board. But you know, it's one of these things. We've also have to balance out the long-term budget with, you know, foreign interests and things like that. Um, and, and look, Senator Sheldon, happy to work with you later on with some of these issues to make sure that all hard-working Australians are looked after. So I would please ask that we still maintain a spirit of cooperation until we're through this, because we've got to get through the winter months yet. Um, and uh, so, anyway, uh, a couple of other things uh, worth pointing out. Uh, I think we've got five and a half million people working um, in the job uh, covered under the job keeper arrangement, and we've actually doubled the job seeker arrangement. And we did that pretty much straight away. Uh, and this is all up going to cost us about $130 billion, and that is a lot of money that we've got to repay in the future. So it's a question of balancing out the long-term effects of this with obviously bringing the, uh, flattening the curve and keeping people's heads above water. I'd also like to commend the coalition government for investing heavily in mental health, because we have to remember here it's not just the, you know, the health effects of COVID, it's also the health effects of the devastating impacts of the economic downturn. And having worked in finance for a number of years, I, I know what it could be like and what that will do to mental health. So, um, look, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, I think uh, I should also commend uh, the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, who I think has uh, done a fantastic job in, in working with the various parties and getting these grants out. Uh, so, so, yeah, um, I'm sort of running out of things to say here, but anyway, uh, because. <laughs> Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, uh, look, I'll just clarify some of these uh, issues so people have a better understanding of uh, what we have done. Employees are hired after the 1st of uh, March 2020, and casual employees have been employed for under 12 months as at the 1st. Uh, uh, hang on, sorry, apologies, wrong with that. Okay, so um, I beg your pardon. Uh, no, no, let's not talk about renewable energy. But actually, I have got on to a separate topic that I will talk about in the last minute, and that is the resentment by Labor of allowing people to access their superannuation. Now, there's not much point putting money away for a rainy day if you're never going to get there. At the end of the day, it's very important to keep meals on the table and the roof over their head. And I think the, the complaining by the Labor Party of letting people access, the workers, access their hard-earned hard funds has been very, very tawdry. At the end of the day, it's about $10 billion, I think they're estimating, out of $3 trillion. It's less than 1 per cent of the total funds under management of superannuation. And can I say it's reflective of the poor cash management practices of some of these super funds that they haven't actually got the liquidity in their bank accounts to meet these payments. But let me say this is a sign of things to come because superannuation is a massive Ponzi scheme. And when people of my generation get to 60 and they suddenly start withdrawing 40 years of super in one year, you're going to need 40 workers to replace them. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Your time has expired. and uh, You did only spend a minute on, but taking note is about the topic, uh, the answers to certain questions that it was on um, uh, JobKeeper, but I was very lenient because, as you said, it was only a minute. Senator Walsh. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy President. <coughs> where, where to begin? Uh, well, right now there are millions of uh, casual workers and other Australians who are missing out on the JobKeeper program. Uh, and it just seems like the ministers opposite and some of the senators opposite just don't understand the desperate situation that some of these workers are in. Um, it is a good program. It's a program that the Labor Party and the union movement pushed for, but it needs to be extended to the workers who really need it. Uh, and the Treasurer could fix this with the stroke of a pen, uh, but instead what he's doing is talking about snapping back uh, when so many people are still in crisis uh, and still need support. Uh, and of course, when I asked uh, Senator Cormann uh, today how it's fair to exclude casuals like Darcy Moran, who I spoke to last week, who's been working in hospitality for 15 years, for 15 years with no periods of unemployment, um, but because of the transient nature of hospitality, he's been with his current employer, employer for only a few months. Uh, I think the answer from Senator Cormann was really quite outrageous, uh, and, that it was, and that was that the State Premier, Daniel Andrews, uh, should just reopen hospitality. Darcy should just go back to work right now because the Premier should just reopen hospitality. Uh, no, the government should extend the JobKeeper program to those casuals in hospitality who are excluded. Uh, and it is extraordinary that uh, Senator Cormann uh, has called on Daniel Andrews to just reopen the hospitality sector despite the health advice, despite the health advice, despite the risks to the workforce, uh, despite the safety concerns of workers, uh, and despite the risks and the safety concerns uh, in the community. And it seems that this government uh, just doesn't understand the way the labour market works today under the leadership of this government. So many people are in casual and insecure jobs, and that is why so many people are excluded from this JobKeeper program. Uh, in hospitality, 78 per cent of workers are casual, and about half of, them, half of them have been with their current employer for less than 12 months. That is the reality of work today under the leadership of this government, and that is why JobKeeper needs to urgently be extended to those casual workers with less than 12 months service, to hard-hit sectors like hospitality and the arts, uh, and many others. Casual workers like Darcy are really struggling. They are struggling to pay the rent. They're struggling to pay bills and to put food on the table. Uh, and for Darcy, that meant that at 30 years of age, he had to actually go home uh, and live with his parents. And moving back in with your parents at the age of 30 after 15 years of continuous work uh, isn't really the dream uh, that any of us have, but it was his only option. Uh, and it was absolutely gut-wrenching for him. And he considers himself to be one of the lucky ones uh, because he knows that some of those who are employed in hospitality won't be able to stay uh, with family and friends, including, of course, those many temporary migrant workers who've also been excluded from the scheme. Uh, and this is a really grim reality that this government is allowing to happen. The government's wage subsidy program is failing some of those who are hardest hit by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and they could fix it, as we know, with the stroke of a pen. So the question remains, why won't they? Why won't they? There are so many workers out there that need the government to extend JobKeeper to them uh, in their sectors right now, today. And that, of course, includes the Donata workers, uh, more than 5,000 of them, who the government is also choosing to ignore. Uh, and their company is ineligible for JobKeeper, as we know, because the company's parent company um, happens to be a foreign, a foreign government. But these are Australian jobs, Australian workers who are here right now today who are calling on the government for some support. They're calling on the government for assistance. They're calling on the government for backup. They're calling on the government to extend the JobKeeper program to them. The aviation sector has already been hard hit and these workers need government support. As it stands, the JobKeeper program just doesn't account for the actual ownership structure, the, real, the, the reality of the, how the aviation sector works. Um, so we need to send these workers a lifeline. We need to support them and their families. We need them to maintain their connection to their employer.
Uh, and like with hospitality, we need aviation in a strong position to recover after the COVID crisis. We need to extend JobKeeper to these sectors now. Thank you, now. Senator Walsh. Your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I stand rise to speak on this uh, important issue of the JobKeeper program. As a senator for Western Australia, I've spent most of my time speaking to as many businesses as I possibly can across the whole state of Western Australia, from the north up in the Kimberley, uh, right the way down to the southwest uh, and into the Great Southern and, of course, in Perth as well. Uh, particularly early on, when we were first discussing the JobKeeper program, before all the details were released, but the, uh, the consideration of the program was put out there in the public, uh, there was, of course, a lot of interest. And, and I really commend the Treasurer in the way that he approached this. Uh, he, he really called upon uh, colleagues to provide feedback so that it could be fed into the design of the program. And, uh, I really commend the Treasurer in the way that he consulted with his colleagues on this to make sure that the program was designed in a way that could pr provide the maximum impact uh, with, and using a system that could be uh, tailored and a system that, that was scalable to, to meet the, the demand that was expected. We expected uh, that there could be up to six million people that would be uh, impacted by this and that would be provided this support. Uh, to date, there's been over five and a half million people that have, uh, have you know, businesses and employees that have, that have been imp uh, impacted and have registered for this. And it really is making a solid impact. And I, as I said, I do commend the, the Treasurer in, in the design. Uh, and we had to make sure that it was done in a way that it could be rolled out as quickly as possible, using existing systems without having to design new systems that would no doubt be complicated by the fact that you don't have uh, lengthy lead-in time to set these things up. So we've used existing systems to enable this program to happen. So that means that you cannot possibly have it designed to cover every single conceivable person. And this is why we have the safety net of the Job Seeker program and the doubling of the Job Seeker payment to ensure that those people that find themselves uh, whether in a situation where they're not eligible for JobKeeper, they have the ability to uh, claim Job Seeker if they are in fact eligible. And we're seeing the impact of the JobKeeper program. Uh, I said I've spoken to lots of businesses across the state. Uh, one particular business is just in the southern suburbs of Perth, uh, Alba Edible Oils. Now, this is a, a business that produces oils which go into uh, restaurants, uh, and in fact, they ship it across the world. Uh, now, of course, with restaurants closing down due to COVID-19, uh, the, the demand for their product right now is, is not there. Uh, had there not been the JobKeeper program, they would have laid off, they estimate, uh, about 17 people in their, in their factory. Now, this is an amazing workshop. It's an amazing factory. Uh, what they're able to do is incredible. And the, the time and the energy that they've put into their staff to train them, to equip them to be able to perform uh, in their workplace uh, is very, very considerable. And had they lost that contact with those employees, had they lost that connection with those employees, it would have been very, very difficult for that business to restart and get back up and running. But the JobKeeper program has enabled that business to retain their staff so that when we are through this and when the restaurants reopen, as they're uh, expected to do, many of them as of Monday in Western Australia this coming week, I, and I commend the state government for really leading the way nationally and following the, the guidance from the National Cabinet and, and being part of a, a real leading edge when it comes to the reopening of our economy in Western Australia. Uh, th th this company is, is now set up and ready when things move forward. Uh, they've also, I'm, I'm pleased to see, uh, that this company has received a grant for the Modernising Manufacturing Grant from the Commonwealth. And this is enabling them to purchase new equipment, which is going to streamline their operations again. And the, because of the JobKeeper program, they're actually able to implement and put in place the, uh, the, the, the equipment that's necessary uh, for them to grow, for them to develop. They've got uh, equipment that's going to enable them to uh, uh, for, uh, bring in place new packaging, which will enable them to export to new markets. Uh, this is all possible, and they're able to actually install that equipment because of the JobKeeper program, so that when we're through at the other side of this, 
they're able to launch ahead. Now, you know, the, the, as I said, the, the job seeker payment has been doubled, which means that those that don't have that safety net of the job keeper have the safety net and the fallback position of the job seeker program. And those people will be able to restored, be restored back into employment once we're through thank this you, crisis. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. The time has expired. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Well, isn't this just economically illogical, cruel, inconsistent and a bloody-minded approach to what we, how to deal with the question that we raised in question time regarding Donata? Let's just cast our minds back about the great double-cross by this government. As Senator Rennick quite rightly raised about all of us working together, and we have and will continue. But working together is also making constructive, sensible and logical criticism to steps that the government makes that do, on policies that do not make sense, do not make economic sense, and certainly are inconsistent. What's clear in this particular double cross is there was a clear understanding when this proposal was put forward regarding JobKeeper that the number of people that would be included in JobKeeper is fallen now one million short. There was an understanding to the Australian public who was going to be covered. Donata workers, JobKeeper going to many millions of workers, but one million short. There is a capacity, there is an ability, and there was an undertaking about these workers properly being covered. Now, I don't call those people rats and mice. I don't think Senator Reddick was talking about the individuals. He's talking about the cases and examples that we're bringing up. This case is not a rats and mice case. It's five and a half thousand Australian families. And to be specific, it's families right across this country. A thousand and sixty-one to be specific in New South Wales, mums and dads raising their families who have been left out because the government decided to change its policy and double-cross those workers. It's 1,124, to be specific, families—mums, dads, people raising their kids—wondering what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, they've been double-crossed. 1,120 in Queensland, double-crossed. 196 in South Australia, also double-crossed. Northern Territory, eight and the ACT 18. They've all been double-crossed by this government. They said one thing and they did another. They shortchanged just a million people in this country not getting support because there was a deal done and an understanding done about what this would do to the Australian public. This was about not only getting safety back to our Australian community and giving them support to connect them to businesses, but to stimulate the economy. Now, I'll just go to two examples. If you don't believe me, there's two examples. J.P. Morgan, very well respected Miss Hall from there, said that, along with Miss Wood from the former OEC director, both believe that higher levels of public spending will be needed to fire up the economy, the recovery. Miss Wood went further to say so that things like cash payments, we know that these have been helpful through the crisis in getting people out and spending. We, are, we have to make sure that we're spending the amount of money that you said we all agreed, the community agreed, as part of a compact that you've now double-crossed by leaving a million people short in this country and 5,500 Donata workers. So let's talk about these people and the rats and mice issues that we're raising. Donna Pearce. Donna's married with two children, 21 and 17. She lives in Ro 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 Romsey in the Macedon, uh, Rangers, Macedon Rangers in Victoria and has worked at what is now Donata's Melbourne Airport site since the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Now, Donata, putting this in context, Donata is a company that, was pur that purchased Qantas, an Australian catering company, who pur and they, Donata purchased another Australian company to make its catering business. These are Australian taxpayers. Not one cent goes in subsidy to uh, Donata, as, no, as one cent should not be going into subsidy to any company, including Qantas, I might add, who have been used their subsidies for annual leave and people's leave entitlements, even sick leave. But Ms Pearce 
This is her circumstances and what she had to say. More important than Senator Broderick, than Minister Cormann, or myself. She said, I don't understand what the government's problem is, but they don't have an explanation for why they are excluding them. Excluding them. Do they expect the Dubai government to fork out for Australian workers who work in Australia and pay the Australian government taxes? Donna has a mortgage Order. with a husband. Senator Sheldon, time for the contributions expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Billick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Response to my question to Senator Cormann, uh, Mr. President. Um, Senator Cormann told the Senate today that the government's number one responsibility now is to is to protect Australian citizens, and I would argue that's exactly what the Bank's Royal Commission was set up to do, with its 76 recommendations, recommendations that went to reform, to protect small business, to protect Australian farmers, to protect first Australians, to protect lenders, households, mums and dads, consumers of financial advice. One of the biggest reforms in the financial services sector and financial economy that we've seen in this country. 76 recommendations. And so extraordinary were the revelations from this Royal Commission and so shocked were the Australian public many media commentators and parliamentarians in this place, that we saw something extraordinary happen. We saw something extraordinary happen the day that Commissioner Hain handed down his recommendations. The Liberal Party, the LNP, said they would legislate those recommendations in full before they were even released. And the Labor Party pledged the same thing, as did the Greens and other crossbenchers. What other Royal Commission have we ever seen that happen on? 76 recommendations. Well, they were passed down in February last year in the 45th parliament. We are now in the 46th parliament, 15 months later, and no legislation, no reform has happened in this country following Commissioner Haynes' recommendations. We know we are going into a deep recession in this country. We know it's going to be difficult times ahead. I would have thought that if Senator Cormann wanted to protect Australians, he would legislate these recommendations. Think about this. They were due to be legislated, at least half of the recommendations by Commissioner Hain were due to be legislated by June this year. That's next month. I presume that Treasury has been working around the clock to get this legislation ready. Indeed, that's exactly what they've told us at Estimates. The reason this critical financial reform, so important to protect Australians, has been delayed is because the big end of town, the big banks, the big financial services companies, the big insurance companies have lobbied this government to delay this reform. If it was true that because of COVID it was impossible for the banks to be able to do this, even though they've had 15 months, including significant consultation with Treasury to this point, if it was true, we could still legislate that, that recommendations and this reform, but put effective starting dates six or 12 months down the track. Why don't we lock it in? So many of us are calling for Parliament to resume. The Greens will be putting up a motion to do exactly this in June. We can use this opportunity to legislate this reform when it was due to be legislated. And if industry crying, kicking and screaming, then fine. Let's make it effective in six months' time, but let's get it done. Who knows, Mr President, when this government's going to go to the next election? Some are speculating it may be as a early as August next year. If we are then delaying the bulk of the Royal Commission recommendations and legislation to June next year, which is what the Treasurer said, I would argue that's one parliamentary sitting away from a potential election. Will we even see it in this parliament? It was an election promise. 
by the Liberal Party that they would legislate these recommendations in full. There is no reason that we should be letting big corporations dictate our legislative agenda in the highest chamber in this country. There is no reason at all except they've clearly got to this government. This was non-controversial. It had unanimous support from all political parties in this place. We could get this legislation done in June if we recall parliament and do our job. That's what the Greens want to see. That's what the Australian public want to see. We promised them that after a $60 million royal commission and the shocking revelations and the significant reform that was outlined, that we would do that. We would do that in this parliament. And I urge senators to listen to the Greens, recall parliament, get the Order, job done. Senator Wish Wilson. The question is the motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Ayes have it. Senators, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 27th of April 2020 of Ian Raymond Causley, a member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Page, New South Wales, from 1996 to 1997. I will now move on to petitions, and I call the clerk. Petitions have been lodged as listed on the dynamic red. The terms of the petitions will be incorporated in Hansard. Thank you. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day, Senator? Are you on petitions or on petitions, Senator Patrick? Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement in relation to the petition uh, related to regional airport security. Is leave granted? Sorry, I've got, a, I've got a request for leave to make a short statement by Senator Patrick in relation to the petition just tabled that related to regional airport security. One is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this is a petition of uh, 1,634 predominantly regional South Australians to the Senate requesting uh, it agrees that security screening in regional airports be paid for by the federal government, not regional communities. Air travel is the lifeblood of regional communities. It's how they get their medical support, it's how they get education services, it's how they get business services, it's how they get uh, uh, um, access to assistance in terms of agricultural support and so forth. Uh, the government has introduced uh, a requirement uh, for security screenings but will not pay for the ongoing operating costs. This is going to cause great uh, uh, problems in relation to regional uh, air routes. We know Wyler is going to be charged an extra $52 per seat to meet this requirement and it basically will risk the viability of a number of air routes right around uh, South Australia, but also more broadly Order, around the Senator country. Patrick, um, we'll now move on to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I call the clerk to start with. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. General Business Notice of Motion 5614 today to the next day of sitting. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion number 3 for today to the next day of sitting. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move the motion relating to leave of absence. Leave is granted. Senator Urquhart. I, ask that I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator O'Neill for today for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. I understand business of the Senate motions number one, two and four were debated later. So I'll go straight into general business. Start with Senator Griff, number 531. Uh, Mr President, uh, uh, before asking the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Seward will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 531, standing in my name and the name of Senator Seward for today, relating to the use of credit cards to pay for gambling, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave is granted for one minute. The government is committed to reducing gaming-related uh, harm for Australians gambling online. In November 2018, Commonwealth and state and territory governments launched the National Consumer Protection Framework 
for online wagering in Australia, which provides for the first time strong nationally consistent protections for consumers of Australia's interactive wagering services. The government has also implemented a website blocking scheme to protect Australians from illegal offshore gambling websites. I encourage anyone affected by problem gambling to access one of our funded financial counsellors for tailored support. Question is that motion number 531 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, could I come to 532 in your name as well? Uh, Mr. President, I ask that General Business Notice of number 532, standing in my name, my name for today, relating to the private health insurance, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? With being none, Senator Griff. Mr. President, I move the motion. Question up. Senator Rustin. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Following discussions with the government, private health insurers have deferred or not implemented the 1 April 2020 premium changes and are implementing a range of measures to support policyholders, including waivers or temporary suspension of premium fees. The government also notes that private health insurers are funding new services such as telehealth for mental health support and certain allied health services where practical and clinically appropriate. The motion, therefore, is based on an incorrect series of premises and also seeks commitments which are against government policy. On that basis, the government cannot support the motion. The question is that motion number 532 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we come to 533, Senator Griff? Uh, Mr President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 533, standing in my name in the name of Senator McAllister for today, relating to small amount of credit contracts, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. The motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government recognises the importance of protecting vulnerable consumers of financial products, which is why it is progressing changes designed to enhance protections for consumers of small amount credit contracts and leases. The government is currently considering public submissions on a suite of reforms to small amount credit contracts and consumer leases. The question is that motion number 533 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, number 534. Mr President, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators Keneally and Walsh will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 534, standing in my name and the names of Senator Keneally and Walsh for today relating to coronavirus and racism, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Griff, number 535. Mr President, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Keneally will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 535, standing in my name and the name of Senator Keneally for today, relating to the multilingual COVID-19 information, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Griff. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Dean Smith, number 536. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 536 relating to the Jambo Africa Festival be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith again, 537. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 537 relating to Captain James Cook be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Smith. I move the motion. Senator Seward. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The arrival of Captain Cook and the First, Fle and the, and the first Fleet um, in Australia had catastrophic and tragic consequences for First Nations peoples that continue today. For many people, Captain Cook's arrival symbolises the beginning of the brutal frontier violence and massacres, the forced removal of children from their families, indentured and slave labour and violent attempts to wipe out First Nations languages and culture. It, is mar it marked the beginning of the ongoing dispossession of, and oppression for First Nations peoples in this country, the effects of which continue today. First Nations peoples have never ceded sovereignty over their land. We must tell the truth about our shared history, and change, and change is possible when you tell the truth. Senator Gallo. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, Labor would also like—we uh, will support the motion, but we also would like to acknowledge that 
this motion um, should acknowledge First Nations people were living in Australia for tens of thousands of years before James Cook set sail. And contrary to some of the words in the motion, the east coast of Australia was not discovered by Cook. It was indeed very well known to First Nations people who were living along the coastline at the time. Just as the plants and animals of this continent were understood, used and managed by First Nations Australians for tens of thousands of years before Cook's voyage. The question is that motion number 537 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Smith, number 538, also in your name. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 538 relating to Chin National Day be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Smith. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Ciccone, number 539. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to uh, inform the chamber that Senators Hume, Van Henderson, Patterson, McKenzie, Ryan and Kitching will also sponsor the motion. I ask that general business notice of motion number 539 stand in my name and the names of Senators Hume, Van Henderson, Patterson, McKenzie, Ryan and Kitching for today relating to the death of four Victorian police officers be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Ciccone. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Prime Minister yesterday expressed his condolence to the families, friends and colleagues of leading Senior Constable Lynette Taylor, Senior Constable Kevin King, Constable Glenn Humphreys and Constable Josh Presney. He said every Australian felt their deaths not only Victorians but every Australian, because we know those who wear that police uniform, wherever they do it, in where, in anywhere in the country, they stand between us and the harm that can befall any of us. The families of those police officers who serve understand this only too well. A loss during a time when we are feeling vulnerable at this point is also more sharply felt. Four police officers doing their duty, keeping the peace, enforcing the law, upholding the community's trust, keeping us safe. We honour their service. The question is the motion moved by Senator Ciccone and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, with the consent of senators, I'm going to jump around a bit now to try and facilitate the smooth operation of the chamber and deal with non-contentious matters. Um, Senator Ciccone, your motion number 546. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business not notice of motion number 546 standing in my name for today, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning building land care community and capacity grants program be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Ciccone. Mr President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts, your matter number 558, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 558 standing in my name for today relating to the PFAS task force be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, number 559 in the name of Senators Keneally and McAllister. Senator Perfect. I'll give you a moment. There's a few today. There are quite a few, Mr. President. I do have them numerically, so I've just got to Thank come you. through. Um, <clears throat> Mr. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 559, standing in the name of Senator Keneally and Senator McAllister for today, relating to the coronavirus outbreak at Newmarch House, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Rustin. Seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the Australian government acknowledges that every death from COVID-19 is a tragedy and the situation at Anglia Clare's Newmarch House in Sydney is tragic and concerning. We are aware that the Aged Care Royal Commission will be considering submissions relating to the impact of COVID-19 across the entire aged care sector. Doing anything less would not properly consider the sector's preparedness for dealing with COVID-19. It is also worth noting that the Royal Commission is independent and we are unable to compel them to consider a special investigation. 
question. Senator Urquhart. Sorry, I have done this when I moved the motion, but I also wish to add the names of Senators um, Ayres, O'Neill and Sheldon. I'll take it that leave is granted for that, and they're so added. So the question is now that motion number 559, in the names of those senators, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, number 560, in the name of Senator Wong and others. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 560, standing in the names of Senators Wong, Farrell, Mariel Smith and Gallagher for today, relating to Collins-class submarines, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none? Senator I move Urquhart. the motion. <coughs> Senator Patrick. President, I seek leave to move an amendment uh, to the motion. Leave is not granted, Senator Patrick. Mr. President, uh, um, pursuant to contingent notice of motion, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent a senator from moving an amendment to a motion. So the question now is that must be put without debate. The question is to suspend standing orders to the extent necessary to allow Senator Patrick to move an amendment to the motion in the name of Senator Wong and others. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. I only heard one voice there, Senator Patrick. Um, now, I, I'm going to offer. Do you want a division, Senator Patrick, or would you like the name of yourself and others who support your position recorded? Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells but don't lock the doors. The question is that mo um, the motion to suspend standing orders to allow Senator Patrick to move an amendment to motion number 560 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Patrick teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is eyes 5, noes 34. The matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I understand Senator Patrick is going to seek the call. He can do it so from any seat, so you do it from there if you wish, Senator Patrick. You can do it. From, you can speak from any seat. So, you, Senator Patrick, seeking the call. I'll give broadcasting a moment. I just seek leave to make a one-minute statement in relation to the motion. He is seeking leave to make a one-minute statement. You've dealt with the amendment, but you haven't dealt with the, the motion. Leave is, not, is leave granted. It's leave not is, my motion. Leave is not granted. Leave is, leave, leave is not granted, unless I'm corrected. I'll now move to. I now need to put the question on matter number five six zero, as moved by Senator Urquhart on behalf of Senators Wong and others. Um, Oh, Senator Rustin. You don't want me to make that. But that is on the motion. Yeah, no, we now we now we're on the motion. Yeah, Senator yeah. Rustin, yeah. you seek leave to make a short statement. I do. Leave is not granted. Leave is not granted, so I'm now going to put the motion. The question is that motion number five six zero be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The, okay, the ayes have it. I'm now going to go to motion number 563, Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. And before asking that general five, six, business three. notice, motion number 563 be taken as formal. I seek leave to amend, sadly, the number of women killed from 16 to 17 in the first paragraph of the motion. Um, uh, and with that amendment, uh, the leave is granted to amend. Senator Waters. Thank you, President. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion as amended, uh, number 563, standing in my name for today, relating to violence against women, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The Morrison government is committed to preventing, addressing and ultimately ending family, domestic and sexual violence in Australia. This government has made the largest ever Commonwealth investment of $340 million to support the fourth action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children, which is focused on the prevention and early intervention. An additional $150 million has been provided to prepare for and respond to any increase in domestic, family and sexual violence as a consequence of COVID-19. Delivery of frontline domestic and family violence services is a matter for the state and territory governments. 
question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, could I return to other matters? Number 540, in the name of Senator Seward. I ask that general business notice of motion number 540, standing in my name in the name of Senator Steele John for today, relating to the increased living costs for people with disabilities, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government is providing disability support pension and care payment recipients with two $750 economic support payments to provide additional support in the context of the coronavirus outbreak. The coronavirus supplement is a temporary support in recognition of the economic impact of the coronavirus pandemic, which will directly impede people's ability to find employment. Accordingly, the coronavirus supplement is payable to job seeker payment and related allowances, as people on these payments are generally expected to participate in the labour market. Pensions, including the DSP and carer payment, will continue to be paid at the highest rate of payments within the income support system when temporary measures cease. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, I seek leave to make a short statement leave to outline our voting position. Granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Labor will not be supporting this motion. However, we do have our own motion listed today calling for the government to do more to support people with a disability and carers who have increased costs by allowing them to bring forward the second $750 corona economic support payment. The question is the motion moved by Senator Seward, number 540, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Seward. I won't call a division, but could you please uh, note the Greens support of that proposal and the rest of the chamber didn't? So noted. Uh, Senator uh, Patrick. I just uh, let, let the, the chamber know that uh, Senator Alliance is supporting this motion. Thank you, Thank you Senator Patrick. Could I jump to matter number 543, Senator Faruqi? President, I ask the general business notice of motion number 543, standing in my, my name for today, relating to housing, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Senator Faruqi. Uh, Mr. President, could I please have the votes noted? Uh, so the Greens were in support of that motion in lieu of calling a division. Yes, and, and people who weren't, and the rest of the chamber. Well, uh, the, the no? assumption is, Senator Faruqi, you can have your vote recorded. Um, the assumption is the motion was not carried. I can't define others because they may not all be present in the chamber. Um, so your position is recorded in favour, and the majority of the chamber was against. Matter number 544, four. Senator Faruqi, as well, please. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators McKim, Seward, Wish Wilson, Waters, Hanson Young, Steele John, Lyons, Urquhart, Wong, Keneally, Pratt, Brown, McAllister, Ayres, Billick, Walsh, Sheldon, Carr, Watt, and Polly will also sponsor the motion. <laughs> thank you, Senator Faruqi. Um, Leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion number 544, standing in my name and the names of all the senators I just named for today, relating to the passing of Mr. Jack Mundy, AO, before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Yeah, is it leave granted to amend the motion in the terms circulated? Leave is granted. Senator Faruqi. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Mr. President, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator McCarthy or Senator Urquhart in the name of Senator McCarthy, number 545. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 545 stand in the name of Senator McCarthy for today relating to COVID-19 unemployment benefits be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. The leave is granted for one minute. The government's focus is on growing the economy to provide job opportunities so that people can move into work. Prior to the coronavirus outbreak, we saw the proportion of working age Australians reliant on payments down to their lowest levels in more than 30 years at 13.5 per cent, and unemployment was down to 5.1 per cent, with more than $1.5 million created since we came to office. We know that the best way to improve people's livelihoods is to get them back into the workforce. 
question is the mo motion number 545 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could I come to 551? It's in the name of Senator Steele, John. So I'll Senator Seawitt, potentially. Yes, it is. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry, Chair, I moved the wrong one. Um, Mr President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 551, standing in the name of Senator Steele, John, relating to myalgic encephalitis and chronic fatigue syndrome, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawood. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Seawood, could I deal with 552 in your name? Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 552 standing in my name for today relating to the job seeker payment be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Seawood. I move the motion. The question is not motion number 552 be agreed to. Those of that. Oh, sorry, Senator Gallagher. Um, thank you. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Um, Labor will not be supporting this motion. We have moved our own, which calls on the government to permanently increase the rate of job seeker payment and not to go back to the pre-coronavirus rate, which was simply too low. But it is important to note that this, this uh, proposal would mean people on job seeker payment would receive a higher base payment than people on the age pension, DSP and carer payment. The question is that motion number 552 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Could you please record the Greens' support for that oh, motion? So recorded, the Greens supported that motion. Senator Hanson, could I come to your matter number 555, please? Thank you, Mr President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion 555, standing in my name for today, relating to migration, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Hanson. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. As we continue to plan our way out of the coronavirus pandemic, this government will continue to maintain clear, consistent immigration policies that are in Australia's best interests. Senator Gallagher. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Our Labor will be opposing this motion. We will not participate in a cheap political stunt by Senator Hanson, who has cherry-picked and misquoted Senator Keneally's opinion piece. Senator Hanson ignores the fact Senator Keneally celebrated Australia's history as a nation built by permanent migrants and that Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on earth. As Senator Keneally said on ABC Radio last week, Labor rejects Senator Hanson's abhorrent views on multiculturalism. The question is, uh, Senator Lambie seeking the I request seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Jack and Lambie Network will be supporting this motion. The question is that motion number 555 in the name of Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Roberts, could I come to matter number 556 in your name, please? Thank you, Mr. President. I withdraw general business notice of motion number 556, standing in my name for today. Jack. No. Um, could we then come to matter number 557 uh, in your name as well? Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 557, standing in my name for today, relating to country of origin food labelling, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 557, standing in my name for today, relating to food labelling. Um, I haven't seen an amendment. Has it been circulated, Senator? Is it, is it a simple amendment or should it be circulated, Senator Roberts? It, it has been uh, uh, circulated as far as I know, but it, all it does is remove 3B. It's very simple. Oh, okay. So it just removes clause B out of motion number 557. So that it would be clause A and then clause C would become the new clause B. Is the Senate happy for that to be put in those terms? So the question is that that amended or I'll seek leave for the uh, that Yes, Senator Seawood. Repeat that, Senator Roberts. Sure. All right, Senator, Ro I'll, Senator Roberts is seeking leave. Then I'll, get, I'll put it in the hands of the Senate. Senator Roberts. Thank you. Remove uh, 3B. There's no, you mean Sorry. clause B? Yes. Yeah. Let me just check. Yeah. Oh, so it's actually not remove clause B. It's remove clause C2. 
Yeah, okay, nice. I don't have. Yeah, I don't have. Okay, so Senator Roberts, you want to remove the clause that refers yeah. to um, country designations? Correct. Not right. a, and misleading country designations. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, from the chair, use non-pejorative terms. Um, yep. Senator Gallagher. Can I seek leave to make a short statement? Um, can, Mr. President, could we come back to this motion? Um, we just need to take some sure. further advice. We, our our come... advice is to oppose it, but I'd like to see if that amendment changes our advice. We've got a few more to do, Senator Roberts. If you want me to come back to it later. All right. So, with the leave of the Senate, we'll come back to that at the conclusion. That's note number five five seven. Um, can we go to matter number five six four? Senator McKim. Five six four. Yes, thank you, President. I ask that general business notice of motion number five six four, standing in my name and the name of Senator Steele John for today, relating to free trade agreements, be taken as a formal Is motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator McKim. Thank you, President. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Leave is granted for one minute. Approximately one in five Australian workers are employed in a trade-related activity. Australian exporting businesses on average hire 23 per cent more staff and pay 11 per cent higher wages. Nothing in Australia's free trade agreements change Australia's workplace laws, nor do FTAs allow for the exploitation of workers. Nothing in our FTAs allows for foreign workers to work without the licensing or registration required under Australian laws. Nothing in Australia's FTAs erode our stance on environmental and human rights protections. FTAs were a major reason why, in 2019, Australia recorded our largest ever amount exported in a calendar year of more than $493 billion. The question is that motion number 564 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator McKim. Um, as other senators have done, President, if I could just ask that the Greens' obvious support for this motion yep. be recorded and the opposition of both major parties. Um, I'm not, uh, the, 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 provisions allow, the provisions allow for votes in favour. and. Um, the, the people can extrapolate from that. Does anyone else wish to have their vote, vote on that motion recorded? Senator Patrick. Lawrence would like to have uh, us recorded as supporting it. Thank you. Uh, now could I go to some matters that are a little bit more complex? Um, yes, sorry, Senator Hanson. One see Nation you. wish to have our support for that motion, please. Also recorded. Senator Lambie. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Jack Lambie Network will their support recorded as well. Thank I you. thank senators. That is a lot quicker. That is a lot quicker than a division. Could we come to matter number 541 in the name of Senator Billick? Now we're getting to an area where I do need senators to express a position if they wish to have it reflected in my call. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 541 stand in the name of Senator Billick for today relating to COVID-19 economic support for people living with disabilities be taken as a formal motion. The question is, uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Seawitt. Can I um, uh, seek leave to make a very short statement? Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, could I just explain that the Greens will be supporting this, but we do not think it replaces the fact that they should actually have access to increased payments and have access to the supplement, but of course um, anything that helps people with disability and carers we uh, will support. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Could we go to matter number 547, please, in the name of Senator Rice. Senator Rice, I'll give you a moment to get to a microphone. I ask that general business notice of motion number 547, standing in my name for today, relating to active transport infrastructure, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rice. Mr. President, I move the motion. Senator Rustin. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, the Australian government is currently investing record levels of funding into infrastructure across the country, partnering with states and territories and local governments. Our investments cover hundreds of major land transport projects which are developed and designed with consideration for active transport provisions as part of the scope of these projects. Projects such as the, gate, uh, the Gateway Motorway upgrade in Queensland, the Northern Connector in Adelaide, are examples of where the Australian government has provided funding for active transport initiatives. The Australian government also provides opportunity through a range of funding programs for organisations and local government bodies, which can be used to fund specific active transport projects, uh, with many funded over the past few years. 
question is that motion number 547 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Don't lock the doors, but stop the bells. The question is that motion number 547, in the name of Senator Rice, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart, tell her for the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 26, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the negative. I ask senators to remain in the chamber for imminent divisions. Could we now come to matter number 549 in the name of Senator Pratt? Senator, I'll give you a moment. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 549, standing in the name of Senator Pratt, for today relating to the JobKeeper program, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government's $130 billion JobKeeper program provides unprecedented support to millions of Australians. Eligibility has focused on maximising the reach of the JobKeeper program while ensuring the program is able to be implemented as quickly and as efficiently as possible while remaining sustainable. The question is that motion number 549 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. The, the, the aye division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four, oh, sorry, ring the bells for four minutes at the request of the whips.
Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 549 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The matter is therefore negative. Again, I ask senators to remain in the chamber. We will now come to matter number 553 in the name of Senator Keneally and others. And I'll give Senator Urquhart a moment to return to her pile of motions. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 553, standing the names of Senators Keneally, Shikoni and Walsh for today, relating to Australian citizenship ceremonies, be taken as a formal motion. Any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. This motion once again lacks the attention to detail needed to manage this complex area of policy. 8,000 people have been conferred citizenship in online ceremonies conducted to date, with more than 750 people having been conferred in this way every single day. Already in 2019-20, more than 166,000 people have acquired Australian citizenship. On 6 April 2020, the Acting Minister for Immigration, Citizenship, Migrant Services and Multicultural Affairs made a clear statement outlining the process for online citizenship ceremonies. A dedicated link is available through the Home Affairs website, covid.homeaffairs.gov.au. The question is the motion number 553 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Four minute bell. All right, ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that motion number 553 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell if the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Could I come to matter number 554 in the name of Senator Gallagher and others? Senator Urquhart handling that? Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion No. 554, standing in the names of Senators Gallagher, Wong, Farrell and Mario Smith for today, relating to aviation security, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Good question is Senator Rustin. I'll, I'll go to Senator Patrick first, then I'll come to Senator Rustin. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move an amendment to this motion. Uh, is leave granted to move the amendment? Leave is granted. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr. President, I move the amendment as circulated. The question, is, the question now is the amendment as circulated in the name of Senator Patrick to motion number 554 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. The noes have it. I'll now come to Senator Rustin, who is seeking the call on the original unamended motion. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Keeping Australian communities safe from those who seek to do us harm and will continue to be the Morrison government's number one priority. The Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Control Airports Regulation delivers on recommendations of the Inspector of Transport Security to strengthen security at Australia's airports, and particularly those serving rural and regional communities. Regional airports are being supported through the government's $50.1 million regional airport security screening fund. The government has announced more than $1.2 billion in funding to support the aviation industry, including keeping regional communities connected since the 18th of March 2020. These enhancements to regional aviation security and our commitment to funding to regional airlines and airports underscores the government's commitment to supporting regional communities and the aviation networks in which they depend. Question is at motion number Senator Patrick. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Mr. President, this uh, uh, Labor's motion is just a smokescreen uh, to distract uh, uh, people from understanding that, that, that Labor have rolled over to Minister Dutton in not supporting my motion to disallow the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Controlled Airports Regulation. Disallowance would force the government to address the disastrous uh, uh, cost its new security regime will impose on small regional airports to the detriment of regional communities. Senator Keneally doesn't like Mr Dutton, but it's also clear she and her Labor colleagues uh, are scared of him. They're scared of that he'll portray them as weak on national security issues. But if they were to have some courage and were committed to both uh, security and regional Australia, Labor would help to force the minister's hand so that we can get sensible cost-sharing arrangements in place. They're all bark and not a lot of bite. 
Question is that motion number 554 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Can I put that again? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The question is that motion number sorry, stop the bells. The question is that motion number five five four be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell of the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell of the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 27, noes 27. The matter is therefore negatived. There are three matters remaining, Senators. I will now go to motion number 542 in the names of Senators Van and Dean Smith. Senator Van. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I advise that Senator Hughes has added her name to the motion. I ask that the general business uh, business notice of motion number 542 relating to COVID-19 and racist behaviour, standing in my name and the names of Senators Dean Smith and Hughes, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Van. I move the motion. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion. Is leave granted? Uh, uh, leave, is, leave is granted. Senator um, Urquhart. The amendment has been circulated in the chamber. I move the amendment, so the amendment as circulated. The question is the amendment as circulated, moved by Senator Urquhart, to motion number 542 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. No. Senator Gallagher. Can we uh, record that the our Labor Party supported the amendment, amendment moved by Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Anyone else wish to have their vote recorded? Senator Hanson? I'll give the moment, the broadcasting a moment to turn you on, Senator Hanson. Senator Hanson? One Nation opposes the amendment. Thank you, Senator Hanson. So we now go to the motion as originally moved. I, I thought I might have a request to separate it. Yes, yeah, Senator Urquhart? Yes. Um, could I ask that the that we vote separately yep. on? Sorry, I'm just looking for the sections um, on A through to D yep. and E separately. Okay. Thank you. So I will put clauses A to D, A, B, C, and D on block for motion 542. Those in support of those clauses, sorry. sorry. Okay. Sorry, Senator Gallagher. I'm, I'm putting clauses A, B, C, and D on block on 542. Those in support of those clauses say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now put separately clause E of that motion. Those in support of that clause say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Gallagher. Uh, Labor's voting position on that. Uh, it recorded that Labor voted uh, against, against clause E. Anyone else? Senator McKim. Greens are in opposition. Uh, I'd like that recorded. So Senator President. McKim has recorded the two, Greens is voting against e. clause E. Only clause E. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to matter number 562. In the names of Senators Dinatale and Faruqi. Senator Seward, are you moving that? No, Senator Dinatale. If I'll give him a moment to get to his seat. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Griff will also co-sponsor the motion. Uh, I ask the General Business Notice of Motion Number 562, standing in my name and the names of Senator Faruqi and Griff for today, relating to marginalisation of ethnically diverse communities, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Di Natale. Thank you, Mr President. I move the motion. Senator Urquhart. Um, thank you, Mr President. I request that the question be put separately on paragraph uh, D 2 and 3. Um, so that's D sure. 2 and 3. So, uh, yep, we've got that. Senator Rustin. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. The government condemns racism in the strongest possible forms, particularly in the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, paragraph 4B of this motion calls for a Charter of Rights. This is a proposal that has been publicly debated and for good reasons, including diminishing democratic decision-making and politicising the judiciary, and after full public debate, randomly rejected. It is not supported by the government because it is not the best way to project Australia rights in Australia. The provision further equates racism and visa status, which is an entirely false equivalence. The government also considers paragraph 4C is incorrect. The paragraph calls for hate speech to the criminal code. It fails to recognise that section 82A and 80.2B already criminalise the urging of violence against groups and against members of groups. For those reasons, this motion cannot be endorsed. 
Senator Gallagher. Just seek leave to make a short statement about Labor's voting. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you. Uh, as outlined by Senator Urquhart, and we have asked that this um, question be voted on separately, um, the, we don't support uh, subsection D. We don't believe that expanding the criminal code, which already criminalises incitement to violence, or establishing a charter for access to government services provide effective means to combat racism. What we need is for every member of this parliament to lead by example in rejecting racism and encouraging mutual respect. So, The question is that all of the motion, except clauses D2 and D3, all of the motion except D2 and D3 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. On that basis, I don't think I can put the next vote because it would stand alone and not make sense uh, without the covering clause. So the last matter, Senator Dinatale. I just want to record, just uh, to save the uh, yep. Another division that uh, obviously the Greens uh, support all aspects of that motion. motion. Yep. Uh, does anyone else wish to have a position recorded? Yes, Senator Gallagher. Would like our position recorded on the sections of the motion we supported, uh, which is the first vote we just That's had. That's right. Senator Griff. The Senator Alliance uh, supports the original motion. Senator Hanson. One Nation um, opposes the full motion. Senator Lambie. Jackie Lambie Net Network opposes the full motion. Thank you. It's still a lot quicker than a division. Um, I will move to the final matter, which Senator Roberts is a return to the matter we deferred earlier of your motion number 557. <laughs> Senator Roberts, with the amendment in 557 that I believe, if you could take us through the amendment again verbally. It is to remove clause C2. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so you are seeking leave to amend the motion to remove yes. clause C2. That's correct. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Roberts. Thank I you, Mr. President. I move the motion. I take it you have amended the, the motion Sorry. and you move it in those terms. Yes. Um, I can't remember if we sought formality before, but I'll put first. We did. Okay, so that motion is now being moved in that form. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. I heard a no on my left. I heard a single no, uh, but it represented more than one vote. Um, I'll put it again. Those in support of the amended motion number 557 say aye. To the contrary, no. All right, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Unless I've missed one, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I thank senators. Oh, Senator Rustin. A statement in relation to motion, notice of motion 560, the Collins class submarines. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. So table, Senator Rustin. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 today, six proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter was received from Senator Roberts. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. When Australia restarts our migration program, we do not want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis. I understand. Um, is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific time to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I recognise that for 230 years, migrants of many races and religions, amazing people from all over the world, have joined us to build our beautiful country into something greater than when they arrived. Now, though, we may be ending 2020 with 1.2 million Australians out of work 
and 1.2 million temporary visas. For 20 years, Senator Hanson has warned that this day would come. In 2016, the Productivity Commission issued its 700-page warning on the imbalance in our immigration policy. Their report questioned our high immigration intake's strain on infrastructure, the environment and quality of life in our capital cities. The government ignored the Productivity Commission. Why? To keep the flood of cut price workers coming in and to hide the data showing a per capita recession. That led to a long-term pain on infrastructure, housing, wages, state budgets. The inevitable result of that is high unemployment and more underemployment. Many of these un unemployed Australians are migrants who came to contribute their labour, yet now languish on job seeker benefits they don't want instead of going to the job they do want. I congratulate one of my Labor colleagues on finally seeing the light and joining us in speaking up on the issue of excessive migration and foreign workers. People might not be aware that on the 3rd of May, in a Sydney Morning Herald opinion piece, Senator Keneally asked, quote, do we want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis? Senator Keneally's answer was no. The question now is, will Senator Keneally stand by her words and will the Labor Party stand by their shadow immigration minister? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. We know that the current coronavirus crisis has changed many things about our economy. And one of the most dramatic changes we've seen is indeed our migration rate. Right now, our migration is almost zero because this government acted quickly to close our borders to limit the number of coronavirus cases coming into the country. Net overseas migration is expected to drop 30 per cent in 2019-20 and 85 per cent in 2020-21 from 2018-19 levels due to closed borders. Clearly, there is going to be a long period of time in which migration is going to be significantly reduced. And as the Prime Minister has said, there is no likelihood of international travel to Australia resuming in the near future. That will have major impacts on many parts of our economy. And looking at how we can support and rebuild industries affected by the cancellation of international travel will be key to Australia's economic recovery. Tourism, for example, is one of the most important industries that has been affected by this, uh, turning over $45 billion a year. Uh, and that has been incredibly badly affected as an industry by the coronavirus crisis and, of course, um, indirectly as a result of the reduced migration rate. The tourism industry and the hundreds of thousands of Australians that it employs will need visitors to be able to come to Australia when international travel is again safe and possible, and we will welcome that occurring when the appropriate time comes. Another industry that has been significantly impacted by the reduction in migration uh, as a result of coronavirus, of course, is agriculture. Agriculture is a tr key driver of the Australian economy and one which the Morrison government is strongly supporting. It's also a critical component of ensuring Australia's food security. Working holiday makers are an essential part of Australia's agricultural industries and indeed an essential part of the tourism industry, which I just mentioned earlier. These working holiday ma makers are critical to filling short-term workforce, workforce pardon me, shortages in rural and regional areas, and they also inject over $3 billion into our economy each year. And certainly coming from Tasmania, um, a state with a thriving tourism industry and a thriving agriculture industry, I am very uh, alive to the impact that these working holiday makers have on our local economy. We know working holidaymakers who travel to Australia stay longer, spend more and travel further into regional areas than most other international visitors. That's why we've recently made enhancements to uh, and indeed increased the numbers of places in the work and holiday visa program to better support rural and regional areas. Of course, ideally, we want Australians filling Australian jobs 
But when this isn't possible, farmers and other employers need to have a workforce available so they can continue their business. Uh, and again, as I say, in Tasmania, that is certainly um, my experience in my own state, uh, talking to people, particularly within the agricultural and tourism industries, uh, they appreciate having the ability to draw upon working holidaymakers if they are not able to get, uh, indeed, locals into to jobs. So there needs to be a balance here. But that being said, obviously at the moment we know it's difficult for these industries uh, without having access to uh, migrant workforce as a result of the coronavirus crisis. As I said, we'll see an 85 per cent reduction on current uh, modelling to migration to Australia uh, in the next financial year as a result of the borders uh, having to effectively close due to coronavirus. The coalition has been consistent and we have been clear about our approach to managing the integrity and the order of our migration program. It is clarity and consistency that allows businesses and individuals to plan for the future, and I certainly expect that we will see this clarity and this consistency continue in the future as we move to uh, hopefully one day uh, begin to open up our borders again and enable further migration. Conversely, Labor's inconsistency, division and history of mismanagement of the migration program uh, has been on display as evidenced by some of the commentary we've heard recently. Their shambolic, uncoordinated approach that changes almost daily demonstrates they didn't learn anything from their mistakes in government and can't be trusted to manage our Thank migration program. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, when my parents came to Australia, uh, in the late 1960s, they were part of, uh, I guess, an enormous wave of arrivals who would go on to contribute greatly to the foundations of our nation's economic prosperity. In these times, people knew that they could come to Australia in search of a better life. They could put down the roots, raise a family, seek new opportunities and make their new home a better place. And at the centre of all this was the certainty that permanency provided. As a result, Australia has become one of the world's most, if not the successful, migrant nation. Around one third of all Australians were born overseas, and around half of our population are the children and grandchildren of migrants. The majority of Australians know that this is a good thing, and that our multicultural society makes us a better and stronger. But owing to the policy changes first initiated in the early 2000s uh, by the Den Howard government and laid entrenched over the last seven years by this government, our migration program unfortunately has started to shift, shifting from predominantly based on um, permanency in favour of a more temporary form of migration. And I guess that's sort of the heart of the debate on, on which me and a number of other colleagues in this place have, uh, have uh, made commentary in recent times. There are many hundreds of thousands of temporary visa holders here in Australia, and we are host to the second largest temporary migrant workforce in the developed world. Temporary migration will always have a place in any modern economy, but it is important that we are carefully examining what that place ought to look like here in Australia. And as the chair of the Senate Select Committee on Temporary Migration, that's exactly what I and my Senate colleagues on that committee will be looking at. Uh, the terms of reference of our inquiry has tasked that we investigate the temporary migration in Australia and the effect that it has on the Australian economy, its wages and jobs, as well as the so social cohesion and workplace rights and conditions of Australian workers. It also makes specific reference to whether permanent residency and permanent migration offers better outcomes to both Austra to the Australian economy and our community. And I am pleased to say that so far we've received over 70 submissions from members of the public, policy experts, industry groups um, and unions, and that they have all made for interesting reading. And I do encourage people to continue providing the committee with submissions. We've heard how the current system can leave temporary visa workers vulnerable to abuse and exploitation that it can erode wages for workers and allow anti-competitive business behaviours to go unchecked. Now, I've experienced this firsthand as an official with the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association 
before entering this place, I represented hundreds of 7-Eleven workers, many of them being temporary visa workers. As they sought compensation for the wage theft and blackmail many had been subjected to. In some instances, workers were paid between $7 and $10 an hour. I met a young foreign student who was making as little as $5, and in some cases their employers used their visa status, their temporary visa status, to keep them silent and prevent them from reporting the exploitation that they endured. Now, these are matters, among many others, that the Senate Select Committee is seeking to inquire and will provide a report back here in the Senate. Temporary migration impacts a wide range of industries. And, uh, as my colleague on the, on the other side, uh, Senator Chandler, had pointed out, uh, you know, hospitality and, and, uh, and farming, agriculture are certainly just some areas that we'll no doubt be looking into. Temporary visa workers don't just pick fruit. One in five are chefs, one in four are cooks, one in six are hospitality workers, and one in ten provide nursing support and personal care, and they all hold a temporary visa. The inquiry will put focus on important questions. We will ask our fellow Australians if we want to create and profit from an economic underclass whether we want to stop people working in Australia from putting down roots and raising a family, as my parents did. But when they came here, they were temporary migrants, but now very proud Australians. From starting a business, creating ties with neighbours and the community, through sport, schools, churches and local groups. The list just keeps going on. Migrants, whether they are permanent or temporary, do make a, an, an enormous contribution to our society here in Australia. Labor understands the benefits of a well-regulated migration program, particularly for skilled workers. But do we as Australians, as the people of a fair society in which a growing proportion are permanently locked out of getting a go? I know firsthand the opportunities Australia can offer many people looking for a better life. I've lived that experience. I know what my parents, their family, friends and the community go back to this great country. One of the greatest pleasures each of us has as representatives of our community is welcoming new Australian citizens when they take their pledge of citizenship. And I must say that has been one of the best highlights of my job in the last 18 months. It's a moment of joy and one I want to continue to be, a to be available to those who Thank choose you. to make Australia their home. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I did ponder a bit on whether, to, whether speaking on this motion was worth it, because it clearly seeks to divide us. But to be honest, I have had it up to here with One Nation, so I will have my say. This motion is just another way for them to define who should be in Australia, who is deemed as one of us, and who is deemed as the other because of what they look like or where they come from. And let me make one thing crystal clear. When One Nation talks about changing composition of our migration program, we know, we know what you mean. It's not simply a technical Order. or abstract debate about temporary versus permanent migration, or skilled workers versus family reunion. For One Nation, the party of the Muslim ban, and decades of overt racism, it is about something else entirely. Just two years ago, the former senator Senator Anning, who was elected as a One Nation senator, said the quiet part aloud in his widely condemned first speech, calling for a migration program that reflects the historic European Christian composition of Australian society. That senator, thankfully, is gone, but unfortunately, One Nation is still here. If you had your way, I would have never been allowed in this country that I call home, let alone sit in this parliament and the Senate chamber. Shame on you. For all your talk about supporting good migrants who speak perfect English and assimilate completely, you would rather we just go back to the white Australia policy. Well, we are not going back to white Australia. And it's not just one nation sitting here relentlessly pursuing their agenda of racism and xenophobia, but it's also the Liberals sitting over there and the Labour Party sitting over there who must cop blame as well. 
The Liberals have for years targeted and fanned the flames of hatred, from targeting the Sudanese community to Lebanese Muslim migrants to asylum seekers and refugees. And the Labour Party's hands are dirty as well, with its continuous dog-whistling Australian first rhetoric. This posturing and rhetoric normalizes and gives oxygen to one nation's racism and xenophobia. It hurts and damages us. We are not here as fodder for your inherent biases and white supremacy that you want to exert. We are proud, upstanding citizens of this country, and we work hard to make Australia a better place. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Just let Senator Scar get to the lectern. Senator Scar, please. Well, Mr Acting Deputy President, the first thing I'd like to note is that the wording of this resolution comes from an article which was written by Senator Keneally. Now, the contributions we've heard so far from both my friend Senator Ciccone and Senator Faruqi did not mention that, did not explicitly recognise that the origin of this resolution comes from the wording of the article, Christine Keneally's article, Senator Keneally's article in, in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 3rd of May 2020. So just as Senator Wong had to go in on Q&A on a Monday night and put the pieces together after Senator Keneally's article. Now, poor old Senator Ciccone has to turn up in the chamber and put, put the pieces together for the Labor Party after Senator Keneally's article. But at least be honest with this chamber. At least be honest with this chamber that the specific wording in this resolution comes from Senator Keneally's article, from her article. Those are her words. I have read the article from front to start. They are her words. Now, I'd just like to uh, make three points uh, in the time I have available in this debate. The first point I'd like to make is, Senator Ciccone, it's good to hear that you're having an inquiry into uh, temporary migration. It would have been a good thing through the uh, acting deputy president if Senator Keneally, as the spokesperson for the opposition, might have waited for the inquiry to take, uh, to take full effect and actually come up with some findings before she wrote her article. But can I put to you that when you're considering your, uh, your inquiry, you might look at a CEDA, um, C -E -D -A, the Committee for Economic Development of Australia report on the effects of temporary migration, which was released in July of last year, 2019, after the much quoted Productivity Commission report, and it had two key findings. First, contrary to some concerns, recent waves of migrants have not had an adverse impact on the wages or jobs of, of Australian-born workers. That was the first finding. Second finding was temporary skilled migration has been an overwhelming net positive for the Australian economy, enabling skill shortages to be filled and contributing to the transfer of new knowledge to Australians. Neither of those points were referred to in Senator Keneally's article, but I do commend through uh, you, Acting Deputy President, to the work of Senator Ciccone's committee that they might have a look at that research report. You'll find it very enlightening. Second point I'd like to make, and this point was made by Senator Chandler, the importance of temporary migration in relation to Queensland agriculture's industry. And during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, I received a copy of a letter from the Australian Banana Growers Council, Inc., urgently seeking changes with respect to temporary visa arrangements. And what they said in this letter was this. The banana industry harvests and packs 52 weeks per year. There are 5,325 workers nationally, approximately 40 per cent are locals and 60 per cent are either backpackers, e.g. on 417 or 462 visas, or from the seasonal worker program on 403 visas. And in response to that urgent request that these temporary visa holders have their stays extended so they could assist the Queensland agriculture industry. The government, the government acted, and the government acted in two ways: seasonal worker program and Pacific Labor Scheme workers, an important part of our Pacific Step Up policy, could extend their stay for up to 12 months to work for approved employers. And secondly, working holiday makers who work in agricultural food processing 
were to be exempt from the six-month work limitation with the one employer and eligible for a further visa to keep working in these critical sectors if their current visa is due to expire in the next six months. And that just shows, even during the course of this pandemic, how important some of those seasonal temporary visa workers are to the economy of my state of Queensland. The last point I'd like to make is this afternoon I had a call with a great fellow who's the uh, councillor of Baloo Shire in South West Queensland. And his name's uh, uh, John Ferguson. And I gave him a call because I saw a quote uh, he gave about the importance of attracting immigrants to country, to country towns like Thargaminda. And I just want to leave, conclude my uh, uh, contribution to this debate with his words. This is uh, Shire Mayor John Ferguson of Thargaminda. He wants more people in his town. It is not looking at who you are or what colour you are. You are out there with us and you are part of us and we are going to welcome Thank you out there. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I'm proud to be part of a political party, the Labor Party, which recognises and values the contribution that migrants make to Australia. We are a party that has stood strongly for multiculturalism and stood strongly against racism. Australia is the most successful multicultural nation on the planet. Half of us were either born overseas ourselves or have a parent born overseas. And we can be so proud of the role that migration has played in our past and be sure of the important role it will play in our future. It is a vital building block of our society and the public agree. 85 per cent of Australians believe that multiculturalism has been good for Australia. So, like the vast majority of Australians, I am incredibly proud of our country and the strength that we have in our diversity. I have spent my working life representing some of Australia's lowest paid migrant workers in sectors like cleaning, hospitality and farms. I visited migrants in their workplaces. I visited them at their homes. I've stood with them when they've spoken out about the rampant exploitation that they've experienced in these industries. I've listened to them talk about their hopes and dreams for a better life in this country. Uh, and this is what I've heard. I've heard that the hopes and dreams of migrant workers today are the very same hopes and dreams of all Australians, be they First Nations Australians, fourth or fifth generation Australians, or Australians who've migrated from all over the world in the decades since World War II. Those hopes and dreams are a good, secure job, to be able to settle down and have a family, a community, to be safe, secure and supported, and to make a contribution back to the society that welcomed you. Australia's shift from permanent to temporary migration without adequate protections for migrant workers and without adequate paths to permanence has put those basic fundamental hopes and dreams on hold for so many migrants to this country. Our temporary migration program invites people here not to build a life but just to contribute their labour. Our temporary migration program cannot be said to be delivering that most basic hope of generations of migrants to this country, a good, secure job. Because in so many cases, it is temporary migrants who are suffering the most in the absolute shame that is the widespread endemic wage theft in our country. It is international students in the cleaning industry who are so often forced onto sham contracts well below the Australian minimum wage. It is backpackers and students who are working on farms and in hospitality and facing extreme rip-offs. Wages on farms are as low as just a few dollars an hour. Sexual harassment, coercion and assault have all been reported widely. And in hospitality, I've seen wages as low as $12 an hour for migrant workers. Uh, and it is also workers on temporary skilled visas who were ripped off too in the most extraordinary and brutal ways. Earlier this year, I met three women who came here on skilled migration visas who were locked in a house in Canberra and forced to work in a massage parlour. 
Their families back home in the Philippines were threatened with violence if they spoke out, and eventually they had the courage to do just that. Our temporary migration program invites people here not to settle down and have a family, a community, but to just work harder and harder to get by, to put up with the often unlawful wages and working conditions, the lack of respect and, in so many cases, the outright exploitation. And our temporary migration program invites people here not to be safe and secure, but to be afraid. Too often, temporary migrants are afraid to speak out because they fear being fired. They fear being reported to immigration. They fear not being able to survive in this country, away from home, without the job that they have. And at the first sign of crisis, this government has said to hundreds of thousands of temporary migrants, it's time for you to just go home. We won't support you here. And what is extraordinary is that despite all of this, every single temporary migrant worker that I've ever met wants to make a contribution back to this country. They work hard, they pay their taxes, and they want to be respected for their contribution. To be clear, it is not the fault of the temporary migrant workers who come to this country that they are treated like this. It is our responsibility as the host nation to make sure that migrant workers are treated with the respect that they deserve. It is up to employers to stop the exploitation of temporary migrant workers. Indeed, it is up to all of us to make sure that employers are treating them fairly, with dignity and in line with the rules. And it's not just the temporary migrant workers who lose out from this exploitation, because an attack on these workers is an attack on the rights of every worker in this country. We are and we remain the most successful multicultural society in the world, and our success has been built on the invitation to build a life here, to be able to work and be respected, to lay down roots to have family and community and to be safe and secure. And right now, our temporary migration program fails too many migrants who just want what we all want here, a secure future. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, how curious that not one Labor senator who's spoken to this motion has acknowledged the elephant in the room that was revealed by Senator Scar in his contribution moments ago, that the terms of this motion put forward by One Nation are lifted directly from the Australian Labor Party's new migration policy revealed by Senator Keneally in a recent op-ed. Well, to Senator Keneally and to the Australian Labor Party, how proud you must be of your new migration policy that now has the backing of One Nation. Labor got the front page treatment with uh, Senator Keneally's op-ed in uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, and that op-ed told migrant workers exactly what you think of them. And now, bang, in comes One Nation to support you. Well, Labor blew the whistle, and now the dogs are barking. And no one should be surprised at that. This is exactly what the Labor Party wanted. It wanted a unity ticket with One Nation to demonise migrant workers, and that is exactly what the Labor Party has got. The Labor Party's stance since the election has been nothing short of shameful, but we shouldn't be surprised. Because back in 2013, it was the Australian Labor Party in government that restarted offshore detention that resulted in thousands of innocent human beings, men, women and children, being indefinitely detained on Manus Island and Nauru. And we all know the death, the human suffering, the torture, the human misery that is still going on today because of that shameful decision made by the Australian Labor Party. And if that's not bad enough, Labor is now, more recently, attacking people seeking asylum in this country by describing them as airplane people. Well, I've got a 
lesson for the Australian Labor Party based on human history. It's very dangerous to try and outflank fascists and human right ab rights abusers from the right. But that is exactly what the Australian Labor Party is doing. You've decided to focus on demonising migrants instead of focusing on the real issues in this country, which are in fact the need to improve workers' rights and to curb the power of unscrupulous employers. Those are the issues that the Labor Party should, have been, should be focusing on. You can't hope to improve the lot of workers in Australia by kicking down on temporary visa holders. You cannot hope to protect migrant workers by deporting them or seeking to prevent others from arriving in this country. Labor is strengthening the cause of Minister Dutton and One Nation here and making life more difficult for migrants and temporary visa holders. The Labor Party needs to get with the program, start pushing to help all workers no matter where they come from. And they could start by committing to strengthen the Fair Work Act so that workers have more bargaining power. Maybe for once in Labor's recent history it could actually start opposing what the government is trying to do rather than dog whistling and seeking to lie down with one nation on the issue of migration policy in this country. I hope the Labor Party is ashamed of itself today. Senator Davey. Thank you. Um, thank you. I rise. I'm standing before you. I'm the daughter of a migrant. I'm like 49 per cent of Australians who are either migrants themselves or children of a first generation Australian. So I cannot support this motion at all. I agree with Senator McKim. This motion fails to look at the real issues that we should be talking about. And one of those real issues is how do we actually incentivise people to take the jobs that many of these migrants are taking in regional Australia. And when I say that, I don't mean they're stealing our jobs because they're not. They are coming here and voluntarily taking positions that are vacant right across rural and regional Australia. And without these migrants, our regional economies would be devastated. People in old age homes in regional areas wouldn't have carers. The cooks, the one in what did Senator Hanson and Senator Keneally have said, one in five chefs that are migrants? Well, I bet those one in five are actually working in a restaurant in regional Australia. And without them, it would be a very different place out there. Because I'm very pleased to hear Senator Ciccone and Senator Walsh stand up and support migration. Because, like Senator McKim and like Senator Scar, I wasn't sure what Labor would say after reading Senator Keneally's opinion piece. And, and looking at where their concerns are, and Senator Keneally's concerns largely about temporary migration and temporary migrants, these are the very people who live and work in regional Australia taking positions that have been languishing, that have been vacant. Because don't forget, it's this government that bought in the labour test, labour market test, so that employers can't just go and seek cheap overseas labour. Employers must prove that they can't source labour here on shore before they can apply for a temporary skilled visa. And I'm glad that they can do that. Senator Keneally, in her opinion piece, didn't say anything about how you actually get Australians to take the jobs that she thinks we should now prioritise for only for Australians. And I haven't heard a solution to that from Senator Hanson either. I've heard nothing about the importance of temporary migration in regional Australia from 
the Labor Party, or from One Nation. And I'm, I'm here. I just, I just want to paint the picture to help Senator Keneally and Senator Hanson understand and learn a bit more about regional Australia, because there are many employers out there who have tried but can't. Regional Development Australia, Murray, used to run a, a temporary migration uh, ad advisory service, and they used to get about 250 applications a year from their area alone seeking skilled migrants. These people fill positions such as nurses, such as aged care workers, such as doctors. I live regionally and without skilled migration I wouldn't have been able to have seen a doctor in my own town for several years. I should also add that the, the, the nationals in government have also introduced two new regional visas for skilled workers, which actually require them to come to regional Australia for three years before they can apply for permanent residence. And it works, because once you come to regional Australia, once you see how good regional Australia is, you are more inclined to stay there. And that's one thing that we are doing to incentivise new migrants to settle outside of our big and congested cities. Now, when we have migration, it's really important that it goes to the areas which need it most. This matter of public interest raised today does not understand and gets the issue of migration wrong. Migrants, particularly working holiday makers, are absolutely vital. We have heard issues where in the Northern Territory, if we don't have seasonal holiday my, uh, visa holders and working holiday makers, and these are people, they, they're not permanent migrants, admittedly, they are here visiting our nation, spending money in our nation, but also helping us get our food and our produce harvested and onto our supermarket shelves. We've found examples where working holiday makers who fill short-term shortages, particularly in these rural and regional areas, inject over three billion into our economy each year. They stay longer, they spend more and they travel further, and that is all good for our economy. We are working to get our working holiday program right. It's something we're committed to. And in the face of this COVID crisis, we have worked hard to extend visas for those who are already in the nation so that we can ensure that we keep uh, people able to do our harvest jobs, able to work in the agricultural sector, able to work and fill those vacancies so that we can keep our business going. Because bear in mind, at the moment, our migration is currently zero in the face of COVID. And it's having a devastating impact on our economy. And we look at, let's look at where our migration numbers go. 47% of our migration numbers in 2018-19 were international students. Does anyone seriously want to put 240,000 jobs at risk by slashing that $37 billion industry? We are already seeing, due to COVID, the devastating impact the loss of these international students is having on our regional universities. In fact, the Charles Sturt University has put a number on it. It could be as high as $80 million a year impact on that university's bottom line, and that has a flow-on impact on the capacity of our universities to undertake vital research programs. 22 per cent of our net overseas migration are visitors to, regional, and to, to Australia, and this includes regional Australia. That's a $45 billion a year industry. And 12 per cent are skilled migrants, 
And these are people who come here to fill the vacancies, who have the skills we need, who work significantly in regional Australia. They fill critical skills gaps right across the Australian workforce. Now, the Liberals and the Nationals in government are taking a sens sensible approach to migration. We have capped migration at 160,000. It is a cap, not a target. But it's also a responsible and realistic figure. And we are, as I said before, we're focusing more and more on skilled migration. And we've introduced the new regional visas to ensure that we get people out of our cities into the bush, and we hope that they stay there. Since the new temporary skills shortage program commenced, which replaced the shambolic and often abused 457 visa program, we've actually seen salaries increase. We've seen a $15,000 higher average remuneration compared to what was being paid under the 457 program. And again, it was the Liberals and Nationals who've implemented the labour market test to ensure that they are actually filling a genuine skills shortage rather than uh, being the cheap labour that this motion is accusing Australian employers of undertaking. Thank you. Senator Sheldon. And, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, we are a migrant nation. More than half our population growth since 2005 has come from migration. High levels of immigration, especially skilled migration, help sustain Australia's 28 years of uninterrupted economic growth. We wouldn't have the Snowy Hydro or even the Opera House without migration. Migrants have come here to contribute to our country and have made their homes and lives here. But there is a big difference between an economy and a nation built on a properly managed permanent migration scheme and one that is dependent on piecemeal temporary migration. Because if we are not careful, this powerful, unifying, uplifting national idea will soon be nostalgia rather than reality. Under this Liberal government, we are changing from a nation built by permanent migrants to an economy built on temporary migrants. This government has used temporary migration to undercut the value of, permanent, of the permanent scheme. Before Howard, Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison, in fact for nearly 70 years, our immigration department actually managed the selection, arrival and settlement of migrants and refugees in Australia. As James Button wrote in 2018, we had a model of managed migration. The department arranged English classes and access to health care and welfare. It helped people to find housing, schools and jobs, to learn how to become a good citizen. And what do we have now? Well, we have permanent migration capped at 160,000 a year as a so-called congestion busting measure. But at the same time, temporary migration is soaring to historically high levels. Under Peter Dutton and Scott Morrison, the government couldn't care less about how migrants cope when they arrive on our shores. It's either too expensive or it's too hard to figure it out. And instead of investing properly in permanent migration, which brought us economic and social success, the government has lazily lapsed into a dependency on temporary migration. Now, where has that landed us? Well, for one thing, we have created an economic underclass of people with no stake or say in our country's future. These are people who have faced appalling conditions, but who don't have the right to vote out the very government who created the conditions for their exploitation. Instead of a managed process, we have the government turning its back while workers are sent to dodgy labour hire companies and businesses. That's the beginning and end of the migration process and any chance migrants have at a viable, secure economic future in our country. 
These workers are forced to accept pay as low as $4 an hour, often physical or sexual assault, extortionate costs for food and accommodation, and curtailed movement through the withholding of their passports. And all this has come up in report after report, as Senator Ciccone highlighted before. And all this does is undermine the hard-won conditions and pay of every other worker in this country, as well as the work of the good employers, because the good employers, the ones who do the right thing by paying the right wages and ensuring the right conditions for their workers, are now at a competitive disadvantage. The ongoing wage theft inquiry has received several submissions that include stories of this system's true impact on the lives of these workers. These submissions reveal that its very insecurity of temporary migration and this government's reliance on it has created the conditions for rampant migrant worker exploitation. Nor is it more evident than in the way that temporary visa status is used as a tool by unscrupulous employers across a variety of sectors in the economy to abuse, coercion and, denigrate, and to denigrate migrant workers. They are only forced to accept exploitive, unsafe and illegal conditions and remuneration because employers exploit their insecure status. What is worse is that the government has known about this exploitation long before the current debate. In 2014, we had the independent review and integrity into the subclass 457 program, chaired by John Azaris, with a power panel of eminently qualified experts. And what did they tell us? It told us that a lack of monitoring and sanctions for employers who exploit temporary migrant workers was leading to the whole system being undermined. I commend the Azaris report to all of you who have an interest in this subject to read it. Then there was the report of the government's own migrant worker task force, chaired by Professor Alan Fells and Professor David Cousins. A report that correctly describes in horrific detail the state of abuse of migrant workers. But again, this government has made it clear that it's not a priority for them, because it's not being glacially slow to act on the report's very sensible recommendations. Workers should and will continue to come to Australia in search of an economic future. But this government is completely mismanaging that process at the expense of these workers and our economy. They're letting exploited labor companies that exploit labour decide who comes to this country. Instead of the economic security, paying conditions and workplace rights that have embodied an Australian dream that is so attractive to migrants, the government has created the conditions for abuse and exploitation. Temporary migration workers are in turn being used by this government to undercut the wages and conditions that make our country such a great place to work and live in the first place. Australian companies that are exploiting migrant workers, companies in this country, should not be making the decision on who comes to this country. It should be the government, this parliament and the people of this country. Senator Hanson. Very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, One Nation submitted today a matter of public importance, and that wording was: when Australia restarts our immigration program, we do not want migrants to return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the crisis. Well, I have to admit they are not my words. They were Senator Keneally's words that she actually said in her statement. So it's quite interesting that um, I've always said there should be a debate on this. And uh, I'm pleased to see that we actually got the call on this debate. Now, forcing the debate on immigration and foreign workers is often a thankless task. No one knows this more than me. When you bring up facts like more than half the nation's population growth since 2005 has come from overseas migration, you get called a racist. When you explain that, instead of flooding Australia with migrants to drive economic growth, we should be increasing productivity or investing in skills and training. People call you xenophobic. When you make common sense statements like Australians should get a fair go and a first go at jobs, people call you a white supremacist. When you argue like Senator Keneally did the other day through you, Chair, 
that once Australia starts its immigration program, migrants must not return to Australia in the same numbers and in the same composition as before the coronavirus crisis. People even might accuse you of stealing One Nation policy. This is why today I want to say thank you to Labor's shadow immigration minister, Christine Keneally, because I know she will not be getting much support from her Labor colleagues. <laughs> Reading through some of the recent comments made by Senator Keneally, I can only assume she has spent much of her time in quarantine reading through my speeches from 1996 and taking copious notes. And because so much of what she said could have been taken from comments and arguments I've made over the past 24 years, perhaps Senator Keneally might want to make an admission here today that she's a closet One Nation supporter. I know it took Mark Latham a couple of decades to come out of the One Nation closet, but look how great he's doing. He's a new man and loving it. So are the Australian people. Today I want to reassure the Senate that if Senator Keneally wants to cross the floor in support of her own comments and finds herself thrown out of the Labor Party for breaking ranks, I will always have a position in my office for talented immigration speechwriters such as herself. I know I don't often get a chance to congratulate my Labor Senate colleagues, but I always give credit where credit is due. And credit is due because my revealing herself by revealing herself as a covert to One Nation position on immigration, Senator Keneally has proven what I have long said is true. So powerful are my arguments on immigration that even a staunch opponent of One Nation like Senator Keneally will eventually be dragged kicking and screaming to supporting cuts to immigration and cuts to foreign workers. And I know there are many in the Labor Party and even more among Labor's allies in the unions who will agree with my position on immigration and foreign workers behind closed doors, but refuse to speak the truth publicly out of fear of being called a racist or some other meaningless insult. Right now, due to the coronavirus, there are millions of Australians unemployed or underemployed. These are the people we need to look after, not foreign workers. This is the debate we need to have. We can't go back to our old immigration program. Australians have a right to a job and a way of life that is not tied to welfare handouts. For decades, the coalition Labor parties have used mass migration and foreign workers to artificially pump up economic growth. For decades, they have cynically used insults and slurs to try and shut down the, this debate. For decades, they have re refused to admit that this is creating problems with increased demand on our limited services, housing affordability, unemployment and underemployment, wage, stag wage stagnation and congestion in our cities. Senator Keneally and I have now warned each and every one of you that if we continue down the same path of the mass immigration and foreign workers, our economy will come crashing down. I moved to notice a motion today on the floor of Parliament, and I'll just read out some of the comments um, in this notice of motion. And it's relying on high levels of immigration to boost population to fuel economic growth is arguably a la lazy approach. Letting lots of migrants come to Australia to drive economic growth rather than increasing productivity or investing in skills and training is a lazy approach. Instead of letting lots of migrants come to Australia to drive economic growth, we should be increasing productivity or investing in skills and training. As of June 2019, there were 2.1 million temporary visa holders in Australia. Australia hosts the second largest migrant workforce in the OECD, second in total number only to the US. One in five chefs, one in four cooks, one in six hospitality workers and one in ten nursing support and personal care workers in Australia hold a temporary visa. Another one, when Australia restarts its immigration, its migration program, we must understand that migration is a key economic policy lever that can help or harm Australian workers during the economic recovery and beyond. And when Senator Davey talks about regional areas, it says here, 
We must also ensure that regional areas don't only get transient people but community members who will settle down, buy houses, start businesses and send their kids to the local school. The whole fact is that the Labor said I was pulling the stunt. No, the, all those words were from Senator Keneally, her article. That was Labor's shadow minister for immigration, and yet they said I was pulling a political stunt. No, I wasn't pulling a political stunt. The fact is that I called Labor out for what they are, nothing but um, pulled a political stunt themselves. And Keneally was the one that actually um, made those comments. But Labor clearly does not stand by them because they did not support the notice of motion today. So who's really pulled the political stunt? They use it when it suits them. As I said, high immigration props up our economy, has been used by both the major political parties. And I will have my comment about Senator Faruqi today and her comment saying that One Nation stands by white supremacy. At no point have we ever, and I'm sick of the lies, put across in this chamber with regards to One Nation, and I'm going to call it out for what it is. And I encourage people to go to One Nation's website, look at our immigration policy, which is non-discriminatory. So that is purely lies. And to talk about our immigration policy, we need the debate. Australians want the debate. And that concludes this matter of public importance. Uh, we will ask Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, um, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I just seek leave to table a lote motion, um, if I could. I apologise. Is leave granted? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Um, I table the motion. Senator Smith. Acting Deputy President, at the request of Senator Rennick, I withdrew, withdraw the notice of motion given earlier today relating to COVID-19. Thank you, Senator Smith. We now move on to consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Does anyone wish to speak to those documents? No. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, my advice is that I can do this at the end of the documents section of uh, the debate today, uh, and I seek leave. This has been run by whips. I understand I seek leave to table a document in the form of a non-conforming petition signed by 11,755 people calling for uh, 457 and 482 skilled visa holders who is, are stranded. We'll just check leave is granted. Yes, leave is granted. Yep, so this is a petition, um, as I said, signed by 11,755 people calling for 457 and 482 skilled visa holders who are stranded abroad as a result of COVID 19 travel bans to be allowed to return to their jobs, homes, and families in Australia. Thank you. And I, I table the document uh, and I seek leave to make a one minute statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. There are thousands of temporary visa holders who are currently stranded overseas as a result of the travel bans put in place by the Commonwealth Government. Uh, these people, in many cases, live in Australia. These people work in Australia. They pay taxes in Australia. Some are separated from their families who are currently in Australia while the visa holders are stranded overseas. The government does have a process in place for um, exemptions to be granted on application from the travel bans, and I acknowledge that some visa holders have been uh, granted an exemption and therefore allowed back into the country. But there is no criteria against which applications for exemptions are assessed, and people do not understand. Many, many people simply do not understand why they have been banned. At a minimum, people with families and jobs and homes in this country should Senator be allowed back in. McKim, your time has expired. Senator Watt, you're not seeking a call? All right. So then we are moving on to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. 
Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, on behalf of Senator Polly, I'd like to present Scrutiny Digest Number 6 of 2020, together with the Annual Report of 2019 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills. Thank you. Uh, we don't need leave there, do we? No. Go ahead, um, Senator Ciccone. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the Deputy Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, for Senator Brown. I present the report of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Disability Insurance Scheme on Support and Independent Living, together with the documents presented to, to the committee, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. So I moved. Okay. The question is that the Senate take note. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Leave to continue my remarks. Leave is granted. Leave is granted. Are there any further speakers on that? No. Are there any delegation reports? Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Stacking Deputy President. I seek leave to present a delegation report. Uh, there being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. I present the report of the Australian delegation to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in London, which took place from the 12th to the 14th of October 2000. And 19, and I seek leave to move a motion to take note of the report. Uh, leave, there being no objection, leave is granted. I move the Senate take note of the report. The, do we need to, Clark? Do we need to? Oh, go ahead. Terrific. Thank you very much. Uh, along with my colleague Senator Carr, who I notice is in the chamber, um, I had the honour of representing Australia at the. 65th annual session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, which, as I said, was held in London uh, between the 12th to 14th of October 2019, uh, in that time long ago when people could still travel. Um, much has changed since then, but one of the constants uh, is the ability of nations to come together where we share values and have common objectives to work together, both at an executive level, a parliamentary level, and indeed at the level of uh, agencies within governments, in this case predominantly the Defence Alliance, uh, represented by NATO. The Parliamentary Assembly is a forum that facilitates this sort of cooperation between the parliaments of member nations of the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. And whilst Australia is not one of the 29 members of NATO, we are one of several global partners that cooperate and engage in dialogue with NATO. In fact, we're one of five countries uh, called Enhanced Opportunities Partners uh, with significant dialogue and cooperation with the Allies. Uh, and that's in recognition of the significant contribution that Australia makes and has made uh, to a number of activities of NATO. And probably the best known of these in recent times is our contribution in Afghanistan. And I note at this point uh, and thank the 26,000 Australian servicemen and women who have served in Afghanistan. I note and uh, would ask Australians to remember the 41 who have been killed in action and the 261 who have been wounded in action through their service in Afghanistan uh, and, more broadly, the numbers of servicemen and women and their families who still feel impacts because of the service in Afghanistan uh, to this day. Australia is represented at the annual session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly every second year. Uh, generally, we attend is an observer status uh, and we don't have a formal role in proceedings. Uh, this year, though, uh, I was pleased to be given the opportunity to represent Australia uh, by presenting to the Assembly's Defence and Security Committee on developments in Australia and of matters of interest uh, to NATO. Uh, and this invitation came because they have noted uh, and appreciate the steps that Australia has taken uh, in recent years uh, around the defence of our nation and the values that we share with the NATO members. In particular, they are interested to understand what Australia has done to respond to the threat of non-linear warfare. Uh, traditionally, people have thought of warfare as a, uh, a shooting war where two countries have declared war and, and militaries engage. But increasingly what we see is there is a spectrum of activity. 
uh, from foreign influence to interference, particularly in the cyberspace. Uh, there is theft of IP, there is disruption of systems, uh, there is uh, fake news and campaigns to disrupt, and we've seen some of that just during the COVID environment uh, with campaigns to create panic and cause disturbance and distrust uh, within democratic countries uh, by others who don't support that system of government. Uh, at the other end of that spectrum, uh, they were interested to understand what Australia is doing in terms of the $200 billion investment uh, in our defence capability, which we are uh, investing over the next 10 years. And uh, central to that clearly is the reinvestment in both our air, land and sea capability, as well as a number of capabilities in the cyber domain. Uh, the questions asked uh, demonstrated particular interest in what's occurring in our region. Uh, but one of the points I noted was that while NATO has traditionally been concerned with originally the Soviet Union uh, and now more commonly Russia and its activities, uh, they are becoming increasingly aware of developments in Asia and the reach of developing powers in the Asian region into both North America and Europe. And that was a topic of discussion through a number of the uh, presentations that occurred during that time. Uh, there are a number of uh, committee meetings and there was a plenary session. Uh, and in addition to the Defence and Security Committee that I attended, uh, the four other committees examined contemporary issues, uh, including the civil dimensions of security, economics and security, uh, the political dimensions and science and technology. Um, because Australia did not have a large delegation, in fact we are limited to two, so it was Senator Carr and myself. We clearly couldn't attend all of the committee uh, meetings, but we did uh, attempt to get as many as possible, and particularly those that were of interest uh, to Australia. Uh, my predominant involvement uh, was with the Defence and Security Committee, as well as the plenary uh, session. Uh, the way these run is there are a number of bodies that work throughout the year to take topics of interest to nations who develop... Oh, sorry. Uh, Senator Fawcett, your time has actually expired, though I know you do like talking on this topic. But well, you are clearly so interested, Mr Acting Deputy President. Se Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Can I uh, uh, take this opportunity to endorse the report of Senator Fawcett and acknowledge the courtesy that is extended to me uh, this evening and, and throughout the work of this uh, delegation. Can I emphasise the value of us, this, this parliament participating in this uh, NATO conference and uh, the, uh, I'll just turn this off, um, the, uh, the value of us being, as a country being able to participate in this uh, matter. Uh, I just would like to add a few points and reiterate some comments that I made uh, in greater detail perhaps uh, uh, last November, on the 13th of November. Um, the, I was able to participate more through the political committee um, and uh, while I did participate in some of the other committees the Senator Fawcett um, pre presented directly to. Uh, NATO faces a range of challenges now that effectively arms control have broken down and that the most powerful states of the world, namely the United States, Russia, China, India, have ceased supporting multilateralism. I was particularly noted that, and the point was made on numerous occasions, that President Trump's often quoted statement that the future belongs to patriots not globalists, have become a slogan for more populist nationalists everywhere. And the same a rapid technological change had transformed the structures of industrial economies, was also facing new challenges for the way in which states intervene in each other's affairs. The conference also we gave particular emphasis to the role of climate change and the way that the Antarctic uh, uh, and, and the Arctic were now being opened up as uh, new sources for exploitation and military deployment, and particularly the Antarctic. Uh, sorry, particularly the Arctic. Uh, all of this uh, poses serious problems for NATO, which it felt, felt was under considerable pressure to deal 
with a stated claim that it was a global champion of democracy. And with very few exceptions, uh, for instance, Portugal under the Cesar dictatorship, NATO members had been democracies. But they have always sought to uphold human rights and the rule of law. It simply can't be said today. They've, they have contrast themselves in the past uh, in, with authoritarian regimes, and that, of course, can't be said today. That discussion in the Assembly is made clear. The most perplexing threat to democracy now comes from within NATO states themselves. And some NATO members, especially Hungary and Poland, have governments that are increasingly authoritarian. They're not single st uh, party states, but they are governments that are curtail basic freedoms, such as the freedom of the press and the rule of law. And that populist governments were taking expressions from the resurgence of reactionary nationalism within Europe and that this in itself was beginning to become a, a major threat to the fundamental assumptions of the way in which NATO had seen itself as an ideal of liberal democracy. And it threatened the principles uh, that I think were the foundations of the way in which NATO had operated. Now, not all of these countries are yet full members of NATO, and part of the difficulty for NATO was resolving these inherent tensions. And so a lot of the rhetoric that we hear today in Europe is in fact straight out of the 1930s. And given the recent uh, anniversary of the defeat of fascism in Europe, it is deeply disturbing that the resurgence of those uh, forces now be giving legitimacy in some of those regimes. So I particularly uh, welcome the opportunity to participate in this delegation. I thank uh, Senator Fawcett for, and, and the uh, committee's uh, the secretariat for their support. Uh, the, uh, this has been a very worthwhile experience, and I think the parliament should take every effort to continue the participation in this uh, conference. The question before the chair is that the Senate take note of the report. Those of that opinion say aye. Okay, Again, say no. The ayes have it. We'll move on to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Senator Col Minister Colbeck. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Minister for Health, I table a ministerial statement on Australia's COVID-19 health response. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. I'd just like to make a few remarks on behalf of the opposition in relation to that ministerial statement from Minister Hunt. Um, could you just, I understand could, I could don't need move, to seek leave, but just move to I'm take moving note. to take note. I'd like Thank to take you. note of the minister's statement. There being no objection, go ahead, Senator Watt. Great. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, all of us uh, in this chamber and this country have looked in horror at the scenes uh, that we have witnessed, particularly overseas, uh, in many parts of the world as a result of COVID 19. I certainly know that I won't forget the images of panic in hospitals in Italy in a, hur in a hurry, uh, and there are many other similar scenes. Uh, that all of us have witnessed in recent months about, uh, the, as a result of COVID-19 overseas. Thankfully, Australia, while suffering greatly from COVID-19, has been spared what we have seen in many other countries. Although we do need to remember uh, that despite best efforts, we have seen 19, 97 Australians lose their lives as a result of coronavirus with a total of 6,948 cases in Australia, all up. Behind these numbers are personal stories, like Gary Kirstenfeldt, the second Queenslander to die from coronavirus and the first to die in Queensland. 68-year-old Mr Kirstenfeldt died on the 25th of March this year in Toowoomba, after recently disembarking from the Voyager of the Seas cruise ship in Sydney. His families say that he was an avid traveller. His children described him as a man with much more life in him. It's truly tragic to see people like Mr Kirsten felt cut down by this virus, in his case, at the age of only 68. We know that without the efforts of many people, there would have been many more like Mr Kirsten felt. And on behalf of the opposition, I want to thank everyone who has worked on this crisis and particularly 
what we're focusing on today, the health response. I want to thank all of the governments, federal, state and territory, uh, for the efforts that they have put in. And I know from my participation on the COVID Oversight Committee with Senators uh, Gallagher, uh, uh, Keneally and others um, that there are officials of this government who have worked incredibly hard uh, over the last few months to protect Australians from this virus. More than anyone, though, I do want to thank the frontline workers in our health system, the doctors, the nurses, other health workers, the disability care workers, the aged care workers, the cleaners, the orderlies in our hospitals who have really gone above and beyond to look after their fellow Australians. And as the Labor leader, Mr Albanese, has said this week, we can't forget them when this crisis is over. And finally, on behalf of the opposition, I want to thank Australians generally for having risen to the challenge, uh, for by and large listening to the health advice that's been provided, uh, for practising social distancing uh, and for making sacrifices over the last few months, not just to protect themselves and their own families, uh, but to protect Australians generally. Uh, it is a pretty, in it's a pretty, pretty incredible achievement from Australians, and it has demonstrated some of those values of Australians that we all do cherish. Labor's approach through the coronavirus crisis has been one where we have attempted to be constructive uh, and looking for solutions, not arguments. We have supported every single initiative that this government has put forward to tackle coronavirus. Where, where the government has needed criticism and, has, and answers have been required, we have sought those answers and we have made those criticisms. And chief among them has been the government's handling of the Ruby Princess cruise ship, uh, something that I know Senator Keneally has been very active on. Uh, and I know that we are all still seeking more answers about what went on there. We've made a number of suggestions uh, in, a in a constructive spirit that have been taken up by the government, and we thank them for listening. I want to put on record my thanks to many of our own Labor, Labor team who have worked incredibly hard to both support the government in its efforts and also to provide these constructive suggestions. In particular, our Shadow Health Minister Chris Bowen has worked day and night on behalf of our Labor team, along with many other members of caucus. And I do want to single out for attention the members of our own First Nations caucus committee, uh, including in this chamber Senators Dodson and McCarthy, who have put in a huge amount of work uh, focused on protecting remote First Nations communities across our country. So collectively, all of us, governments, oppositions, health workers and Australians in general, have managed at this stage at least to flatten the curve and they deserve our congratulations. In the interest of time, I won't say too much more, but inevitably attention is now turning to when restrictions can be eased. And uh, I know that certainly as someone like many who is working at home uh, with a spouse who's working from home, with two school-aged children doing their schooling from home, I, I know that many Australians are looking forward to restrictions being eased and life going back to normal. Uh, but, but in terms of the decisions that we do take from here, they must continue to be guided by health advice. Uh, we can't see uh, political decisions being made uh, or political point scoring being taken around the decisions, particularly of states and territories, around the easing of restrictions. We can't be reckless with these decisions because even today clusters remain. Look at Newmarch House, uh, look at the Cedar Meats abattoir. And of course, we've seen in other countries around the world the risk of a second wave of infections. So we must re ease our restrictions gradually, steadily, sensibly and always based on the best health advice. But again, in closing, I want to congratulate the government for its efforts and for taking up some of those constructive suggestions that the opposition made. And again, I want to cons congratulate all Australians for what we've achieved so far. Let's make sure it stays that way. Senator Seward. Deputy Chair, I too would like to take note of the Minister for Health, Minister Hunt's statement on Australia's uh, COVID-19 health response. I particularly want to focus on the mental health elements of the response. Um, this is a deeply distressing time for Australians, for people around the world, uh, for uh, individuals and for families. The stresses of the pandemic on households, relationships and finances is immense, and we all uh, recognise that. 
Many people are suffering from the impacts of loneliness as they isolate and cannot see their loved ones, particularly older Australians. And I know from my personal experience um, how hard my mother is finding it, not being able to hug us, not be able to see her grandchildren or great-grandchildren. Many people are worried about their futures, quite rightly worried about their futures. The mental health impacts of this pandemic are also likely to continue for some time throughout the recovery period as people get back on their feet. So it's not just this particular period. Um, we recognise that the government, and particularly the Minister for Health, has provided a, a, and, and thank um, the government and the Minister for Health for the additional resources that have been provided to address uh, people's mental health and mental ill health, and, this, and also recognise the importance of the appointment of the new deputy CMO for mental health. And we look forward to seeing the outcomes from National Cabinet, uh, I understand, uh, later this week on their deliberations on the National Mental Health Pandemic Response Plan. That's a very important plan that will lead uh, our further response and the way forward on uh, our mental health response. Having said that, there are still things that we need to be doing. We must ensure that all Australians have access to the mental health supports they need and when they need it. And I'm a little bit concerned, or I am concerned, that some people are still unable to access those services, and I'll explain why. Introducing the MBS, it MBS items um, for uh, telehealth psychology sessions has provided some immediate relief and is very much appreciated. But it doesn't replace uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, experiences with a psychologist. And I know from the Senate inquiry had into rural and regional health, uh, rural and regional mental health experiences that a number of people expressed very strong support for the telehealth for uh, mental health uh, support, but others found it was only part of uh, the supports that they needed. Where I'm, I am concerned, um, having heard reports from a number of people, um, particularly those on low incomes, who are now finding it difficult to be able to afford to pay the gap in fees for their psychology sessions. And this is particularly the case since the decision on bulk billing rules were changed. Um, we need some level of transparency around bulk billing services, and in particular people need to know where they can access uh, bulk billing uh, psychology sessions. Um, I also think that this is time that we also review um, the Better Access Scheme. Um, throughout this pandemic, many, many people are experiencing relapses in their uh, mental ill health, or the sy sy symptoms have been amplified due to the stresses of the current situation. For people with moderate or severe mental health conditions, 10 sessions under Better Access is simply not enough. And so we think it's time to look at that uh, situation, and I've had it proposed to me that, in fact, we may look at a tiered system, which provides additional service uh, sessions for people with more complex mental health conditions. And I would like to strongly suggest that the government looks at that tiered approach, because I know that there are a number of people uh, supporting that approach. This will pro th that sort of approach will provide security for both the individual and also their mental health uh, care provider. Um, we've heard just in recent days the, the modelling which suggests that may there may be a 50 per cent increase in the number of people um, taking their own lives, and that, are, and that this is directly related to the stresses of the pandemic and the recovery period. Last week, um, Professor Pat McGorry, I know every single member of this place would be well aware of um, the excellent work that Professor McGorry has been doing. Um, he called on the government to provide much quicker access to the data about suicide and suicide attempts. I strongly support this and, in fact, raised it with the Department of Health this morning um, in the deliberations or the hearing of the latest hearing of the, can, uh, the, can, uh, the COVID uh, committee inquiry. Um, we're keen to see um, the, this issue progressed and, in fact, the department I know, answered um, that they are going to be looking at it and we're going to be discussing it further next week. This is an issue that was raised during the um, Community Affairs Committee inquiry into the prevention of suicide a large number of years ago, um, and that is uh, better access and, and better understanding of the numbers in more uh, real time. So I'll, I'll 
very strongly support Professor McGorry's call and look forward to seeing this matter um, progressed. Because if we are going to address this issue, we need a much better understanding of where this is occurring, where this is occurring, and uh, address the causes. We know that we are going to come out of this pandemic with high levels of unemployment. And this will create immense insecurity for individuals and families, placing further pressure on them and, of course, on their mental health. We must ensure that unemployed people's mental, mental, mental health is looked after um, during this difficult period in their lives as they, as they try and find work. Programs such as the Individual Placement and Support Trial at Headspace have shown that have shown very good success in providing mental health care with career guidance and counselling. Now is the time to be looking at expanding these much more significantly across the country and start applying it for adults as well, because I, having seen the benefits, I think adults um, would benefit uh, this, because at the moment the trials, of course, being through Headspace, are focused on, on young people. It's important that we also make sure we're looking after older people and their longer-term prospects. Um, I know, um, uh, having heard from a number of, of older people, as I hold the older Australians portfolio for the Australian Greens, is that older Australians are worried about their employment prospects. And we know from the from the unemployment figures prior to the pandemic is that it's the older workers that are remaining on uh, on um, income support for much longer periods, and and figure unfortunately very predominantly in the figure in the figures of those that have been on unemployment benefits for the benefits for the long term. So we need to make sure that we have uh, very good mental health supports in place for older Australians as well. And I can't help but note that one of the ways that we will support people more most effectively as we come out of recovery and we move in as we come out of this period move into the recovery period is in make sure that they are adequately supported both in their mental health uh, supports their health supports and also in the income support which is why um, I'm so strongly uh, pursuing the issue of the increase in the job seeker payment so that people aren't f as financially stressed um, as they would be if they uh, weren't getting um, that support O2 would like to thank uh, front particularly everybody that's been involved in this process in uh, addressing the pandemic and particularly front um, frontline workers we know that um, they have been there um, working day in day out putting their own lives at risk and I also would note putting their families uh, health at risk um, it's very important that we so, uh, make sure that we call them at, call out our support for them whenever we can and also note that yesterday um, was International Nurses Day. Um, being the niece of a nurse I, uh, and having um, watched her through her career, uh, they do absolutely vital work. Um, and also having had a, number of, uh, a lot of contact with nurses um, uh, through uh, this process, it, it, they are absolutely doing vital work. So also a call out for them on the day after International Nurses Day. Um, I think I might need to leave, seek leave to continue my remarks. Leave being granted. Um, there being no further contributions, uh, the question before the chair is that the Senate take note of the ministerial statement. Okay, we can move on then to Senator Urquhart. Uh, so, sorry, I just um, wish to seek leave to lodge a uh, late notice of motion in the um, name of Senator Gallagher for tomorrow's general business. There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. All right, we move on to committee memberships. The president received a letter requesting changes to the membership of committees. Minister. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that senators be discharged and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. Clerk. Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in the name of Senator Patrick, relating to the disallowance of the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Controlled Airports Regulations 2019. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr Act Acting Deputy President, I move business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1, standing in my name for today. In re, uh, it's worthwhile understanding a little bit of history as to why this disallowance uh, has been um, 
uh, has been lodged. Uh, in response to an Inspector General of Transport Security report, the government announced back in May uh, 2018 an intention to upgrade security at regional airports. Uh, will uh, all senators and most Australians would be fam familiar with the sort of equipment that uh, would be installed in these airports, body scanners, luggage screening equipment and so forth. They also announced a $50 million uh, fund, grant fund to cover the capital costs of the equipment uh, across more than 50 airports. All good so far. I'll just park that there and then go back uh, also a couple of years to a Senate committee that was running in parallel to all of this, inquiring into the operation, regulation uh, and funding of air route delivery to rural, regional and remote uh, communities. It was a, an inquiry. Uh, and I have to give, uh, pay considerable um, uh, applause to uh, 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 the, the senators involved back there, uh, Senator Barry O'Sullivan uh, and uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Glenn Stirl as well participated in that inquiry and played a big part in it. Uh, uh, I also uh, sat on that committee. And it was during uh, that committee we uh, were, were made overtly aware of this particular uh, plan and a number of holes that were in the plan, uh, holes in the execution of it. Now, the first uh, hole was a shortfall in funding for some of these regional airports, um, and I will talk about Wyala on a, on a couple of occasions tonight. But Wyala Airport is a, is a good example. If you want to install uh, equipment into Wyala Airport, firstly you've got to have a big enough terminal, and Wyala Airport is not that big. And it's particularly uh, important if you want to have both screened and non-screened flights. It requires a, a larger terminal so that you can have a cleared area and a screened area. Uh, and uh, certainly the funding that was made available didn't contemplate that. And I will acknowledge that the government has uh, moved in, uh, uh, in terms of ground and in respect of that to help out uh, some airports in relation to terminal modifications. But perhaps the biggest problem was the fact that there was no uh, funding to cover the operational expenses, the operational costs. And uh, the interesting thing was, and the committee uh, uh, basically revealed that, was that there were no studies done. Someone inside Home Affairs uh, looked into uh, the security issue, made a decision, and I'm sure there are good reasons uh, for those decisions. And the, Committee were uh, briefed to a certain extent in relation to that, uh, in, in relation to those reasons, but no one looked at the problem holistically. No one looked and said, "What effect does this have?" And in fact, uh, there was no uh, RIS carried out either, which uh, makes me wonder whether or not the Office of Best pra Practice uh, uh, Regulation is in fact doing their job properly, because we now know that for Wyala, for example, the cost is well over a million dollars each year to run, which is a doubling of, uh, of the, cost of, uh, 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 the operational cost for the airport for, uh, per annum. Now, what happened uh, was there, there was no, uh, there was no um, uh, uh, studies that were done, and as a result, uh, and this was the good work of the committee, and once again, uh, Barry, uh, uh, Senator, former Senator Barry O'Sullivan uh, played a big part in this. We, we, we uh, impressed upon the, de the Department of Transport that they had to do uh, some case studies, and off they went to do some case studies. But just to conclude, and it's really important in the context of this disallowance, what the inquiry uh, found, and it won't come as any surprise to anyone who's gone anywhere near the bush, that airfares to re re remote regional and remote communities are high. Um, and the other factor that we need to uh, take into consideration is that uh, regional uh, air routes are the lifeblood of regional communities. It's the way in which we get medical services to the, to the, to the bush. It's the way in which we get medical services to, to regional centres. It's the way in which people who in regional centres hook up uh, with education services. It's the way businesses, it's the way agriculture connect up with suppliers in the cities, and indeed it's the way in which families 
uh, make connections with people uh, in, the, in the cities. And uh, what the committee found was that uh, you can have a situation where if, if a doctor ends up getting frustrated about not, going, uh, not being able to get back to Adelaide or to Brisbane or to uh, uh, Perth on a regular basis because of the expense, and it is hugely expensive for people in the bush to get their families to the cities, they leave. And when the doctor leaves, suddenly three teachers decide to pack up and go because they don't want to live in a town where uh, there's no doctor. And we know right across this country there are problems uh, in relation to, uh, to doctors um, being, you know, being available in, in regional communities. So it really is important that we uh, make sure that air routes uh, are maintained, air services are maintained to uh, these regional centres. We took evidence from uh, both Qantas uh, and Rex and uh, Virgin, uh, uh, but uh, with, with my focus on South Australia, Qantas made it very clear that there's, no, there's not a lot of margin on each seat. You increase the, the fare by just a little bit and suddenly the, uh, there's no profit for the, for the airline. Rex was very, very uh, prescriptive about it. They said uh, they operate, and uh, evidence to the committee, uh, the RAC committee last week, uh, made it very clear, $10 per, per seat. That's what they make for every seat, for every flight, uh, if averaged over a year. So if you put up, uh, if you, if you, if you uh, impose a charge upon a local council, because that's who mostly operates these airports, what then happens is they pass that on by way of landing costs to the, uh, uh, to the airline and the airline passes it on to the passenger. And you have a situation where when the, when the uh, airfare uh, goes up, what happens is, uh, particularly in some of these remote areas, the competition to the airline is not necessarily between Qantas and Rex. It's actually between, say, Rex and the road. And people then take to uh, the road, and that uh, uh, causes a number of problems in terms of uh, safety, uh, in terms of uh, you know, people being tired. You know, someone who needs to get to a medical appointment, and they have to drive seven or eight hours to get. Uh, to, to get to that appointment. Um, it, is, it actually creates a, a more dangerous uh, situation. And you, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not kind of making this up. I believe the airlines. You, I, in, just over the last uh, uh, five, four or five months in South Australia, and this is before COVID, we saw, uh, we saw Rex pulling at services out of Mount Gambia. We saw Rex announcing that it was leaving Kangaroo Island. We've seen the cessation of flights to Port Augusta. Now, we have to look beyond our capital cities. The people in the bush, they're fantastic people, and they're, they're, they're doing a whole range of stuff to, uh, to supply us with food, uh, supply us with fabrics, all that sort of stuff, and uh, that, they're really important. And, uh, and we, we cannot continue to just lump cost upon them. We cannot continue to make things harder for, 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 uh, for them. I'll go to the study that resulted from the pressure that, uh, that came from the RAC committee, the, the 2018 RAC committee uh, uh, inquiry. Uh, there has been a, uh, a transport department case, a set of case studies are done, and the two I've focused on, this won't surprise you, is Wyala. First is Wyala. The airfares in Wyala, and these, this is not, these are not my numbers, these are the Department of Transport's, uh, Transport's numbers. The airfares in Wyala will go up by $52 per passenger. This is already on top of uh, the, um, uh, uh, the very expensive fares the uh, RAC committee heard last week that it's cheaper to fly from Adelaide to Bali than it is to change, ch fly from Adelaide to Wyala. And, and that, that, that is the evidence uh, that the committee received. And, uh, and of course, um, uh, yeah, that's an unacceptable proposition. What will happen if this, uh, if this uh, regulation is allowed to continue uh, is we will see uh, services drop from Wyala. There is no question. We will, uh, just as uh, people like Sanjeev Gupta are trying to put their foot on the accelerator there, we'll have, uh, we'll have uh, the government putting on the handbrake. 
And I, uh, you know, we also took evidence from Armadale last week, and they were kind of all okay about it until they realised that in Armadale, um, or in fact, I asked uh, the, uh, the the CEO, "What is, what's the uh, uh, increase in ticket price as a result of the security screening?" He said, oh, "I'm not really sure, Senator." Uh, then we had. Uh, uh, Air Corporate come on, who fly into Armadale, and they made it very clear that the the, uh, the air route most at risk in, uh, uh, in in their little network was in fact uh, an Armadale to Brisbane flight. Um, uh, they they said it's on the rocks. That uh, that's a quote. It'll be on the rocks. So, uh, but now we have a situation. We've got COVID-19. And the entire aviation industry has been turned upside down, completely turned upside down. We've had uh, one of the two major carriers in this country go into liquidation, or sorry, into administration. I apologise. Um, and uh, we're having to uh, prop up uh, Qantas and Rex and, and other carriers to make sure we've got. Uh, at least some limited services going to our regional centres, and, and I compliment the government on their response in relation to COVID-19. Uh, However, there is no question that what is going on here is, is unfair. It is unfair to people that live in the regions, um, uh, and it will harm them. It will be devastating for them. They will lose services. This is, this is just another uh, sort of chipping away at, uh, at regional areas. Um, and you know, at the end of it, we look back and we say this was a bunch of bureaucrats that made these decisions uh, without proper consideration as to the effect. People who clearly don't get outside of the, uh, uh, the territorial limits of Canberra. So I want to make it very clear. The, my disallowing or seeking a disallowance of this, uh, uh, of this regulation is not about airport security. It's not about airport security. I support airport security. It's about sharing cost. It's about being fair about how we um, uh, distribute cost. You know, I'd, I'd make the point in terms of security uh, that, that we've got people now in the regions that are paying for security where the threat is actually at the city when they arrive, most likely. So we've got people in the regions now putting their hand uh, into their pocket, paying uh, extremely high airline uh, air ticket costs, and uh, they're doing so in the interest of the people in the cities. This is a national security requirement. It should not be a local council cost. It should be looked at nationally. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I acknowledge that there are a number of people in this place that have, have uh, contributed uh, and, and uh, helped to examine this. That includes Senator Stirl. Uh, Senator Macdonald, the chair of, of the RAC committee, has done a, a good job in teasing out all of these issues. We actually are well aware of what's going to happen here. Uh, we need to be. Uh, we, we need to. Uh, protect those people in uh, in the regions. We need to stand up for those peoples and the uh, people in the regions. And so I ask senators to vote for my disallowance. Thank you, Senator Patrick. <laughs> I think uh, I think Senator Mackenzie had the call earlier. Very much, Chair. Um, a sustainable and vibrant regional aviation industry is essential to move our people and our products from the regions to capital cities and the world. And I think, Senator Patrick, uh, you really laid a lot of the issues uh, currently and historically with the Australian regional aviation industry on the table. And the Nationals have been champions of regional aviation for decades. We have held the ministries. We have built and developed this industry. We have opened up regional Australia so that people can head off to essential services to visit family, uh, but also our product can get to the markets of the world. And those professional service industries can also uh, make their way 
into the regions, and increasingly uh, we've been able to develop a very healthy uh, regional tourism industry on the back of our regional aviation industry, and that's meant a lot of local jobs. But it's not just our ministers that have driven that. Uh, it is the senators in this place from the National Party. It is former chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee in this place, uh, Senator O'Sullivan, a significant champion uh, for the regional aviation industry, as was Senator Williams from New South Wales and current chair uh, and a great champion for regional aviation, uh, Senator Macdonald. Um, ensuring the safety of the broader Australian community means we do need to implement appropriate security measures at domestic airports right across the country, and that does include airports in regional communities. But make no mistake, as the Australian community is the beneficiary of uh, that infrastructure, so too should the entire Australian domestic uh, air travel industry pay for that infrastructure. The National Senate team is not supporting the disallowance motion as we welcome moves this week by the government to ensure costs incurred by regional uh, airports to implement improved security screening measures will not be passed on unfairly to regional travellers. The Nationals in the Senate negotiated a positive outcome with the government to ensure travellers do not face disproportionate cost increases, particularly at a time uh, when regional aviation is reeling, reeling from the consequences of COVID-19. I'd like to thank the Minister for Home Affairs, the Minister for Transport, our own leader, Michael McCormack, for ensuring this happens. The, as Nationals, we won't take a backward step in standing up for our communities because that is exactly why they sent each and every one of these senators uh, here to stand up and negotiate a positive outcome for our communities, which is what we've been able to achieve. When travel restrictions are lifted, we want people to visit the regions. We don't want costs to replace COVID as an impediment to those visits. We support security screening, but right now regional tourism is stagnant and we need to kick start it again. Adding costs to regional air travel is the wrong thing to do in a post-COVID-19 environment. And this builds on our existing commitments the Nationals applaud uh, our government's commitment to regional aviation, particularly in light of uh, the pandemic, agreeing to uh, operation costs for the foreseeable COVID pandemic period for those regional um, airports. But despite the pandemic, a minimum domestic network servicing uh, the most critical metropolitan regional routes in Australia continues to operate, and that's thanks to the investment by our government. Underwriting the cost of the network comes in addition to more than $1 billion of federal government support for our Australian aviation industry. The network includes all state and territory capital cities and major regional centres such as Albury, Alice Springs, Coffs Harbour, Dubbo, Kalgoorlie, Mildura, Port Lincoln, Rockhampton, Tamworth, Townsville and Wagga Wagga. Our support uh, is delivering affordable access for passengers who must travel, including our essential workers, such as frontline medical personnel and defence personnel. Our action is also supporting essential freight, such as critical medicine and personal protective equipment. And all this complements the actions the federal, liberal and national government has already taken to underwrite international flights to get uh, Australians home during this very, very difficult time. The Nationals in the Senate won't take a backward step in standing up for rural Australia. We look forward to the measures from our government that will ensure that Australians are both safe as they travel, uh, but also can afford to head out to the regions for work or for fun. And I am very much looking forward to a champion of our regional aviation industry and chair of our uh, RAC committee in this place, Senator Macdonald's contribution. Uh, because she has been intimately involved uh, in the hearings and this investigation since she's arrived. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much. Labor supports regional security upgrades at our airports. We think our regional airports should have proper security in place. What we d think should also happen is that a government should implement those regional airport security upgrades in a way that is not ham-fisted, in a way that does not punish regional communities, in a way that does not put the future of regional airlines or regional airports into doubt. But that is exactly what is happening 
under this government's plan to upgrade security at regional airports. We have heard testimony in this Senate that Wyala Airport probably can survive if this government persists with its regional security upgrades under the way they've designed it. We have heard evidence in this place that Rex Airlines thinks that several of their routes will not be economically viable if the government persists with the program they have started to upgrade regional airport security. We have heard evidence in this place that Armadale Airport says that this liberal national government's program of upgrades at regional airports will definitely hurt regional airports. It is all well and good for the nationals to come in here and say that they want these costs shared across the entire country, not foisted onto regional airline, airlines and airports, regional councils and regional airline passengers. It's all well and good for the nationals to say that's what they want what is exactly what this Liberal national government is doing. Make no mistake, if the government, this Liberal national government, proceeds as they have started, if they do not change the design, the implementation, and the cost structure of the security upgrades at regional airports, we will see regional airports in this country close, we will see regional airline routes shut down, and we will see regional people paying more to take a flight. That is just simply what's going to happen. It is just simply the outcome of the government's ham-fisted, short-sighted, shove everything onto the regions, let them bear the cost, approach to upgrading airport security in regional communities. Liberal Senator Rennick, he went to these hearings. He called for what Senator McKenzie says she wanted. He called for, he called for the sharing of the cost across all of Australia, not just foisted onto regional communities. Senator McKenzie says she wants it. You know what? I want it. I agree with Senator McKenzie. There has got to be a better way than what this Liberal national government is delivering. The difference between me and Senator Rennick, the difference between me and Senator McKenzie, is they are in government. You are in government. You could fix this. Don't just come into the Senate. Don't just come into the Senate. Oh, she says she is. Well, then why couldn't the very Department of Home Affairs, she stands in here and praises the Minister for Home Affairs in the other place, Minister Dutton. Why couldn't the Department of Home Affairs answer the most basic questions? The most basic questions in front of the RAT committee. They could not, they would not commit to the type of cost structure that Senator Rennick proposed. They disregarded it. So, it's all well and good for Liberal and National Senators to come in here and say, here in Canberra, rah, rah, we're for the regions, but yet have failed to deliver any actual change in the government's implementation, definitions, requirements, or indeed cost recovery for these regional airport security upgrades. Now, the government can fix this. What will not fix this is Senator Patrick's disallowance motion. I think Senator Patrick has the good intentions in his heart. I think his motives are pure. But I think he's using the proverbial hammer to crack a walnut here. I think that Senator Patrick's motion would send the wrong message to the community because it would actually cancel the upgrades, the security upgrades at regional airports. It would actually do away with them. It would mean that four of our airports, three of them in Senator Patrick's own home state, would no longer have a security upgrade in plane, in, in, in train. Now, I know that the Senator Patrick is interjecting on me here. He's had his go. He's had his 15 minutes of fame on this. 
But I, I regretfully say to you, Senator Patrick, well, I think your motives are pure. Your method is not, well, I won't say that it's mad. It's just not one that we support. Now, so Labor will not be supporting this disallowance motion. This is the government's problem to fix. Regional Australia has a problem. Regional, prob Regional Australia has a problem. The government is the threat to their ability to access affordable flights or indeed to have an airport in their community at all. And it is up to the government, this liberal national government, to fix it. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Keneally. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on the disallowance motion relating to the Aviation Transport Security Amendment Security Controlled Airports Regulations. So, unlike Labor, the National Party knows where the regions are, and we fight for the regions every day. We don't just talk about it, we deliver. And that's what we've done tonight. I'd like to start by affirming my support for the Minister's actions in taking these additional steps to secure passenger security. And last week, I chaired the Regional and Rural Affairs and Transport Committee hearing into the introduction of additional security measures to regional airports. These security changes were proposed on the basis of a recommendation arising from a report of the Inspector of Transport Security ITS, table, titled Review into Security at Australia's Security Regulated Airports. This report contains information that is protected under the Inspector of Transport Security Act 2008. And protected information under this Act includes information or documents obtained or generated in the course of exercising powers or performing functions under the ITS Act. Release of the ITS report would have a substantial adverse effect on the proper and efficient conduct of the operations of the Department of Home Affairs, and the inspector recommended that this report not be made public. But sadly, the world is now a place that airport security is an important element for our national security and, most importantly, for our safety. And we rely on the evidence and the advice of experts like the ITS to provide the most up-to-date advice to ensure our airways remain the important connection between regionals and cities and that they remain safe. And Labor spent a considerable amount of time going over and over uh, this a line of questioning over this confidential advice, which was a real distraction from the most important issue, which is who pays for us to enjoy the national umbrella of safety. And the decisions taken by the Minister for Home Affairs in this regard are important, and I doubt that anyone of any intelligence would question the outcome of greater security utilising the best available technology. And I, like every National Party member, undertook to come to this place to represent the people who live in the very places where aviation was born in Australia and to respond to the potential impacts of security charges on regional aviation. Current security measures generally in place in mo at most airports in Australia are as a result of the tragedy of September 11 and the responsibility for ensuring these measures rests with each airport, which is designated as the screening authority charged with operating the security functions. This includes the cost of the procurement and the maintenance of capital equipment and also the screening personnel. And this cost is typically recovered via a per-passenger charge that is collected by the airlines on each ticket sold and passed back to the airports. But regional aviation is critical to the success of regional Australia. It allows people to stay connected to their broader communities, to family, sporting events and holidays, to businesses and to tourism. So the ability to fly from Brisbane to Charleville meant I didn't have to drive eight hours in the middle of summer at six months pregnant for a much-loved cousin's wedding at Tambo, which otherwise I could not have attended. Flight also gives people easy access to the Stockman's Hall of Fame at Longreach and the Australian Age of Dinosaur Museum near Winton. Longreach holds the nation's soul in its dusty street, and the Qantas Museum, the Stockman's Hall of Fame and Cooper Creek Sunset Tours are all must-do tourist 
uh, activities. And just two hours up the road, Winton has a world-registered dark sky sanctuary where stargazers congregate for crystal clear views of the heavens. The town also has the Walsing Matilda Centre, the Australian Age of Dinosaurs Museum, where it is impossible not to be infected with museum founder David Elliott's enthusiasm for Australia's prehistoric past when monsters roamed the outback. But to give you some perspective, Winton is 500 kilometres from Townsville. It is 760 kilometres from Rockhampton and nearly 1,200 kilometres from Brisbane. Driving there through the outback is a special event, but many people are denied the opportunity to visit these towns. When I hear city-based friends talking of mini-breaks, they have the luxury of jumping on a cheap flight to another capital city for a weekend away. The low cost and high frequency of city-to-city -city flights is completely unimaginable for regionally-based Queenslanders. Mount Isa, Roma, Emerald and Rockhampton are all regional centres that value commercial flights so highly. Miners and boarding school kids fill and empty these airports with well-practised ease. High-vis clothes, hard hats and western hats mix together as miners arrive and depart and country kids come home from boarding schools excited and leave glassy-eyed with emotion. Last time I left Mackay Airport, a lady needed a hand. She was travelling to Brisbane for cancer treatment. and She was alone. She had no family to, to get her there or to meet her. But air travel allowed her to get to the specialist 11 hours drive away. In Mount Isa, a family considers whether to travel to Townsville to watch their beloved North Queensland Cowboys play. They can drive 10 hours each way, but often opt to fork out $500 each to fly. And that's if they're lucky, because surge pricing around Cowboys games can push the costs up significantly. Christmas holidays can, not feel, can feel not very Christmassy, Christmassy at all. Usually, I can fly with the kids for about $300 one way, but last year, on December the 13th, I was caught out when airfares skyrocketed to $900 per person one way. Fortunately, it was not an unplanned trip for a funeral or a family emergency or even a business emergency requiring expert help to be flown to a regional area, which adds significant costs to any regional business. Hopefully, this is painting a picture for you of an essential industry for the many people who live and work in regional Australia, where the tyranny of distance has such a huge effect and where price variations due to airline policies, privatised airports and government regulation make the necessity of air travel horribly expensive for tourists, for families, for business. For each of us, when we come to this place, we come with a sense of purpose, of who we fight for and who we represent. And we know the places we come from and the things that are so important to our communities and our people, because people matter. And in my maiden speech only last year, I spoke about the chasm between city and country, between the people who generate the great wealth of this nation in agriculture, in mining, in tourism, and the cities where we all seem to need to get to. One of the silver linings of this corona crisis is the realisation of what we can now do with technology. Remote working, online education, telemedicine, Wi-Fi notifications and verification for mobile phones have all come forward at a pace that would not have been imaginable without the, emer the urgency of a pandemic. But one of the things we have not been able to solve is how to move ourselves from one place to another in a way that is both affordable and safe. It costs 86 cents for each person to be processed through security in Sydney, but more than $30 per person in a regional centre. At Townsville Airport, this charge is presently $2.71 per departing and arriving passenger, and in Mount Isa it's $6.22. Industry is very mindful that these costs are an impost on travel, especially for smaller regional airports where the costs are typically higher during to, due to lower economies of scale. 
And remember that these are all numbers generated on pre-COVID modelling and numbers. From January 2021, body scanners and advanced CT X-ray uh, scanning equipment will be introduced at many airports, including Townsville. This requires major redevelopment works, and while the federal government has provided funding for the works, airports will have to factor in the increased costs which would eventually be borne by air travellers. And practically speaking, I understand that the cost of screening would have been invoiced as a lump sum to each airline, who in turn would have claimed it back from the federal government, an arrangement that had industry support. But it seems to me, as it seems to our, my National Party colleagues, that these are all variations on the cost to deliver a single nationwide security network. A nationwide security network allows for a single price to be charged across the nation to cover the great throughput in Sydney and the much less frequent travellers re regionally. And if we require a nationwide solution, then it goes without saying that a nationwide price is the answer. Costs such as these do not seem uh, significant, but as a retailer in my previous life, I know how pricing changes can make the sale of a certain item very considerably. It does not take a huge increase in costs to push a product or service out of reach of average consumers. And in regional areas, this can be a factor in stopping a young family moving out there to take the many good-paying and stable jobs that so desperately need to be filled. So, as I consider these changes, I was forced to study the two incredibly issue, important issues of national security and the costs of living in regional Australia in the one instrument. And I support the Minister for Home Affairs and his decisions around where and how security screening is carried out. And I believe with every fibre of my being that as a nation we cannot accept differential pricing to be loaded onto regional communities to achieve the nation's outcomes. And I sincerely thank the minister for his work in reconsidering these costs in this regard. As we move through this corona crisis and international travel remains somewhere in the distant future, the success and availability of domestic travel will be critical to rebuilding tourism in this nation. And I expect that state tourism bodies across the land are currently pitching marketing ideas to lure Australians to Cable Beach in Broome in the Australian Age of Dinosaurs at Winton, to Wyala, to Easter in the country at Roma and Mindel Beach Markets in Darwin. So now it is a critical time to be ensuring that regional Australians get a fair go, a fair go to attract Australians to see the very best that we can, the very best we have at a price they can afford and in the safe environment that they expect. So again, I just want to acknowledge my National Party colleagues for their incredible determination to stand with me to negotiate a better deal for regional airports. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President, I'm rising today to convey the Greens' support for this disallowance of these regulations, the Aviation Transport Security Amendment, Security Controlled Airports Regulations 2014. In considering whether the Greens were going to support the disallowance of these regulations, I basically was taking three issues into consideration. One, will these regulations actually make aviation and air travel more safe, safer? Secondly, if they do, then what are the costs of doing so? And as the debate tonight has already touched upon, who pays for those costs? And three, is this solution that has been now quite a long time in the making, is it, are these regulations, are these new security arrangements and the costs that they are going to impose upon regional airports, are they fit for purpose in this new era that we are now in? Because it is absolutely certain that in this COVID-19 era, and I actually won't say post-COVID because I think it's going to be around for a long time, that aviation is going to be very different. We are not going to be going back to as it was before. So thinking about these three things, firstly, 
And no, I, actually, I want to say, fundamentally, underlying all of this is, as it sounds like, there is unanimous agreement across this, this chamber that aviation connecting regional communities with each other, connecting regional communities with the capital cities is of fundamental importance. It is critical for people who live, who work, who visit regional communities for them to have safe and efficient and affordable air travel. And it's something that, is, that for, for those of us that live in the cities, we just take for granted that we can travel affordably to other parts of our country. But I know that it's not something that can happen and, and that the quote that Senator um, Patrick told us that it's costing more to get to Bali from Adelaide than, than to sorry, more <laughs> that's right. It's cheaper to get to Bali from Adelaide than it is to get to Wyala just underlines the the craziness and how the, the cost of aviation across this country is not fairly um, apportioned. So, going back to my three points in, the set, in deciding whether we were going to um, support this disallowance. And firstly, will these new security regulations actually make air travel more uh, safer? And I'll, I think there is certainly having better screening at airports. Yep, that's great. And any airport that has these new screening procedures in, you would think that it is likely to, to make the air travel from that airport um, safer than it was before. But there are still regional airports around Australia that aren't going to have any screening. There are still airports where, because of the small throughput of passengers, the decision has been made that it's just not worth the cost impost to be putting this screening in. The, the passenger load is not high enough, the risk is considered to be low enough. But then that really raises the question, I mean, if you're actually trying to do damage and do harm, and you know which airports have got screening at them, well then why wouldn't you actually go and board a plane from one of the airports that hasn't got screening at it? So it really, the whole notion that putting in increased security at particular airports is going to overall make aviation safer, I think is questionable. I think if we had a model that said, yep, we are having screening at absolutely every airport, well then you could say yes. That is definitively going to make aviation safer. And in all of the um, consideration through committees, through the RAT committee, through various inquiries that we've been talking about this, I am actually yet to be convinced and to see a watertight case that these new um, security measures are actually really definitively going to make aviation that much safer. But secondly, let's just say, well, let's put that aside. Let's say, yes, it definitely is. Well, then what is the cost of doing so? And how, who should pay for those costs? And again, this is where it comes down to there's been a risk assessment that's made that now that um, aircraft that carry, cover, that carry over 40 passengers that they're going through airports, that those airports will have to have these security measures. We've heard it's going to cost a million dollars a year in Wyala. We've heard from Senator Davey that you know, $30, $30 per person in regional airports. There is a cost to doing so. And so what I have not heard until, in fact, in this chamber in the, in the last half an hour is how these costs are going to be apportioned fairly. Because up until now, these costs have basically just been said, well, it's the owners of the airports that are going to have to pay for them, which are usually local governments, and that then that costs are just going to be passed on to the, the travelling public, making the already unaffordable regional air travel even less affordable. I'm very interested to hear the contributions from our national senators about what they have negotiated. I actually want to hear the announcement. Come on, tell us. What is the nationwide solution? What is the nationwide price that has been negotiated? What, how, what has been negotiated to, negotiated to show to, so that regional Australians won't face disproportionate cost increases and that these costs won't be passed on unfairly? This is an entirely new context that we are considering this disallowance in today. And if they were really wanting to get the support of all of this chamber to not support this disallowance, well, 
All of that information should have been put on the table. We should have heard an announcement with, um, with the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister standing side by side today to say how, these, how the new cost arrangements were going to occur. Then I'm sure that you know, Senator Patrick might have considered withdrawing his disallowance. But we haven't heard that. So we just have to take it on, on trust, on faith, that somehow the Nationals have negotiated a better deal. I want to see that better deal. Because otherwise, these new regulations are going to put an unjustifiable and a huge cost impost on regional Australia that is going to make, you know, for all of the wonderful regional tourism attractions, the regional economic incentives, the, the desire to decentralise, it is going to undermine all of those, those purposes. And that then gets me to the third, my third point. Because again, in the inquiry, um, the hearing, hearings that we had um, with the RAT committee last week when we were being asked about A, have they modelled what the cost is, and B, have they modelled what the cost is in the COVID-19 um, environment, that it hasn't been done. The, exactly what the economic impact of these extra costs is going to be, that has not been modelled. And it certainly hasn't been modelled looking at in the environment we are now going to be in, where we know that aviation is not going to be the same as it was before, that there's not going to be a quick snap back for aviation and everybody flying again. Travelling both regionally, tra travelling nationally, travelling internationally, there is a lot of shaking down to be done. There is a, it's a, going to be a whole new, new world we're looking at. And has the work been done as to sort of what the impact of these costs in that new world of a post-COVID-19 um, environment is going to be? No, they haven't. They haven't done that work. And so given that, it seems to me that it, the only responsible thing to do is to not impose these extra costs on regional Australia. I'd be very happy to see these regulations be disallowed and then for the government to realise, ah, OK, we're going to have to think through this a bit more thoroughly and work out how to get these changes, how to make air, air travel safer, how to make air travel more affordable for people right across our country, how to do that in a more equitable way. And that's the work that has not been done so far. That's the work that the Greens want to see being done, to actually work out what is the future for aviation in Australia in a post-COVID environment? What are the costs? How do we apportion those costs fairly across the whole community? And in the meantime, with that work not having been done, we are very happy to support disallowing these regulations. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the government does not support this motion. The Aviation Transport Security Amendment uh, Security Control Airports Regulations 2019 deliver on recommendations made by the Inspector of Transport Security to enhance the safety of regional aviation. Senator Patrick. Uh, I'll just uh, rise with my right of reply. Um, it, it, um, look, I thank every, all the senators for their contribution um, uh, tonight. And, and I am pleased to hear that there's a change in mood uh, from the government in relation to this. Uh, what I heard uh, the uh, national senators say is that there uh, will be no cost uh, throughout the COVID period for security. That, that's actually had already been announced but that they will move to a model where there is non-differential pricing right across Australia. Now, if I go back to my um, recommendations in the uh, original uh, Senate inquiry that we did in the last parliament, you'll find exactly that recommendation in there where we looked at, uh, uh, at airport for security from a, from a national uh, perspective. So uh, I'll just make the observation, because I would like this put to a vote, that uh, politics is about positioning not about policy, it's about positioning uh, for the right policies. And I think uh, uh, work uh, across the last uh, month or so as this uh, motion vote came to, uh, 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 to a final point has forced the government to do something. And I think uh, uh, all in the chamber can take some credit for uh, forcing a change. And, uh, uh, I will say uh, I will I will move the disallowance uh, uh, and uh, ask that it be voted upon, 
I, I accept that there, there is an offer uh, of uh, uh, future change that appears to be on the table, um, but of course uh, the, uh, the government will have to follow through with that. Thank you, Senator Patrick. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion. Sorry, sir. Senator Patrick. With the leave of the chamber, can I just ask uh, if if the major parties could indicate their position? I I know that uh, uh, Senator um, Reynolds indicated no. Uh, was that the case with you as well? Okay, weren't weren't going to support it. Thank you. I call the clerk. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Rice. To note that the vote of the Greens should be recorded as in supporting the the disallowance. So noted. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number two, standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Ch uh, your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, ring the bells. A quorum is required. Thank you, Senators. We have quorum, and I propose that the Senate now adjourn, <laughs> it being 7.20. Oh, Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. After two months of restrictions, which have presented the biggest challenges to our social structures and our economy since World War II, it's understandable that getting back to normal, the way things were before COVID-19, is the immediate aim for many. However, we must acknowledge that COVID-19 will change the economy and the way we live permanently. And as a nation, we must look for the opportunity in these changes. If we don't seize the opportunity, other nations will, and we will find ourselves less resilient and less competitive. I am proud that our Prime Minister and our government have stood firm in the face of recent inflammatory comments from the Chinese ambassador threatening economic consequences because Australia has made the obvious and common sense point that the origins of the coronavirus must be independently investigated. This virus has killed hundreds of thousands of people worldwide and devastated our global economy. An investigation into its origins is a necessary and sensible step 
to enable the world to prevent future pandemics. We should never reach the point as a nation where we're not able to speak freely about what is right and what is in the global interest, or where we give in to reasonable dem unreasonable demands and threats of economic payback. In an age of globalisation, the current crisis has brought home how important it is for us to be as self-sufficient as possible in the goods and services that we need and that we produce. A nation which can supply itself with food, energy, medicine, timber, steel and manufactured goods is in a much better position to face future global crises than one which cannot. In the areas where we do not have the current capability to produce for ourselves, such as medicines or transportation fuel, the old assumption that we can rely on international imports must be challenged. Challenging these assumptions creates an opportunity for Australia to consider how we can grow these industries locally, both creating jobs here and shoring up our local and national supply chains. In the area of food production, in an overall sense, Australia produces much more food than we consume, and this provides us with excellent opportunities to export our produce. But it does not escape attention that Australia still imports hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fruit and vegetables from other countries each year. Growing the capacity of our agricultural industries to produce that which we are currently importing is another opportunity to employ more Australians and grow our economy. The work currently being done on new irrigation schemes in Tasmania, enabled by hundreds of millions of dollars in joint investment between the coalition government and the Tasmanian Liberal government, are a great example of how we can further support growth in our agricultural sector. Australia is, of course, a trading nation, and much of our wealth is created from selling to the world, and, and that won't change. But that shouldn't mean we accept that just because a product can be imported from overseas, we needn't produce it here. We will continue to create high-quality products and we will continue to create jobs by making these products available to the world. But we won't trade them for our right to stand up for our national interests and our national sovereignty against foreign threats. Australia must also recalibrate its thinking in how we attract and encourage new business and industry. The effort that is put into opposing new businesses and trying to bring down industries that employ tens of thousands of Australians is frankly obscene. Of course, we're a democracy and everybody should be able to freely speak and put their views forward. But this doesn't mean that vocal minorities should be able to prevent, delay, hold up and defer, deter businesses rather, which have a legal right to operate. In Tasmania, we are all too familiar with the efforts by this minority to oppose any major industry or development. They oppose fish farming, forestry, tourism, mining, urban development, heavy industry, uh, energy developments, including wind farms. The list is endless. And the message that is sent to people who want to start a business is disastrous for Tasmanians who just want to be able to have a good job so they can provide for their family. Our laws and our bureaucracies in this country give far too many weapons to these minorities to hold up and prevent major projects. If we are going to bounce back strongly from coronavirus, every jurisdiction should be looking at whether their laws are enabling investment or empowering minority groups to prevent major projects and job creation. And if it's the latter, those laws must be changed. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd like to just uh, put on the Senate record that the Northern Territory Government uh, certainly took decisive action at the start of this COVID pandemic uh, that has undoubtedly saved lives and will hopefully allow for sustained economic repair. So far in the Northern Territory, we have had only 30 cases of the virus and thankfully no deaths. But as we keep saying, we must remain vigilant. It is uh, certainly an important position uh, for the Northern Territory in particular as we're concerned about our vulnerable population in terms of First Nations people and our elderly. In the Northern Territory, Aboriginal people are often overrepresented in the health system, but it's a different story for COVID-19 with official data indicating so far there's been no First Nations uh, who, people who've been uh, affected by coronavirus in the Northern Territory to date. And naturally, like uh, everyone, we want to certainly make sure that stays that way. At the very beginning of the response to the pandemic back in March, 
the Northern Territory government put in place a funded return to country program that saw more than 1,400 people go back to country and stay on their homelands across the Northern Territory. Tungandjira Council in Alice Springs and the Larrakia Nation in Darwin put in an incredible effort over a very short space of time to get everyone back to country before community lockdowns were in place on March 26. It certainly hasn't been easy and there's been some bumps on the road, but the proof of the success is that we have not had one case of the virus uh, in our communities. And this is certainly down to the hard work of many, many organisations and government agencies working together. The Northern Territory Government has worked side by side with the Federal Coalition Government to get this work done. Very early on in the piece, a regional and remote task force was established in the Northern Territory, so key stakeholders, including land councils, NTCOS, uh, NAJA, Lagant and AMSANT, had the opportunity to directly inform policy decisions. Our state and territory borders have also been locked down with 13 biosecurity checkpoints uh, across the Northern Territory. People coming into the Territory, whether by road or air, are required to undertake compulsory quarantine for two weeks in a Northern Territory government nominated accommodation. It was certainly tough action, drastic action, but uh, it is paying off. Nearly two weeks ago, on May 1, Territorians were able to enjoy our playgrounds, pools and parks, uh, even go fishing enjoy non-contact sports again and outdoor religious gatherings were permitted. All of these, of course, with strict hygiene measures and physical distancing in place. From Friday uh, the 15th of May, uh, two days away, Territorians can once again return to restaurants and cafes with a two-hour time limit. Go back to the gyms, our public libraries will be open and, yes, even get our nails done. On June 5th, very important, on June 5th, all going well, all sports and competitions will re return there uh, and there will be no time limits on bars or restaurants. Cinemas will reopen and most business who are able will be operating again. And if Minister Hunt and Health Advice concur, the biosecurity zones will be lifted internally. Remote community residents will be able to travel to the larger towns for shopping, family visits and appointments. Within territory borders, we will be looking at a, certainly a different way of life. The COVID-19 pandemic has presented a range of challenges for the Northern Territory Government and their efforts to minimise the impact on Territorians are certainly to be congratulated. Vulnerable people have been kept safe and this terrible virus has hopefully been kept at bay. Once our borders open up again, we certainly welcome each and every one of you back to our wonderful part of the country uh, certainly come and visit us once we do that. And uh, what I'd certainly like to say um, to the Senate, as we do uh, on every occasion, is whilst we put all these things on the record now, it is uh, every day uh, uh, something that we have to remain strong about in terms of uh, keeping this virus at bay, certainly not just in the Northern Territory, but right across Australia. And indeed, our thoughts also go to those people around the world who are suffering terribly uh, from this virus. So, uh, Mr President, I just want to put on the record a very big thanks to all of those involved with keeping our country uh, as safe as we possibly can. Senator Faruqi. In the last few weeks, there have been disturbing videos shared on social media channels showing queues of international students lining the streets of Sydney. These students are not lining up to wait for transport or go shopping. These students have been queuing to be given free food from restaurants and charities because they have no other way of eating. These are students who, have we who we welcomed into our country, and many of whom are now facing nothing less than poverty, starvation and homelessness. Hundreds of international students have contacted my office over the last few weeks since they have been left destitute by the coalition government. There are over 550,000 overseas students currently studying in Australia, and every last one of them has been thoroughly let down by this government. None of them have access to job seeker, job keeper, youth allowance, or the coronavirus supplement. Many have lost their jobs and incomes. Their families in their home countries are also suffering. 
with the effects of the economic downturn of COVID-19, as many countries are undergoing extensive shutdowns and lockdowns. Money that once would have been sent to Australia as family support is simply not coming. I would like to take the opportunity tonight to share some of the stories and messages of international students and put them on record so the Senate is made fully aware of how exactly international students are hurting right now. These are direct quotes from emails sent to me. One student wrote, I have lost my job at a company here where I have almost worked for about three months as a casual worker for 20 hours a week. With this, it was easy for me to pay my expenses here in Australia, food, rent and travel. Although our university fees comes from our home country, now it has become very difficult for them to send me money for my expenses here as there is complete lockdown in India as well. This is the current situation of almost all international students. Another wrote, usually my parents support me mentally and financially. Nowadays they stop sending money because of their business is totally shut down in Bangladesh due to COVID-19. As well as I used to work in a restaurant to arrange my living expenses. Two weeks ago I lost my job. I don't know how I will survive here. I thought I will get minimum support from workplace or government. Unfortunately, I'm not getting any support from workplace and government. And another, I have been doing face-to-face -face sales since August 2018, but as of the crisis going in the world, my job has been cancelled as it falls under non-essential business. I have lost my job since two weeks and all my savings were gone a month back. So I had to renew my, as I had to renew my visa and pay the university fees. I pray and hope the government will provide some kind of subsidy to the international students in this time of crisis. And another, with the current situation, we have to use up most to all of our savings up to the point where some of us have started to sell our personal belongings, just so that we can still have enough money to pay for all those necessities. I have seen some students actually have to come to local restaurants that provide free meals since they have been out of job and are just barely surviving with the current savings they got. And another, and another, and another. Hundreds of thousands of international students have been left out and left behind. States and territories are thankfully now stepping up, as are universities and other education providers. But the reality is that the federal government has responsibility for higher education. And it has really dropped the ball here. The government must change its course on this, must come to the table and provide the support that international students so desperately need. It's not too late to extend much needed financial assistance and income support. The welfare of hundreds of thousands of students is literally in their hands. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And, uh, I'd just like to make a few remarks uh, about the current uh, situation in Australia uh, and I've heard many of the contributions throughout the week and uh, I concur almost entirely with all of them. And I suppose we're really lucky to, uh, to be living in Australia and you know it occurred to me through the enforced uh, isolation and the many uh, briefings that we get at one or two o'clock every day that uh, we've been able to show a great deal of unanimity amongst our states and territories. Whilst there's clearly been divergent views about the way forward, the way that that uh, cabinet has worked has been very comforting for the entire population. And I think that it makes, uh, it makes you realise what makes Australia so strong, apart from its great health system, its rule of law, its freedom of speech. The population get it. And when there is an emergency like this, they've accepted isolation. They've accepted the closure of schools, the closure of hotels, the, the loss of jobs. And there have been, with very few exceptions, no aberrant behaviour. Quite mystifyingly, people decided to overstock on toilet paper, but it didn't affect my household because uh, obviously we got a very efficient quartermaster who saw no need to either restock the pantry or we didn't run out. But, it really does make you uh, be proud to be an Australian and to live in this country. And if we look at the way that our first responders, you know, our, uh, you know, the first responders have been absolutely excellent. In the health system, and I've had some experience with the health system for the first time in my life recently, I've never met more dedicated professional 
are committed people at every level in that system. We do have true exemplars of, uh, of decency and bravery and courage in that area. And that's backed up by the cleaners, the childcare workers, the teachers, the police, the fire. And, and the people that are very close to me, the, the transport workers, who have never lost, lots of them have not lost a day of work. Lots of them have been working harder than normal, keeping the arterial roads of this country you know, operating and moving uh, vital cargo around the place. So it does make you exceedingly proud to be an Australian. And, and, and it really does, I think, show that we are capable of getting together in times of need and working collectively. And the real challenge, I think, in this, uh, in this space is that we don't lose that ability in the next six months because there is going to be a contest, and it will be a political contest. And I'll gradually give credit to all of those uh, Liberal leaders in their states or territories, probably only the states, uh, they've done good work along with Labor leaders and the community or the, the national cabinet has done good work. But this is now becoming more of an economic issue than a health issue and quite clearly that's when we're going to start and fragment. But we shouldn't lose sight of what we achieved during the health crisis, if, if I dare say that we're you know, over the uh, curve of that, and we do go on to dealing with the economic crisis. We should capture the same spirit of genuine unity and the way forward that we had in the health crisis. If we could distill that into some sort of spirit, then Australia will be a much better place. And we have our leader, Mr Albanese, espousing a better and fairer and less uh, fragmented workforce, a place where people don't do seven years as a part-timer or a casual who may do a year as a part-timer and a casual but aspire to a permanent job because that's the, that's the land I grew up in. You may have been a casual for six or 12 months but ultimately if you worked hard and attended and took up the training and were loyal to your employer and your job, you eventually got permanent, permanent work. That's almost disappeared. You know, Mother's Day lunch in my house a 22-year-old, six years as a part-timer and a casual at Coles. Six years! You know, we're almost on to long service leave and still in part-time casual work. That's not the Australia that we want to see for our children and grandchildren. And I think we have to distill and capture this special spirit in this moment of time where we did work together to get a better outcome. And it's going to be an economic argument, so it's going to be vigorous, it's going to be debated, we'll throw things at each other. But let's try and get some unity about proper jobs for our children, grandchildren and people in the workforce. Less insecure employment. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, I thought I had seen everything when it comes to the way this government treats our veterans. But I'll tell you what, today they have sunk to a whole new low. Teddy Sheen is an Australian hero. He deserves a Victorian cross for his acts of bravery in World War II. I know it, his family knows it, and the Independent Defence Honours and Awards Tribunals know it as well. Last year, the Awards Tribunal reviewed the recommendation in 2013 defence paper that Teddy Sheen should not be awarded a Victoria Cross. After days of public hearings in Hobart, the Tribunal found that, and I quote, the ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan meets the eligible criteria for the Victorian Cross for Australia. Not only that, quote, not only that, and I quote, the tribunal finds that Sheehan's acts surpass com comparable acts which resulted in the award of the Imperial Victoria Cross. They concluded that the Minister for Defence should, and I quote, recommend the sovereign that ordinary seaman Edward Sheehan be prosperously awarded the Victorian Cross for Australia. That's what the independent tribunal thinks. They say that Teddy Sheen meets and exceeds the standard to receive a VC he's deserving of this recognition. There is not one other VC holder out there that has done what Teddy Sheen has done. Not one. Now, I'll show the utmost respect to every VC, but they have not done what Sheen has done. So what does the government do? They just ignore that recommendation. They decide to overrule it because the Liberals know best, apparently. This afternoon, the Minister of Defence told this chamber that, and I quote, 
The government's view is that the 2019 review by the tribunal did not present any compelling new evidence that might support reconsideration of the Valor Inquiry's recommendation. I am absolutely totally flawed today. I'm absolutely to to totally flawed. I'm in shock, like every other Tasmanian out there. And let's just call it for what it is. It's absolutely cowardness. They can't admit that they've overlooked Sheen all this time. All this time. They can't show up here, hand on heart, and say in front of everyone, we mess this up, we mess this up, but we're going to fix it up. No, they don't have the guts, they don't have the spine to do that. They just don't. They'd rather be stubborn, dig in their heels and deny the overdue recognition to a true bloody Australian hero. To a true Australian hero. If you haven't heard the story yet, then let me tell you about Teddy. This is the person being denied full honours by the Australian government. Teddy was 18 years of old, age when he signed up to serve the Royal Australian Navy during World War II. Just a year later, in 1942, he was wounded during an attack from Japanese aircraft on HMAS Armadale. Rather than flee, he strapped himself in to his anti-aircraft anti cannon and opened fire. Oh yes, I'd love to see the PM doing that one. Let's go. That decision to tie his fate to a gun sinking to the bottom of the ocean brought down two planes and helped save the lives of 49 crew. Like I said, I have not seen one other VC winner in history do what this man has done. And he's left behind family and friends. And according to the awards tribunal, and I quote, his preeminent act of valour and most conspicuous gallantry saved lives. His heroism became the standard to which the men and women of the modern Navy aspire to. They aspire to it. It was an act of extraordinary courage, extraordinary courage, and it amazes me that this 18-year-old kid could show more bravery than the entire Australian government today. That is absolutely shameful. Let's be very clear about this. What more could Teddy have possibly done to take this award home? What more? He gave everything he had for his country and his fellow crew members. There is nothing more he could have possibly have done. He did it all. He did it all. But this government has always been so afraid of revisiting Sheen's case, they don't want to admit they've got it wrong in the past because they're scared they might open up a can of worms. They're just scared they might set a precedent for some others that think they might deserve a VC. Will you show me someone else that saved over 40 lives and brought down two aircraft and tied themselves to a goddamn gun on a ship and gone down with a ship? Find me somebody else that has that in their resume. Oh, please do. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm not going away. And I'm not going away. And you are. And I'll tell the Defence Minister now, she's going to own up to her mistakes. She has a lot of explaining to do. And there's deals to be done in this House. What I don't want to be doing in this House is having to do another deal over a veteran. Because deals shouldn't be done, because that is just disrespectful. Before I finish, I want to say this. Thank you so much, Minister Guy Barnett for all the effort you've done, and for you, Gary Ivey. Stay there. I haven't finished Order, yet. Order, Senator Lambie. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr President. The first step on the road to establishing the nation of Israel truly began at a meeting of the post-World War Allied Supreme Council in San Remo, Italy, from the 19th to the 26th of April, 1920. During the First World War, the British government had committed to create a Jewish national home. The outcomes of the San Remo Conference would enable this commitment to be met. The San Remo Resolution passed on the 25th of April 1920, just over 100 years ago, and it's a significant date in the history of Israel, the founding of a homeland for the Jewish people. The outcomes of the San Remo Conference were that the northern half of what was called Syria, modern-day Iran and Lebanon, was mandated to France, the southern half to Great Britain, the province of Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, was mandated to Great Britain, and this complex arrangement was the first step that eventually led to the foundation of Israel. Subsequent to the San Remo Conference in 1922, the League of Nations confirmed the mandate for British rule of Palestinian order to facilitate the creation of Israel, which came into effect in 1923. Sadly, the intervening decades saw unfathomable harm and injustice brought upon the Jewish people. The crimes and atrocities of the Holocaust will forever be remembered so as to make sure they are not repeated. In the shadows of the Holocaust, the British government continued 
relentlessly on their path to establishing a homeland for the Jewish people, a journey that formally had commenced in San Remo two and a half decades earlier. On the 14th of May, 1948, the anniversary of which is tomorrow, the British withdrew from Haifa. Jewish Agency Chairman David Ben-Gurion proclaimed at Tel Aviv Museum the establishment of the State of Israel and became its first premier. All of these milestones are based on the consensus reached by Western and Arab leaders during the San Remo Conference. Both the US and the then USSR recognised the new State of Israel, and since this time we have seen this beacon of democracy flourish in the Middle East. It is a bastion for democracy and human rights, where freedom of speech and liberty intellectual freedom has been abundant and revered. Israel is an important ally to Australia in many ways, and our bilateral cooperation, especially in innovation, security and defence, is of benefit to both of our nations. Australian defence officials began strategic talks annually with Israel in 2018, and in early 2019, Australia appointed a resident defence attaché to the embassy in Tel Aviv. In 2018, Israel was Australia's 41st largest merchandise trading partner and the 50th largest export market. It's an important business and technological partner of Australia. The opening in 2019 of an Australian trade and defence office in West Jerusalem is designed to facilitate trade investment and defence industry partnerships. Israel's economy has been growing continuously for the past 16 years, averaging 3.8 per cent GDP growth annually. So it makes sense to have good trade and economic relationships with innovative and industrious nations like Israel. But as we celebrate the modern day achievements of our friend and ally, and the many Australians who hold deep connections to Israel, it behoves us to understand their history, to contemplate the adversity through which they have come so that we can better support each other for a prosperous future. Recognising the significance of the San Remo Conference and of the 14th of May 1948, the date the State of Israel was formed, an important world event that has changed the course of human history forever is my mission today. And I want to acknowledge and recognise the significant contributions of the many Jewish people in Australia who hold in high regard the role of Israel as a force for good in the world. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Thanks, uh, Mr President. I um, want to make a few comments about regional newspapers and uh, the National Party. 152 regional newspapers uh, stopped printing over the course of the COVID-19 crisis. That's a third of Australia's regional newspapers gone. Many will never reopen. Uh, Anthony Catalano from ACM said it would be pointless to reopen a newspaper if it wasn't viable. Now, these newspapers are the lifeblood of country towns. They wear sport and junior sport, the achievements of kids at school, uh, the work of the CWA, local theatres, local businesses, local government. They support the local community with local and national news. What is the National Party for? if it's not there for rescuing uh, local regional papers? Where is the package that secures the future of any of these local papers? The leader of the National Party in the House of Representatives, Mr McCormack, who couldn't fight his way out of a wet paper bag, so dry and monochromatic that he makes Warren Truss look like Liberace, has delivered nothing. Former newspaper editor, nothing. Uh, he did give Senator Canavan and Mr Barillaro and Mr Joyce a complete flogging last week uh, over the Eden Monaro uh, pre-selection. It is a symbol of the decline of what passes for the modern National Party. We saw the spectacle of the National Party and the Liberal parties disappearing up their own fundament last week uh, over the course of this catastrophic, self-interested, venal uh, uh, activity around, the, around only one thing, whether John Barillaro or Andrew Constance could step up one more rung 
in their career ladders. Well, the Liberal and National Party chaos on one side underlines that there's only one candidate focused on the needs of the people of Eden Monaro. That's Christy McBain. She was there in the bushfires. She's been there through the COVID-19 crisis, there as the mayor of Bega, and she remains focused on the people of Eden Monaro. It's really quite a show, the National Party, at the moment. I saw over the weekend Senator Canavan posted a photo of himself with his wife celebrating Mother's Day. His gift? He installed a clothesline. It's a risky choice. Uh, it's an even riskier tweet. But I'm sure he had a good Mother's Day and I wish him and his family all the best. What was interesting about the tweet, and Senator, Can Senator Canavan's tweets are always interesting in the same way that falling down the stairs is always interesting, is that he pops on the high vis to dig the hole in the backyard and he endorses his Australian-made clothesline. Well, Senator Canavan's high vises are exclusively for media appearances. It's probably the first time he ever worked up a sweat in it. He has got the softest hands in Australian politics. Of course, today, Senator Canavan is passionate about Australian manufacturing. He's devoted several hours of his podcast with Barnaby Joyce to the topic. Senator Canavan has recorded 13 of these podcasts with Mr Joyce, most of them with guests. He's had Senator Patterson. He's had Senator Seselja. He's had the members for Dawson, Lord knows why, twice. I mean, it is absolutely riveting listening. I can't listen to it. It's really too much for me. I make one of my staff endure it. Weatherboard and iron, it's called. I'm not sure which one of these jokers is weatherboard and which one is iron, but it certainly puts the board into weatherboard. I'll have to adjust the pay of the young man who I force to listen to it. He is, however, yet to have a woman appear on the podcast. Women aren't part of the picture of regional Australia for these two galahs. Thirteen episodes, very long, unbearably the minutes and seconds drag on. Like Kafka, it is surreal, otherworldly. Like Chekhov, it's a story without an end. It's postmodern, it's post-fact, it's frankly weird. He is a recent convert, a former teenage Trotskyist, used to work at the Productivity Commission, before that the great friend of Australian workers, before that he was at KPMG. He would have only worn a high-vis vest to visit a factory because he was part of closing the operation. Matt Canavan, Matt Canavan being for manufacturing is like the Hells Angels being for women's rights. We're going to get serious Order. about manufacturing Senator on this Ayers, side. Time I've got has quite a bit expired. more. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, Senators.